Let us pray. Almighty God, we willingly acknowledge you as the supreme being, most gracious and most merciful. Look down, we beseech you, on us who are members of this Senate, and deign to assist us in the duties that we have to perform on behalf of our beloved country of Trinidad and Tobago. Open our eyes to see the truth and help us to accept it with all its implications into our lives. Direct us, O oh Lord, in our deliberations, so that setting aside private interests, unwholesome prejudices, and personal affections, we may treat all matters set before us with honesty, courage, and conviction. Through all we say and do in this Senate, may we give glory and honor to your holy name, inspire confidence in our fellow citizens, and make a positive contribution to the peace and prosperity of our nation. Amen. Announcements by the President. Honorable Members, I wish to advise that the presiding officer of the Tobago House of Assemblies Legislature, Ms. Abby Taylor, and a delegation comprising the Deputy Presiding Officer, Mr. Joel Sampson, the Clerk of the Assembly, Ms. Myrna McLeod, and Mr. Marcus Woods, Project and Information Technology Manager, are present in the Chamber for today's proceedings. I ask you to join me in welcoming the delegation. Honorable Senators, I have received the following correspondence from the Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives. January the 17th, 2022, Dear President of the Senate, establishment and appointment of members to joint select committees. I wish to advise that at a sitting held on Friday, January the 14th, 2022, the House of Representatives agreed to the following resolutions. One, resolved, that the following six members be appointed to serve on the joint select committee established to consider and report on the Fisheries Management Number 2 Bill 2020. Ms. Shampa Kajo, MP, Mr. Brian Manning, MP, Mr. Stephen McClashey, MP, Mr. Kennedy Richards, MP, Mr. Rushton Pare, MP, Mr. Ravi Ratiram, MP. Two, resolved that the following six members be appointed to serve on the Joint Select Committee established to consider and report on the Shipping Bill 2020. Mrs. Penelope Beckles Robinson, MP, Mr. Marvin Gonzalez, MP, Mrs. Lisa Morris Julian, MP, Mr. Keith Scotland, MP, Mr. Devindranath Tanku, MP, Mr. Dinesh Rambali, MP. Three, resolved that the representation of the people amendment number two bill 2020 be referred to a joint select committee hereby established for its consideration and report by April the 30th, 2022. That may be subject to the concurrence of the Senate on the establishment of the Joint Select Committee on the Representation of the People Amendment No. 2 Bill 2020, the House appoint the following six members to sit with an equal number from the Senate on this committee. Mrs. Camille Robinson Regis, MP, Mr. Colm Imber, MP, Mr. Fitzgerald Hines, MP, Ms. Shamfa Kajo, MP, Mr. Saddam Hussein, MP, Mr. Devindrana Tanku, MP. Accordingly, I respectfully request that the Senate be informed of this decision at the earliest convenience, please. Thank you. Respectfully, Mr. Esmond Ford, MP, Deputy Speaker of the House. Papers. Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I have the honor to lay on the table the following papers as listed on the order paper in the name of the Minister of Finance. The report of the Auditor General to the third the response of the Auditor General to the third report of the Public Administration and Appropriation Committee on the implementation of the recommendations of the 24th report of the PAAC on the examination into the processing of payments 
of pensions and gratuities of retired public officers and contracted employees. And the ministerial response of the Minister of Finance to the fourth report of the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee on the examination of the audited financial statements of the National Information and Communications Technology Company Limited, IGOV TT, for the financial years 2015 to 2019. Thank you. Questions on notice, questions for oral answer. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Madam President. There are three questions for on notice for response today. The government will respond to all three. Thank you. Senator Ma. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Question number 23 to the Minister of National Security. Minister of National Security. Thank you very warmly, Madam President. In March 2020, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service developed and implemented COVID-19 protocols in keeping with the country's national health protocols for public spaces and employees to safeguard both officers and members of the general public. In this regard, some of the measures include the implementation of A, identification of special sanitization areas by divisional commanders at all police facilities, including the provision of relevant sanitizing products and signage. Provision of personal protection equipment to officers who are required to engage in higher risk contact. Placing in signage in conspicuous locations to provide information on signs and symptoms of COVID-19. Provision of directional signage to the special sanitization areas to ensure that all staff and members of the general public can sanitize their hands before approaching the reception area. Providing sanitation products for all police facilities and police vehicles, and of course, B, re requiring all persons visiting police stations to give a report interview or to obtain a certificate of character to wear face masks and sanitize their hands at designated areas before entering the police facility or approaching the reception area. Requiring police officers, as far as practicable, to maintain a safe distance, that is to say some four to six feet, from persons giving their report or being interviewed. Mandating police officers to wear face masks and gloves whilst taking fingerprints and, or from applicants for certificates of character. Requiring persons who exhibit COVID-19 symptoms to return home, revisit the station when he or she has recovered from such symptoms or has otherwise been cleared. Thank you very warmly, Madam President. Senator Mark. Yeah, um, thank you, Madam President. Um, can the Honorable Minister indicate what materials are available to police officers to determine when a citizen who is making a report to the police station exhibit symptoms of the virus or exhibit symptom, symptoms rather that can lead one to believe that that person has the virus. What kind I, I, of... Yes, I, I think the minister, minister. That is so common sense that I'm surprised at the question, Madam President. The first and basic uh, technique is one of simple observation for signs of flu, runny nose, red eyes, coughing, apparent discomfort, those very basic and commonsensical things, they are used even by the very sophisticated health professionals around the world as a first sign, a first observation. And once that is seen, further precautions are advised and, of course, taken. Senator Can, Mark? The, minister, can the minister indicate whether these police stations are equipped with thermometer to take people's temperatures as well as oximeters? So just in case, Madam President, we want to double check. Can I ask the Honourable Minister? Minister? A multiplicity of police stations 
and generally public spaces around the place. Most places have uh, equipment that you can have your temperature checked while being sanitized or shortly thereafter. I am certain that police stations are fixed with them, them too, but I am unable because of the, the numbers we are talking about. And, and the generality of the question to give any further specificity at this time. Senator Mark. May I ask specifically to the Honorable Minister, in the case of the Valencia Police Station, are these pieces of material and equipment available, Madam President? Senator. Minister. If I were bold and courageous enough, you know, I'll ask the member to accompany me when I check. But for the time being, I'm unable to say, Madam President. Senator Mark. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. Next question, Senator Mark. Question number 24 to the Minister of Health. Much. Minister but, of Health. Yes, thank you very much, Madam President, and good morning to all. As per guideline issued by the World Health Organization, the Ministry of Health has implemented and enforced the self-quarantine measures to mitigate and reduce the transmission of COVID-19 to other members of the household. In this regard, the Ministry implemented a telemedicine strategy where 150 officers were trained and deployed to the county medical officers of health to one conduct contact tracing of COVID-19 positive patients, track and monitor COVID-19 positive patients, and provide ongoing medical advice towards their recovery. Track and monitor COVID-19 positive patients that were supplied with pulse oximeters to manage, record, and report to these officers the status of their oxygen levels. Three, four, if patients exhibit readings of oxygen below the required level, and or is continuously showing symptoms and the severity of illness worsens. Patients' arrangements are made for the immediate transfer of care to the Coover, Cora, or Augustus Long Hospitals or any of the other facilities. Five, ensure adherence to the quarantine measures in collaboration with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. These measures include signing of the quarantine order certificate, advice on the adherence to public health measures, including Stay in your home and, where possible, isolate yourself from others. If you cannot isolate at home, persons are offered the opportunity, free of charge, to isolate in one of our state quarantine facilities, and that's important. Ensure strict measures of isolation and, where possible, use separate facilities, example, bathrooms, and non-sharing of utensils as far as possible. Ensure sanitization of all areas of use and washing of hands frequently, do not go to work or be in a public space. Do not allow visitors in your home or accommodation. Wear a mask when you are around others and have food, medication, and other supplies delivered to you. Further, the Ministry of Health, in conjunction with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, can monitor and evaluate COVID-19 patients in home quarantine to ensure strict adherence to the guidelines. Regulation 11 provides where a person is COVID-19 positive and has been issued a quarantine order to quarantine at their home and he or she breaches the said order, he or she is liable on summary conviction to a fine of $250,000 and imprisonment for six months. As of January 17, 2022, 121 persons have in fact breached their quarantine orders and the requisite action taken by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. I would like to take this opportunity to reiterate strict adherence to the protocols and guidelines for self-quarantine to protect and save lives of our citizens in controlling, reducing, and even eliminating the spread of COVID-19. Thank you very much, Madam President. Senator Mark. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Madam President, through you, can the minister 
he showed us the frequency at which these trained officers visit the homes of those persons who have been positively tested and have been placed in self-quarantine. Minister. Thank you. As I said, and maybe Senator, Senator Mark may have missed it, it is not physical visits, as I said in my answer, and I will repeat. In this regard, the ministry implemented a telemedicine strategy where 150 officers were trained and deployed in the offices of the County Medical Officers of Health. This is a telemedicine strategy employed around the world um, uh, instead of actual home visits. May I ask again through you, Madam President, can the minister indicate whether the ministry has established a specialized or a special health kit to make available to those citizens who happen to be tested positive for COVID-19 and they are self-quarantined at home? Minister. Thank you. I don't understand what the member means by a health kit. I said that we provide pulse oximeters, we provide written guidelines as to how to isolate, for example, stay in your home where possible, that is part of what he may refer to as a health kit, and we provide all necessary documentation to the person to help them isolate safely at home, inclusive of pulse oximeters. Senator Mark. Can the minister indicate whether the ministry has received reports on persons who have been tested positive and who are supposed to be self-quarantined actually um, visiting groceries, supermarkets, etc. I know he talked about 121 persons, but I would like to ask the minister through you whether this is an accurate reflection of what takes place in the communities involving persons who have been tested positive. Minister. So as I said in my answer, we can go on what is reported to us, and so far, a hundred and, what did I say, 171, I believe, 121 persons have in fact breached their quarantine orders. This is what is known to us, and reported to the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. Senator Mark. Um, Madam President, can I ask the Honorable Minister whether the telemedicine uh, arrangement that has been put in place, would that incorporate, for instance, sharing of information with affected citizens or patients isolated at home concerning what treatment that they ought to be um, administering to facilitate speedy recoveries of their particular um, situation. Can the minister share with us any information Mi on minister? that? Thank you. And yes, that type of information is shared on an individual basis depending on the clinical manifestations of the patient. It is not a one-size-fits-all. It depends on comorbidities. It depends on age. It depends on the uh, oxygen level. So all of that is taken into consideration in the telemedicine um, uh, protocols. And one of the basic things we always advise, if patients are decompensating and notice that they are short of breath, they should not wait, but get a health facility as early as humanly possible. Thank you very much, Madam President. Next question, Senator Mark. Yeah. Question number 36 to the Minister of Housing.
Thank you very much, Madam President. Minister of Housing and Urban Development. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Um, the Trinidad and Tobago Housing Development Corporation is in the process of completing works that are affecting the residents at Viewfort St. James Housing Development. The specific repairs that have been completed or are still in progress is as follows. As it relates to Building A, tiling works were completed by the HDC staff during the period September 2021 to November 2021 throughout the building. Plumbing repairs to supply lines is ongoing by both the HDC staff and maintenance contractors. This work started in December 2021 and is continuing in January 2022. As it relates to building B, C, and D, materials for drainage repairs have been procured and work will commence by the end of January 2022. Tree trimming to be undertaken by the HEC staff, and that is expected to commence at the end of January 2022. The retaining wall works address the slippage. A tender was awarded in December 2021, and work will commence before the end of January 2022. Senator Ma? Yeah, Madam President, in terms of the retaining wall works, Honorable Minister, and um, the challenges that the residents complained about, um, com they, they, they complained about rather, can the Minister indicate what time frame she anticipates for the completion of the repairs to the retaining wall in that community? Minister. I cannot at this time, but I know that um, all efforts will be made for it to be completed within the shortest possible time. Senator Mark. As it relates to the other areas identified by the Honorable mm -hmm. Minister, um, tiling, plumbing, for example, and drainage, can the minister indicate whether there is a time frame for the completion. I think tiling has been completed, but in terms of plumbing and drainage, is there a time frame, Minister, you wish to share with this Senate for the completion of these works? Okay, so I yes, indicated sir. that the tiling works have been completed and that um, the majority of the other works actually start um, at the end of January, so no, I cannot give you the exact completion date, but as I indicated, we are prioritizing um, the projects and we are going to ensure that it's done within the shortest possible time. Senator Ma. President, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Public business, government business, bills, second reading. Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Fisheries. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I beg to move that a bill entitled An Act to Repeal the Livestock and Livestock Products Board Act, Chapter 6705, be now read a second time. Madam President, I thank you for the opportunity to present this bill, which intends to repeal an act that has existed for the last 25 years. 
Madam President, I know in fairness to my colleagues, it's always difficult to deal with a bill of this nature that is so short and has one specific purpose without the context. And I'm hoping that as I utilize my 45 minutes, and I am able to provide the context in which I'm here today. Let me say right off that this is a very unusual bill in the sense that I know many of my colleagues would ask what replaces this. And I want to say right off that in May 2020, we debated and passed a bill which sought to amend the Animal Diseases Act, which had been existing for a long time. And we titled that amongst ourselves as the Animal Welfare Bill. And in that bill, and I would get to that bill, we did in fact propose, and in the passage of the bill, approve the creation of an advisory committee to the minister. And at that time, I indicated that it intends to, that committee intends to replace the work that should have been done by this particular board. So I would get there, Madam President, in the context of what we placed, when we replaced it, and what was the thinking behind it. So the bill itself, Madam President, as I said, is simple, but beyond the, the two lines, there are, in fact, a lot of considerations that must be taken on board. The Act itself was passed in 1997, and surprisingly, there isn't a lot available to us in terms of what was the thinking of the government at the time and what led to the passage of the Act. I would say this. The minister who gave birth to this piece of legislation is no longer with us. Dr. Reza Mohammed passed away recently. But I had the opportunity then to work with him and to understand the context in which he wanted this piece of legislation. This piece of legislation, the Livestock and Livestock Products Act, really does three things. But the more important consideration, in my view, is what it doesn't do. So I would say that the three things that the existing legislation that we seek to repeal, the three things that it does, one, it creates the board, Livestock Products Board, and the board is a multi-sectoral board. The second thing is that it gives the board certain functions. And the third, it creates the usual regulatory making function that we have, the power to make regulations. I would say that in the 25 years of existence, no regulations under this act have been made. And I want to say that the key difference in terms of the context, this approach is really modeled on the Canadian approach across the various provinces, the approach in Australia, the approach in New Zealand. And the common factor in all three is the size of the livestock industry. And the fact that when you look at agriculture in these countries and the size in terms of volume, but also the size in terms of geography, you understand why when it comes to wheat, corn, and livestock, dairy, all those things, they are provincial entities and they are federal entities which provide certain functions. And the big difference is this. When you look at the act we are seeking to repeal, the Livestock and Livestock Products Board really does not create policy or administer policy. It does not issue licenses 
or permits. So for example, if you go to Alberta, or you go to any of the Canadian provinces, if you go to Australia, if you go to New Zealand legislation, you would see that these boards are the only entities which provide regulatory oversight, administration, permitting, and licenses. And that has to do with size and complexity. In our country to this day, 25 years after this legislation came into being, the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, whichever, whichever name it was called, it has been called Ministry of Food Production and different names. The policy making in relation to livestock, the legislative work, the administrative work, the permitting, licensing and oversight has remained with the ministry. And that is something that is very important to understand. That in the approach to restructuring the, private, the public sector, in approaching the restructuring of the public sector over the years, there have been efforts to take, and, and when I was writing for the Express, I used the expressions expression, carting away public sector functions and putting it in private or quasi-private entities. And in some cases, it worked. Those special purpose companies, for example, that provide high-level, complex project management and engineering services in the state sector the UDCOTs and the NIDCOs and the NIPTEX, for example, really perform functions and provide expertise that does not reside in the core public sector, and that is undisputed. Maybe it resided one, at one time, but as our needs became more and more complex, those functions, whichever government was there at the time, worked out that they would be better provided by special purpose entities. But there have been instances, and this is one instance, in which the function was never removed from the ministry. No function was really removed from the ministry. What the board did, the board basically functioned in, as a think tank, I would say, and as an advisory committee or advisory group. And what we found is that if you survey the public sector, and I use the health sector as a classic example because I had the opportunity to work with two ministers in that sector and also to work with the person who drove towards a healthy nation which was the document that gave birth to the RHA model. But anybody who's involved in the health sector will tell you that the main, the main obstacle to the better performing of the RHAs has been the fact that the RHAs are not standalone entities in the, fact that they, in the context of complete autonomy. They still rely on the Ministry of Health for the main thing, funding, policy, and we still have, notwithstanding the creation of the RHAs, we still have duplications where the Ministry of Health has staff deployed across the country, and the RHAs have staff deployed across the country. So we've kept in crafting the RHA model on the basis of the French. The RHA model came from the French. We did not suppress functions at the Ministry of Health or remove functions and left the RHAs with complete autonomy. And I use that to say 
that what has created a problem for this board and similar entities is that they really had very little to do, and no offense to anybody who has served on this board. In fact, the, the chairman of the board, the last chairman, was also the first chairman and was also the only chairman of the board. And over time, especially my interaction with the private sector, the belief was that the board was not really doing much. Through no fault of the board, because the core livestock area in this country is really poultry. Trinidad and Tobago is self-sufficient in, in, in chicken, self-sufficient now in table eggs, and self-sufficient in ducks. There's just three examples. And the poultry did not fall from the sky. The strength of the local poultry industry is built around 1950s and 1960s government policy relating to land because poultry needs land. You need land for the processing facilities, or you need land for the growth of the, of the chicks. And you need a supportive government policy, an environment which allows you, for example, to import the old chicks, import hatching hatch eggs, to get support throughout, to get subsidies. And all the poultry industry has really required of us, as a Ministry of Agriculture, is to provide the technical support to those contract farmers. And it is on that basis that local chicken grow-out is a private sector activity. Many of the, 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 the farmers who grow out are contracted to the processors, and that is a private sector function. And the government maintains the supportive environment that allows them to thrive. And because of that, the poultry sector was one because they created their own entities, both a local association, Poultry Association of Trinidad and Tobago, a Caribbean association, and amongst themselves have been able to source the sort of expertise that has helped their industry to survive here. And as the table egg, there was a time when we had significant amount of imported table eggs on the, sh on the shelves, and eventually over time, by organizing themselves, by sourcing state land, by working with the ministry and the other parties involved, the table egg producers were able to displace the imports and give themselves a sort of stability and strength. Local duck, the strength of one producer who supported some of the other producers, Trinidad and Tobago is self-sufficient in duck. And that is why we took a long time before we made the appropriate amendment to the legislation to allow duck from Suriname, for example, to enter our market, simply because we believe that our, not only the fact that our producers were able to satisfy the local market, but our producers were, support, were in a position and had been adhering to the required phytosanitary standards. So the difference, Madam President, between this bill, this act, sorry, that is being repealed, and similar approaches across the world is that this did not, this board did not assume public sector functions. It did not take parts of the ministry park it in a board and make it more efficient or anything like this. This added, this added a piece of bureaucracy, not to mention a cost to the taxpayers. And it is my view as minister and a view that I took having regard to what I'm going to say about the approach. It's my view as minister that these, whatever functions were required of this board, 
are best perform in the existing public sector arrangement. Madam President, and I've been consistent, I've been consistent in saying that as Minister, upon my appointment, my first contribution in the Parliament was in respect of the budget debate 2015-2016. And in that debate, I set out the three areas upon which I'm going to focus as a minister. And I said, structure, governance, and people. And that is because, Madam President, I had seen that the structure of the ministry had remained the same for all its life. In fact, the headquarters of the ministry had remained the same. Ministry, the first place the ministry was housed as in St. Clair. And we remain one of the few ministries. Our ministry and Ministry of Finance was, as far as I know, the only ones who remained in the same place throughout its existence. And structure had to do with modernizing the structure of the ministry, which involves significant interference with public sector functions which are governed by trade union agreements. But it's not really so much to add, but it was to sub subtract, because I made the point that as a minister, in the context of Trinidad and Tobago in 2015, the availability of resources, the availability of talent, and the need to focus that I felt that the ministry could slim down itself. And it is on that basis, through a process, that we closed Karani Green, we closed the Seafood Industry Development Company, we reviewed Caribbean Fisheries Training and Development Institute in Chagaramas, we reviewed and gave them a fresh mandate, and we went through all the entities, including the Agricultural Society of Trinidad and Tobago, NAMDEVCO, ADB, and I have said publicly and in this parliament that I gave to chairmen and several of those entities a written mandate in terms of what they were supposed to do, particularly those who had statutory responsibilities. And in pursuit of that, in relation to livestock, specific work was done. In fact, two weeks after my appointment in October 2015, I charged the permanent secretary at the time with the responsibility to, to conduct a review of the local livestock sector. And I didn't do it without context. I was well aware that between 2003 and 2015, the ministry's livestock profile had changed because I was involved, as everybody knows, in the restructuring of the sugar industry in the move to turn Karani 1975 Limited into a non-trading company. And I knew that livestock assets which once belonged to Karani were parked in the ministry on what I could only describe as temporary ad hoc arrangements. So for example, the ministry inherited Monjalu operations, former livestock Karani, the farm at Mora Valley, where we have more than 1,000 buffalo so the asset at La Gloria, and some other things. So that in adding, in adding assets, I would imagine that you needed to add resources and to, and, to, and, to, and to beef up the ministry. And the examination I asked for was to see how the local livestock sector including those parts of it executed by the ministry, how the, those were functioning. And I would say in relation to livestock, Madam President, that in that period, my focus as a minister, alongside my colleague, Senator Singh, and whoever was the permanent secretary and the, and the technical officers in the ministry, I would say these are the things that I paid particular attention to. One, the sector as a whole. Two, buffalo Three, 
the local poultry sector. And let me just say at this time, when I became minister, September 2015, when I was appointed, imported leg and ties had taken 20% of the local market. I like leg and, in fact, I love chicken. Let me say that. And I love local chicken. And local chicken, so I don't have a problem with what part of the chicken. But imported leg and tie took 20% of the market. And in that first contribution in 2015, I placed on the record the views, my views informed by technical information on the quality and the destruction that local, that imported chicken was doing to our market. In relation to duck, it did not take very long. By November 2015, the largest duck producer, the person who is putting a million pounds of duck on the market, came to me to address an issue that had become so pervasive, it was costing the company sometimes half a million or quarter million dollars per shipment. And that is to do with the fact that the duty-free concession allowed for imported chicken is in relation to day-old chicken. And if the chicken arrives here an hour after 24 hours, chicken will be destroyed simply because it did not meet the regular. Something as that, simple as that, a big impact. And attention was paid to it, matter was addressed, and I believe that we have a strong, a strong uh, processing environment and, and growing out environment in which we could compete with that. Madam President, on the issue of the vets, veterinary services, that has been one of the areas of complaint in every report relating to the livestock sector. The livestock board could not have dealt with that. They could not have. The veterinary labs in relation to the vets, I commissioned, I asked my colleague, the Minister of Finance, to have the Central Audit Committee of the Ministry of Finance conduct an audit into the performance of the vets in the ministry. And the work was done, the report was tendered, and the permanent secretary has been charged to implement the recommendations. In relation to vet labs, historically, we've not been paying attention. We've not been paying attention, in fact, to the location the vet lab at Havelock Street in Curep has been robbed and vandalized and so on so many times. And no attention. And this livestock board could not do it. The ministry itself was not doing it, and we paid no attention to the labs. And the audit has provided us with an opportunity to first remove the location of the lab. It's now at Mount Jalu and to upgrade it and to make it in a, put it in a position where it could service the sector. The legislation, we had not dealt with legislation. We had not modernized the legislation. We had not done what the WTO expected of us, which is to create an environment in which we trade on the same basis as all our com counterparts in the international environment. And that puts a lot of pressure on importers put a lot of pressure on anybody doing business with us when we have not modernized and we do not have the regulations and the standards which will put, not only protect our market, but will protect our population. And this house and the other place, in July, by July 2020, the legislation had been passed to, to deal with that aspect of it. In relation to vets and the approach, Madam President, I know that my colleagues, Senator Mark, I know he's brought motions. I think it's two. He's brought some questions and one motion on the use of PPPs in the livestock sector and brought a motion specific to a repo livestock where we entered into a PPP arrangement because I know my friends on the opposition bench do not do not like when we involve the private sector. But I make no apologies in several contributions in this, in this house and in the other place. I have said that I've been 
in agriculture for long enough, a bill in the state enterprise for long enough to know that the state and the private sector must work together. Where the private sector is capable of performing more efficiently, more effectively, then we should allow the private sector to thrive. And where we believe that the state is best suited to perform, we should do that. So that if my friends are coming to say anything in relation to private involvement, I will tell you this. I've been around long. I've been around long. And in 1997, as I said, when this act came into being, Dr. Muhammad was not moving blindly. It is very clear, and I would read for you from this report, veterinary services in Trinidad and Tobago, and this is a paper done by Dr. Vincent Moore in 1997 for the FAO. And it dealt with veterinary, veterinary services. But in the paper, in, in setting out government policy, this is the context in which Dr. Moore was operating. And I quote, Trinidad and Tobago is implementing a structural adjustment program that aims at reducing reduction of public sector expenditure through the contraction of those public goods and services that could be better performed by the private sector. In the context of this program, vet services of the ministry have already introduced cost recovery for diagnostic services that have been available free of charge to both private practitioners and government veterinary officers. However, the recommendations for the privatization of government clinical veterinary services have not been implemented yet. Dr. Moore was referring to a policy already made. 1995 to 2000 was the time of my colleagues. And he's referring to a policy decision already made to privatize certain functions of the Ministry of Agriculture. In fact, he articulated later in the document, and I quote, government's policy over the next five years will be to A, privatize the clinical vet service with, while maintaining the service to rural communities that are not able to attract private practitioners for as long as necessary. So the board, the legislation giving effect to the board was conceived and passed and operationalized in the context of the government of the day wanting to privatize aspects of the public functions relating to the livestock sector. And if they wanted to do that, they should have gone all the way. They should have gone all the way and taken the key public interfacing services of the ministry at the time and place it in the hands of the livestock board, if, if that is where they wanted to go. And they could not achieve that without also taking staff from the ministry and placing it in the livestock board. So what they, do, they, what they achieve by this is far less than what the RHA has achieved because all that happened is that an act was passed, an office was identified, a board was appointed, and in 25 years, nothing significant has happened. And that is why we took that approach of having the evaluation done alongside the other things. And I'm not saying that the privatization is wrong, you know. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying that while it was government policy, it was not fully executed in the way it should have been executed. And strangely enough, I am proposing something that is the opposite. I do not want to see these functions, any of these functions, carted out from the ministry. I believe that the policy remains with the ministry. 
The technical services should be provided by the ministry, not just in rural areas, across the country. And there are some aspects of public interface that may be suitable for private sector involvement. But we are not there yet. The only place we've reached so far is in the operation of life, certain livestock farms we've introduced the private sector, and that is Aripo, and that is on a portion of land in La Gloria, 100 acres, those have been the two. Recently, we put out for public participation a 750-acre parcel in La Gloria. Again, for anybody in the pu public sector, public or private sector, anybody, to put in a proposal to use that unused former livestock land to conduct livestock operations, if they so choose. People also had the option of proposing non-livestock operations. And that evaluation we did, Madam President, was on the basis of 13 findings of the exercise. And it really had to do with things that we know, and that has to do with contraction of local production over a period of time. And I would say this right away. Nobody can convince me otherwise that the failure of successive governments to renew those leases in Carlsonfield, Wallerfield, and across significant parts of the country contributed to the decline of interest in livestock. I know importation had to, was a factor. I know that. But when you deal with those families in Wallerfield, because as I said, in the 60s, 50s and 60s, it was government's policy to build a local livestock sector. And at that time, the minister at the time had the tool of negative listing. I don't have that option. But using negative listing, we were able at the time to build a local livestock sector. And that local livestock sector could only be built like poultry on state land being available. And that is what led to the creation of Carlson Field, Waller Field, and those other parts of the country where we have livestock operations. And I would say, after the expiration of those leases, particularly in the 1980s when we were going through difficult times, the failure then to renew, remove the motivation not from the parents at the time, but from the children who came along. And now 40 years after, we engage in the renewal of those leases. And there's still interest. There's still interest in, in, in livestock. But it must be supported by the technical um, work of the ministry. It must be supported in an enabling environment as we've been able to do for poultry and the others I've referred to. So this report really confirmed what a lot of us knew, that the ministry was really focused on running its farms, its own farms, and running it in a highly, with all due respect to my colleagues in the ministry who work hard, I know that, but running it in an inefficient way, and in some cases crowding out the private farmers. Because buffalipso, for example, we still put buffalipso on the market. We still put buffalipso on the market. And for every pound of highly subsidized meat that is put on the market by the state, you are crowding out a potential private farm pound of meat. And that is the, that is the reality. And in its existence, the Livestock Board really could not do anything. It was for the minister, the cabinet, Prime Minister, Parliament, to do it. The Livestock Board had no function in relation to that and no power. And the report, this report, while not specifically dealing with the Livestock Board, was part of what led to the introduction of PPP, the work on the vet labs, even the work to, to have new vet surgeon legislation in the country and those things, those were important. Madam President, as I said, we did the work to replace the, 
the board. And I will tell you this. This bill has had a very unusual passage. It was on the other paper in 2019, as you know. It was on the other paper through 2020, 2021. It's been there for three sessions. It's been there across two terms in office. And why? Well, in 2019, when it was laid, we had not completed the work on the replacement. And it was only in May 19, 2020 that this House was able to debate the Act to Amend the Animal Diseases and Importation Act, Chapter 6702. It was only in May 2020. And I made it clear, maybe not to you, but I was very clear that this repeal bill should not be debated without the replacement being in place. And in May, on May 19, 2020, we passed that bill. And in July 2020, on the last day of the Parliament, in that five-year term, the House passed the bill. Because I was very anxious to get it done. In politics, you never know. You never know. And we got it done. And I'll just remind you very, very quickly. In that debate, I spoke about, for example, a simple thing as a chief vet, the chief vet officer. And Trinidad and Tobago being one of the few countries that did not, while the person performed the technical officer animal health, perform the duties of a chief vet, we had not done anything to create that office in the public service. And any one of you who have interacted with the public service in particular, matters relating to remuneration, acting, promotion, seniority, and so on, will know that if you do not have a job on the establishment, it creates a lot of problems. And I don't know how my predecessors wrangled with this, but I had a problem in dealing with it because if you have statutory responsibilities assigned to a chief vet, and if the region has chief vets because we all work on model legislation, then we would continuously have this problem. So that bill introduced the concept of the chief vet, the inspector and the chief vet, and understanding how the public sector works, we said in the, in the bill, the inspector for the purposes of this act is the person holding or acting in the office of technical officer animal health and includes the chief vet officer in the ministry and so on. So we catered for every possibility, knowing that the bureaucracy could really stymie our work if we did not have it as clear as that. And then when you go to, when you go to this section of that, of that bill, which dealt with the introduction of, of, of 3D, you would see 3D1, there shall be established a committee to be known as the Advisory Committee on Animal Health and Welfare. The committee comprises 11 members, a vet surgeon, senior technical officer from the ministry responsible for animal health, one from the Ministry of Health, a representative from the THA, representative from the Zoological Society, one from the private sector, one from the Institute of Marine Affairs, one from the Ministry of Trade, one from Food and Drugs Division of the Ministry of Health, and two persons to represent farming. And the purpose of that committee would, is to advise and provide assistance to the minister regarding animal health policies, animal welfare strategies, sanitary measures, disease prevention, control, and eradication. So a broad range of things. Minister. You have five more Thank minutes. you, Madam President. A broad range of responsibilities. And most importantly, that bill, that bill which is now 
form part of the parent bill detailed the regulatory making power, understanding that later on in dealing with the functioning of that advisory committee, we could introduce regulations specific to that committee. And Madam President, as I said before, on the first day of June 2021, that amendment was proclaimed. And it is from that moment, the proclamation, June 2021, I had then had the opportunity to pursue this repeal. And instead of pursuing it right away, we set up to establish the committee, populate the committee, and get the committee working. All of those things have been done. And I feel comfortable now coming to this house to say, I do not believe as minister that this act has served a significant or any purpose in 25 years, and I mean no disrespect to those who precede me. I believe that the work we've done in relation to the amendment in 2020 really sets us on the appropriate course. And I believe that the work that remains to be done in the context of that amendment and the regulatory powers that have been given in that amendment are sufficient to allow us to ensure that a strengthened public sector is the place for these functions and it will ensure the strength of the private operators, including our small farmers across the country. I thank you. I beg to move, Madam President. Honorable Senators, I shall now propose the question for debate. The question is that a bill entitled An Act to Repeal the Livestock and Livestock Products Board Act, Chapter 6705, be now read a second time. Senator Lyder. Thank you, Madam President. And Madam President, we are called to the Senate to treat with the administration of a key aspect of the agricultural sector in our nation, that being the livestock industry. And more specifically, honorable members present here today have been asked by the government to support the repeal of the Livestock and Livestock Products Board Act, Chapter 6705, the Act Number 40 of 1997. And Madam President, when I saw the bill with a mere two lines, and as I heard my honorable um, colleague, the Minister of Agriculture, mention it was only two lines, you know, I felt it important to go back into the act that is to be repealed so that this honorable Senate would have an appreciation for the justification of the appeal of this act here today. And Madam President, I listened attentively to the honorable Minister of Agriculture who I felt really struggled today with the justification. I almost feel as though um, he, may, he may be doing this under duress, Madam President. But so he danced around from issue to issue. We heard about the types of chicken he likes and all these things. And Madam President, I didn't get a, very, a, a full justification on why such an important board like this should now be mothballed. Madam President, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture made reference to the, uh, the, the act passed in 2020, or the bill passed in 2020, the Animal Disease Act, um, which of course I had the liberty of debating in that act, and spoke about an advisory committee, which I only noticed at the end of, the, of his presentation, he mentioned he, he formed the committee. I would like to know in the closing of, of, uh, of this debate, when the Honorable Minister wraps up, you know, who are those persons comprised? If the committee was really formed, then who were those persons that were, that were appointed? Because here we are about to close a, a, a statutory board, a board that, that included stakeholders in the industry that had specific um, responsibilities as laid out in Section 6 of the Act to hear about some committee that the ministers formed, which it, it, it seems very veiled um, in, in, in all respects. So, Madam President, you know, and, 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 and if this is the case that, that we must justify closing down a statutory board, maybe there should be many more statutory boards being shut down. Yet, later today in, in, in this Senate, we are about to put two more boards um, through the Napa and Sapa. So, you know, um, to me, it had 
to me, when, when I listen to the justification of the minister stating that this board was bureaucratic, that it, it served little purpose, it was ineffective, I ask myself the question whether or not th this was indeed the fact or whether they were simply not properly funded and not properly supported by this government. But Madam President, in returning to this act, it is important to understand the history of the act the intention of the act and the responsibilities that have been set out in this act. This is important to set the context for the debate today, and as such I am grateful for the opportunity now through you, Madam President, to um, set this context and referring to some of actual details in the act and not opinions coming out of the Honorable Minister. So when we examine this legislation, we note that it was passed and proclaimed in 1997 by the United National Congress, and the government at the time would have seen the justification for the livestock uh, board in an in a effort to advance and promote and develop the livestock and dairy industry. And from the review of this act, it sets out to appoint a livestock and livestock product board. This board would have had various responsibilities as set out uh, in detail in the legislation. But Madam President, when I look to the section four, which basically states the composition of the board, we see that the board is comprised of seven members appointed by the minister. And for the benefit of this Senate, I would like to read out who were these members or who would, who did, what, this board, what members this board would comprise of. So very quickly, I will just run through it. Firstly, um, one shall represent the, and if you permit me to read, one shall represent the, the ministry responsible for agriculture. One shall be nominated by the Tobago House of Assembly, and I, I welcome our colleagues, brothers and sisters from the THA here today who um, have come in at a very interesting time to listen to a bill like this. Um, uh, one shall represent the meat processing subsector after the minister consults with the subsector. One shall represent the small remnants subsector after the minister consults with the subsector. One shall represent the dairy subsector. One shall represent the port subsector. One shall represent the poultry subsector. So, Madam President, when we look at the makeup of this board, it is clear that the framers of this act deemed it necessary, and rightfully so, to include a number of stakeholders on such an important board. Stakeholders who would bring light and bring transparency to the matters that are affecting the farmers in their respective industries. Madam President, as I um, continued reading the Act, I was able to also identify the roles and responsibilities of the Board as set out in Section 6, um, subsections A through J. And so for the benefit of the Senate, when uh, deliberating on, a, on such a decision to repeal this law, it is important to understand the roles that this board had, and not simply just take it, take it from the Honourable Minister that they were ineffective. Let us look at what was actually in subsection, so in section six, Madam President. And very quickly, I will run through that. So, uh, the, to, firstly, they were meant to administer, on behalf of the government of Trinidad and Tobago, any programs supportive of the livestock industry. B, they were to promote and guide the formation of cooperatives within the livestock industry. C, they were to collect, store, and disseminate data and information on the activities of the livestock industry. D, to monitor problems affecting production and marketing with a view to making appropriate representation to the relevant authorities. E, to provide a forum for communication among farmers in the livestock industry. F, to maintain a register of livestock producers and processors. G, to provide and an influence policymakers in the best interests of the livestock industry. H, to identify research and development and training needs and provide development opportunities for the livestock industry. I, to establish and operate auction yards to facilitate sale of animals. And J, to set out quality guidelines for the sale of livestock and livestock products. Madam President, when I read this, this is by no means a light task. This is very specific. And if managed properly, there was quite a lot that this board would contribute to the, to the livestock industry. So, you know, after reading this and understanding that the act included stakeholders with specific duties that would continue, that would contribute towards the development and growth of this livestock industry, I ask myself the question, why? Why are we here today 
repealing this bill. As again, the minister states that the board was ineffected, ineffective. And, you know, Madam President, after reading all of these responsibilities, if this board was indeed empowered, could we, could we really understand what could be contributed to this livestock industry? It's almost as though they were set up to fail. So why are we doing away with what I consider to be such a critical institution for this industry? To what? Replace it with a simple committee? Well, I'll get to that in a moment, Madam President. What was even more questionable, and which raises more red flags for me, when looking at the history of this board, noting that the first board was formed and inaugurated in 1998 by a United National Congress government, the board then continued to remain active until the UNC-led partnership demitted office in 2015. It was only when this PNM government came into power in 2015, right, we got to find out that no board was appointed from the very inception all the way to 2018, when a former Minister of Agriculture had to put pressure on the government and take the government to court to force them to appoint this board. So we ask ourselves, so the minister, you know, you know so, so, so we ask ourselves, how could the minister have come here today, the Honourable Minister come here today, and state how ineffective this board was when from the very onset, when they came into office, they never even put this board in place. They never empowered the board. They never financed the board. But only through legal action were forced to put the board in place in 2018. So upon assuming office, the livestock board was not appointed by the Honorable Mister, Minister until he was compelled to do so, Madam President. It is a past Minister of Agriculture, understanding the importance of this board to develop the industry, challenged this minister's failure to appoint the board, and they won in court. Madam President, the minister attempted to defend his failure to comply with the law by stating that there was no clear mandate for the board, and so he hired a consultant to do an evaluation and, consult and, and conduct consultations. However, Madam President, the minister ignored some of the achievements of the board under the People's Partnership Administration, which were documented in an annual report. The minister did not, con and, and furthermore, Madam President, the minister did not even disclose to the court the report, the, the, this report from this consultant. So the court went on further to state that there was no evidence in the affidavit filed by the minister as to how the board, in its previous form, failed to promote or more, or, or a more efficient livestock industry. So this is the court deciding this. You know, This is not the UNC deciding this. This is the court stating that the minister couldn't justify it. Just as respectfully, ma'am, it could not be justified today. They could not substantiate the weak claims made against the board. Let me quote directly from the judgment on paragraph 64. And as I quote, notably missing from the Jacobs affidavits are the documents which the defendant reviewed, which caused him to conclude that the board had not engaged in matters connected with the general mandate of its specific functions. In my opinion, the absence of the said evidence clearly demonstrated that there was no basis for asserting that the board was not complying with its mandate. That is a quote from the court, you know, Madam President. The court repeatedly pointed out the absence of the, uh, the evidence to substantiate the minister's claim. And so the court mandated him to appoint this board. And having lost the court battle and being forced to appoint the board, the minister now comes to parliament to disband this board. And therefore, instead of a representative body as contemplated by this act, the minister will do as he pleases, but I'm not sure it's as what he pleases. I, 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 there, there's more to this, Madam President. When the court took the decision and the government was forced to form the board, what we understand from a former board member was that there were five members of the board chosen and that one of the five opted in the end not to move forward with this board. So we understand that the board, though constituted, remained dormant, completely underfunded and unsupported. In fact, Madam President, it has also come to our attention that, a board, that some of the board members protested to the fact that a particular 
senior ministerial official who had already had a substantial portfolio in the ministry was chosen to chair the board. The minister could let us know if this is true or not, but at the end of the day, any progress for this board to fulfill its mandate was indeed frustrated by the lack of activity and the lack of funding. So, Madam President, that's why I say it seems as though this board was set up to fail. So I tend to wonder when do we, whether we are repealing this bill today because the government was happy with the, with the court ruling, or is there another agenda? Because after reading the act, Madam President, I am struggling to find real justification as to why we are called to repeal a law which will lead ultimately to the scrapping of the livestock and livestock products board. It is my respectful view that this Senate should not support the government in the repealing of this act. This action will serve to co continue the decline in the agriculture industry. It will negatively impact small and medium-sized farmers, leading to a near extinction and the creation, possibly, of virtual monopolies in these industries. And I think the, the other term used, the technical economic terms used for this is oligopoly, where just a few of the big boys control the entire livestock business. Madam President, the government has systematically dismantled key institutions in the livestock industry. And I will use section six of the act and stakeholders' feedback to demonstrate the same here today. You see, I intend to dissect each of uh, the aspects of the responsibilities of the board and show where the government has defunded and dismantled institutions in the livestock sector. But before doing so, Madam President, uh, before delving into the duties of this board and the effect of the absence of this board since 2015 to 2018, I also felt it important to understand the value of the board by gauging the performance of the industry over the last five years in the absence of this board, Madam President. Because the Honorable Minister stated, um, indicated in his presentation here today that the functions of the board was best placed within the ministry. So let's see how things performed, how everything performed when there was no board. Let's take a look at that. Well, the first place I looked at, Madam President, is I pulled look for CSO data, and you know, which presented statistics showing an overall decline in the agriculture sector by some $190.5 million, or 13% decline from 2015 to 2020. In 2015, Madam President, total output in the agricultural sector stood at approximately 1.47 billion, but then 2020, it fell to $1.28 billion. However, Madam President, this information was not specific to production of, of specific animals. And as such, I took the opportunity to consult with some well-renowned economists who would have investigated this and dug deeper into the decline in the industry. Madam President, it, it was estimated that beef production had declined by 127.8 thousand kilograms, or a 44.5 decline from 2015 to 2019. Mutton production fell by 28.5 thousand kilograms, or 36.9 from 2015 to 2018. And then, Madam President, I started digging up, and I looked further, and strange enough, I found an article in the Newsday which showed a substantial decline in the dairy milk pr production. Regarding milk production, the article, which is on the 25th of January 2021, reported, and I will quote from the article, production declines have hit the industry hard. Industry records show that farmers were producing as much as 13 million liters in 1995 to 2000, but production had declined to about 1 million liters a year, that is current, and about only about 100 or so remaining dairy farmers, which are, by the way, no match for the big milk importers that's, that, that spend millions of US dollars in foreign exchange to import milk. So understanding the context of this, of the law, understanding the responsibilities of the board, and witnessing this decline in the livestock industry, I will now take this opportunity, Madam President, to circumscribe myself to Clause 6 of the Act to be repealed here today. To this effect, I will outline the state of play in the industry and demonstrate where the provisions set out in Clause 6, if properly administered, will address the current issues in the livestock industry. 
So, Madam President, when we look at 6A, to administer on behalf of the government of Trinidad and Tobago any programs supportive of the livestock industry. In consultation, Madam President, with former members of the board as it pertains to the role, the, they indicated a slew of programs that the board would have instituted to fulfill the objectives. I can just name a few, Madam President, such as they assisted the artificial insemination unit when they had problems in acquiring necessary equipment to support their work. Um, Yoni's disease survey conducted by the board to ascertain where, how, and in what position our livestock industry stood as it pertains to Yoni's disease. What is this disease, Madam President? It's a chronic, contagious, and often fatal disease for cattle, sheep, goat, etc. But as a consequence, Madam President, it is evident that this was a critical exercise undertaken by the board. Furthermore, Madam President, they assisted to bring new, st new stock of cattle into the country to improve breed. So now, Madam President, what do we see happening? When we look at the artificial insemination station, as we consulted with stakeholders, especially in the Waller Field area, the issue of the artificial insemination station arose, and it arose very loud. This is, was a facility, Madam President, that was used for the harvesting of semen from, from bucks for farmers. The, the animals treated in this facility were of all categories of livestock, Madam President, whether it was cattle, whether it was goat, sheep, even rabbit. Madam President, the artificial insemination station in a repo, however, has been under-resourced and defunded over the last six years. By defunding the artificial insemination station, the government has effectively or is effectively eliminating the small farmer in favor of these large farmers who could bring in their own stock, who could afford to bring their own stock, who can do their own artificial insemination, Madam President. Madam President, the small farmer doesn't have access to these key facilities for their operation. This is a facility that the board so, would have had the oversight. Senator Lida, I need to just, I've given you a lot of leeway and I just want to point out that you have to relate what you are saying to the matter that is before us and not just go into a general uh, discussion on everything in the agricultural sector, okay? And that is why, as I was coming down to the end of this point, I was indicating that this facility, um, this is a facility that the board would have had an oversight over. So I'm saying with the closure or, or with the repealing of this bill, this board, which have, would have had oversight over this facility, would no longer have that level of oversight. So it is very relevant, Madam President, to the repeal of this bill. So I, I know I'm stating things that don't appear very nice or attractive in the, in the agriculture industry, but I'm going to tie every one of them, Madam President, to the effects of the, what the effects would be in repealing this bill. So we ask ourselves the question, why? So, so, Madam President, we ask ourselves the question, why? An answer to which I shall reveal again later, Madam President. We see the same things happening, Madam President, with the sugarcane feed center, which makes quality breeding livestock available for persons with farms. Research has gone on in making alternative feed for farmers as well. A lot of farmers have learned on farming feed mix at this site. Yet this is another program that the government has continued to defund, which this board would have had some level of oversight and influence, Madam President. So we see the same, so, so Madam President, Sentinel, Sentinel Livestock Station is another location that has suffered the same fate in the funding. These facilities, Madam President, and programs would have fallen under the purview of this board we are repealing today. The board would have had advocated for the proper staffing and funding of these facilities to benefit the small and medium farmer. Programs are now almost non-existent under this board. And as such, it is the private entities that have to fend for themselves. For instance, Madam President, in the absence of this board for the, for the, um, between 2015 and 2018, there, there was this Sheep and Goat Association, which, by the way, I sat on that board, who had to collaborate with the European Union on a program to bolster goat milk production. And the European Union would have supplied equipment 
to the small and medium farmers' milking equipment to improve goat milk production. This would have been something that the board could have taken a part, part in. These are programs that the board would have usually facilitated, but due to the absence of this board, the Sheep and Goat Society was compelled to engage with the European Union um, it, for this initiative and for this venture. The board was also working on a program to get farmers to be more efficient. All of this has fallen apart. The board was advocating for rabbits to be included under processing and was working to have it facilitated under small ruminants. Agri aqua aquaculture producers were also seeking inclusion as they were not facilitated at the national strategic level. This would include tilapia farmers and so on. The board was advocating for this. Board shut down. Madam President, when we look at 6B of the responsibilities of this board, where we are repealing this bill today or attempting to repeal this bill today, Part B was to promote and guide the formation of cooperatives within the livestock industry. This as aspect could have been greatly facilitated by an active and funded board. When we look at 6, 6C, to collect, store, and disseminate data and information on the activities of the livestock industry. In conversations with former board members, this function is something that would have been done over the years. A significant amount of data would have been collected, stored, and shared with stakeholders all through the length and breadth of this industry. The board dispatched field officers through the ministry to engage in outreach to farmers, giving them the information they needed to grow their farms. With the repealing of this bill, which seeks to disband this board, is this government now putting the Ministry of Agriculture in a position to lose this data? and deprive small and medium farmers from such valuable information. Where is the information? Maybe the minister could tell us where the information is, or is it locked away in a cabinet somewhere? Madam President, when we look at 6D, to monitor problems affecting production and marketing with a view to making appropriate representation to relevant authorities, livestock farmers are in effect without a marketing unit. And this is because when we looked at the operations in Namdevku, there was little efforts made or no efforts made to promote and market the livestock industry. It was all towards fresh produce, not meat. So this has resulted in harsher operating environment when you compound it with the infrastructure deficiencies now faced by livestock farmers. An active board would have had the responsibility to advocate for marketing of livestock through NAMDEFCO. Madam President, it was, a, uh, when we look at some of the constraints to marketing, the UE Agriculture Department in 2019, research into the dairy industry pointed to constraints to marketing. These constraints that should have been addressed, should there have been a board in place, pertaining to marketing would have been stuff like prices, price for milk received by farmers was deemed to be a constraint by 64% of the respondents in the survey. A major issue regarding the dairy farmers in the industry hits at the heart of their business model. You, rep you will report it, and I will quote, the price offered for raw milk by the main milk processor Nestle was $2.35 and $1.50 subsidy was paid by the government of Trinidad and Tobago to give a total price of $3.85 per kilogram of raw milk. Farmers had, to, had the opportunity to receive a bonus based on the quality of the milk they produced, which acted as an incentive. But Madam President, UE also pointed to Medford Farms as another buyer of raw milk for $5 per kilogram. And it was found that the cost of production per kilogram of milk was 522. The revenue obtained from the milk processors is less than the cost of production itemized by UE. So UE concluded that there was a need to agree a favorable price for all. This is something that the board could have championed. Another issue, Madam President, feed used was a key component in the cost of production as well as output. Output. When we look at the Monjolu Forage Development Center, which the minister spoke about earlier, located in Chinchin, this is a major gr grass forage bank for farmers in the country. All farmers should be able to access grass and forage from this at a, a very little cost. Madam President, this facility has been defunded. 
It is now manned by a skeleton crew. There is faulty equipment, inclusive of three broken down tractors. There are hundreds of acres that have been reserved for forage, yet it is not being serviced. If the farmer visits, they'll be faced with a situation where the individual will be asked to provide some charity to this government to help to service equipment in order to get a little bit of grass needed for their livestock. If we had a board governing over this sector, they could have taken the steps. They could have exposed to all those illegal farmers and the illegal farming that is now happening on this Monjulu Forage Development Center, where over 100 acres of the Monjulu um, Forage Development Center is being encroached by illegal farming. Madam President, even medicine for animals. And when you look at this, this is another very important component to ensure a steady production and production levels are high. However, this time, medication for the small and medium farmer is very difficult to obtain. You see, the main supplier of livestock-related medicines, uh, a company by the name of Sumed, experienced a fire, which resulted in now, currently, a shortage of supply of medicines. Medicines needed for these small farmers, such as wormers, antibiotics, vitamins, amongst others. Surely a functioning board would have placed an emphasis on finding solutions through the ministry to address these medication shortages. So the large farmers are basically handling their own supply of medication, whilst the small farmers are now left in the cold. Madam President, when we look at 6E, to provide a forum for communication amongst farmers in the livestock industry, I invite the government to pleasantly surprise the members here today. What information can indicate that this mandate is being carried out? Madam President, 6F, to maintain a register of livestock producers and processors. In September 2019, just over two years ago, the, the Food and Agriculture Facility of UE St. Augustine published a report on the status of the dairy industry in Trinidad and Tobago. The report was very extensive, where they outlined the state of the industry, addressing main challenges and, uh, and outlined recommendations for improvement. The report stated that, and I quote, the total number of dairy farmers in Trinidad is not accurately recorded. Nevertheless, the university identified 103 farmers using information from 90, uh, from 90 for their report. A board could have dealt with this in 6G to advise and influence policymakers in the best interest of the livestock industry. I heard the minister talk about land tenure. This is a major issue that farmers need a policy to be made. They need this to be addressed. The government via the Ministry of Agriculture does not give leases. They merely prepare the application for the leases but it is the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago that has to give these leases. Farmers' lease applications have been held. They have been held up in, state land, in a state land department for years before they can get any approval. So this has led many farmers to uh, refer to this state land department as the cold storage unit for leases. The board at the time was examining how they could get past the hurdles to increase the access of farmers to land and to increase production for farmers. So now that the board is set to be disbanded, who exactly is going to seek the interests of these small and medium farmers in this regard? I call again for the minister to tell us who is on this committee. Madam President, when you look at Paradia Larceny, that's another major issue in agriculture. This is put a pertinent issue when you consider that land holdings and physical operations of farmers Prominent among the recommendations of the UE study published in 2019 was the need for the government to place proper emphasis on paradial larceny. Madam President, a significant amount of farmers, 43 reported losses by theft of over 165 animals within the last five years, estimated to be more than $651,000. This is, these reported losses is only a fraction. I, when I was farming small remnants, I lost 19 in one day, $50,000 worth of livestock. Madam President, 
The URI report indicated that 48% of them were affected by paradial larceny. They called for the strengthening of the paradial larceny unit squad. And when we look at the single greatest factor besides natural disasters that prevents the success of farmers in this country, or both active or potential farmers, is this thing they call paradial larceny. With only, when you consider that there are only three. Senator Leider, you, you're doing it again. You're straying into an overall discussion, and I'm asking you to please bring it back to what we're dealing with. Thank you very much. And every point I've given you today, I bring it right back to the point that a fully functioning board would have advocated for the interests of the farmers and stakeholders of this country, especially when we see that the board was made up of actual stakeholders and not simply ministry officials. I think when the Honorable Minister spoke about the committee, there were two stakeholders, but there was a stakeholder representing every single industry of livestock in this act that we, were, that we are come here today to repeal. And paradial larceny is a, is a fact, but Madam President, I will take your advice. I will take your advice, and I will move on. But I will continue to say, I will bring it back every single time to this board having such an important role in, this, in, in, in the processes. Madam President, when we look at 6H of the bill we are about to repeal to identify research and development and training needs and provide development opportunities for the livestock in industry. This is what this board is meant to do. Madam President, this, this comes now to the pasteurizing plant in a repo. Yes. It was under the United National Congress that a multi-million dollar pasteurizing plant, Madam President, was meant for the use of farmers in the country and was housed in a repo. The board, this board, was... Senator Leider, you have five more minutes. Thank you, Madam President. This board was involved in that. The farmers of Wallafy were clamoring for a plant that they could use to pasteurize the milk and sell on the local market and get better money than they were, than, than they were getting from Nestle. Madam President, however, at present, access to this plant is not there for the small and medium farmer. It's there for someone else, but not for the small and medium farmer. And when we look at 6J, to set out quality guidelines for the sale of livestock and livestock products. Again, on this score, Madam President, HACCP, which is an international standard for agriculture, has been the key focus of the board at that time. The board ran training programs for farmers in HACCP. So this is very relevant, Madam President. Furthermore, courses were offered across the country in proper handling of food for operation along the food value chain. So again, the removal of this board spells an end to this initiative, Madam President. So I ask myself the question, who really benefits here today? So I have outlined that the board would have fulfilled a significant mandate. The absence of which coupled with the, the funding of key facilities as outlined above when my presentation results in one commercial farmer benefiting from taxpayers' investment when the Oripo Farms was gifted to a close friend of a high government official. And I asked myself the question, is this why the artificial insemination station is now almost mothballed? Is it also to be gifted to the Oripo Farms? I'm just, a question, I'm just a question, Madam President. As we are aware, the repo farms almost engulfs the artificial insemination station and could naturally form part of this repo state. Is this why we don't have a board to facilitate a repo farms to take control of this? So there's no oversight, no independent oversight by stakeholders, Madam President? Madam President, then we are also hearing about other facilities. Tongues are wagging in, the, in this industry about other facilities that are meant to be privatized. So the closure of this livestock board would now be the final blow to small farmers in Trinidad and Tobago. This approach would only benefit the large farmers and especially the importers of meat in this country. So the government has questions to answer 
um, as farmers have been testifying to us, that this high government official is utilizing a very large farm in this country. But I wouldn't get into to too much of that, Madam President. Madam President, we are hearing about the privatization of a number of entities owned by the state and owned by the taxpayers of this country. We heard about La Gloria. We know what happened to Aripo. We are asking what's going to happen to the artificial insemination plant. We are asking what's going to happen to the sugarcane feed center, Monjalu facility, Sentinel livestock station. Is it all being earmarked to be sold? The shutdown of this board will silence a major voice of the livestock farmers in this nation. Madam President, I see my time is coming to a close. And so it is my respectful view that the view of the, and the view of the UNC that this bill should be rejected and the government should reinstate fully this board specifically made up of previous stakeholders in the industry. It is clear to me that any member who supports this bill will be complicit in the act of destroying the livestock industry. They will be complicit Senator, in the extension. No, 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 Senator Leider, please. You, 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 I, I would discourage you from saying that. I would ask you to withdraw that. Withdraw that, Madam President. Yes. But if I were to vote for this, I would be complicit in destroying the livestock industry. If I voted for this, I would be complicit in the extinction of small and medium farmers. At a time when our food import bill continues to be in excess of $5 billion, at a time when foreign exchange is in short supply, at a time when we are experiencing supply chain issues and shortages in food supply, it is then reckless for this government to now come to commit the injustice of this livestock industry. Food security is of the utmost importance to every nation. It is high time that this PNM government takes its role and its endeavor with the utmost seriousness. Do not repeal this act. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Vera. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. Before I begin, maybe I should say a little of my background or exposure to the livestock sector. Um, Back in the day, and I'm going back many years, I used to do work with Dr. Reza Mohammed and uh, Dr. Mahfouz Aziz um, for the cattle, the dairy farmers, and meat farmers association. Um, I was also involved at one point uh, as one of the lawyers advising the ADB, and I have also been involved in the drafting of the constitution for the veterinary association. Let me say, first off, that the livestock sector is absolutely critical to the well-being of this country. Um, and, and let me put that in context. It's an important source of nourishment for our population. It's important for agricultural development. And as Senator Lida says, it's important for food security. In fact, one could say that livestock rearing is or should be a pillar of our food system. And more so during this time 
of supply chain disruption and the rising costs of imported food. Now, I'm not one of those that subscribe to the belief that livestock farming must be mega farming. In fact, in most parts of the world, livestock farming is small-scale farming. And small-scale livestock farming not only offers opportunities for socioeconomic development in our rural areas, as I said, it's also critical to food security, and it should be one of the key elements towards economic growth. So, given the comparative recency of the Livestock Act, commencing in 1998, and the importance of the livestock sector, I, I was really surprised to see this repealing of both the Act and the Board. And after hearing the Honorable Minister, I'm even more surprised. I think this is a step backwards. The Act was unpretentious. Its purpose was very simple and clear. There is hereby established a board to be known as the Livestock and Livestock Products Board, having the general duty to promote greater efficiency in the livestock industry and the livestock products industry. General duty to promote greater efficiency. I'm not going to read over the sections. Um, section six, Senator Lido quoted from it, but that function, I don't see how and why that would clash with the Ministry of Agriculture. It's not in conflict with the Ministry. These are merit-worthy functions, all right? Particularly when you look at the question about administering government programs supportive of the industry, collection and dissemination of relevant data to the industry, monitor problems affecting production and marketing, providing a forum for communication among farmers, maintaining a register of livestock producers, very important, advising and influencing policymakers in the best interests of the industry, setting quality guidelines. These are important functions. And I didn't really see any need um, for the ministry to be in any way offended by or at odds with these functions. Now, the Honorable Minister basically said this act is being repealed for these reasons. The board had little to do. The board wasn't set up to provide regulatory oversight. The board did not assume public sector functions, just added to the bureaucracy. and fuels these functions best performed by the public sector. Well, given the purposes of the Act, my question is, why repeal? Couldn't we just amend? If, if, if we lacked regulatory oversight, couldn't we provide the necessary regulatory oversight? We hear now that this board, which really comprised experts in the sector on a multidisciplinary basis, this board is now going to be replaced by an advisory committee within the Ministry of Agriculture. Well, again, I think that's a step backwards because the advisory committee doesn't have the breadth and gravitas of the board. But in any event, the advisory committee was always there. They were there with the board, and they will be there to continue with the board. So we're not really replacing the board with anything, in my respectful view. Now, the minister recognized that the board functioned as a think tank. And as I pointed out, the board had the function of um, advising on policy. I don't accept the notion that all expertise in the sector resides within the Ministry of Agriculture. I think that's a dangerous notion and we sell ourselves short. And so now, if it is going to be that this advisory committee is going to be creating and advising on policy, then I think, again, we're taking a step backwards. I agree with 
Senator Leider, I think the minister was contradictory. He was not his usual precise uh, self in pilot in this act. For example, he says all relevant expertise resides in the public sector. Well, I don't accept that. He quoted excerpts and relied on a particular report and yet confirms that the report did not deal specifically with the livestock board. He says livestock must be supported by the technical work of the ministry. The board was conceived and passed to operationalize in the context of privatizing aspects of the functions of the private sector. Yet he says that where the framers of the legislation erred is that they failed to go all the way. Well, if that is where they erred, we could correct that. Let's go all the way. Let's go all the way in the context of this framework. I don't see repealing it and leaving a vacuum as helpful at all. I, I do think that we're taking a step backwards. Had a multidisciplinary board with meaningful and useful functions Now we won't have the benefit of those sector experts, and we will be relying solely on this advisory committee within the Ministry of Agriculture. It seems to me that this act is more about ensuring that the functions are not, how did the minister put it, are not carted out of the Ministry of Agriculture. This is not about diversification and decentralization. It's, it's actually the opposite. It's not about crowding out the public sector. It's about crowding out the private sector. And it's a sector which, as I said, is a very important sector for our economy, for food security, for our rural communities here and in Tobago. And it's a sector which includes cattle, dairy and meat, goats, sheep, pigs, ducks, fish like tilapia. It's not just buffalipso and poultry. It's a sector that needs think tanks and multi-sectoral support. As I said, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that livestock farming is all about the large farms, the carnies, um, and so it really, this really should be about the small farmer. Livestock rearing at its heart is about small farmers and enabling and enhancing our livestock sector through environmentally sustainable food production policies will have multiplier effects throughout our rural communities and the economy. There's a lot I could say about the livestock sector, and Senator Leider talked about prettier larceny and livestock theft. I'm not gonna go there because it's irrelevant to the, this debate, but we do need, we do need to find ways to increase efficiency of the livestock sector and environmental sustainability by incentivizing farmers and the institutions that serve them. That is how we're going to diversify this economy. The livestock sector is an important agricultural subsector which offers many opportunities for smallholders, for agribusiness, job creators throughout the livestock supply chain but it needs to be properly managed if we are to avoid the risks posed by adverse impacts on the environment to animal and human health, the osmosis legislation we looked at before. We need to improve financial incentives for livestock producers and to provide them with proper guidance in ways that are relevant to the needs, which is what this board was about. This cannot be left, in my respectful view, to a departmental advisory committee within the Ministry of Agriculture. If we don't replace the board with this legislation with something meaningful, if we leave a vacuum to exist, I agree with Senator Leider, we will be seriously failing the livestock sector. I thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. 
difference with standing order 48.4. I beg to move that the debate on a bill entitled An Act to Repeal the Livestock and Livestock Products Board Act Ch Chapter 6705 be adjourned. Thank you. Honorable members, the question is that the debate on a bill entitled An Act to Repeal the Livestock and Livestock Products Board Act Chapter 6705 be adjourned. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those again say no. I think the eyes have it. Minister of Tourism, Culture, and the Arts. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I beg to move that a bill entitled An Act to Provide for the Establishment of the National Academy for the Performing Arts and for the Management and Control Thereof and for Related Matters be now read a second time. Madam President, it is indeed a signal honor for me to pilot this bill to establish a body corporate to be known as NAPA for the purpose of owning, managing, and operating the facility known as the National Academy for the Performing Arts in the city of Port of Spain. This bill, once passed and proclaimed, addresses a number of inefficiencies and issues that have plagued Napa since its inception and will once and for all provide for the more effective management of the facility in the spheres of culture and the arts. The question one might ask now is why is there such a need at this time to put these measures in place to ensure greater and more effective management and operations of Napa? Apart from some of the management inefficiencies plaguing Napa, it is a fact that Trinidad and Tobago is and continues to be a cultural powerhouse in the region and in the world, and it is what drives our tourism product. We have given our culture to the world, and many countries and cities across the world not only continue to enjoy and fall in love with our culture and cultural expression and products, but they also utilize our cultural expression and products to realize real economic benefit. Yet we continue to miss the opportunities to truly maximize our culture and entertainment economically, while at the same time continue to advance the development of our orange economy. It is a fact, perhaps too little recognized, that apart from our energy costs and resources, our other comparative advantage is our culture. It is one of our main unique selling propositions. As little as we may be on the world map, we have created and developed the steel pan instrument, Calypso, Soka, Rapso, Tobago speech band, Chutney, our own version of spoken word or dances, our theater, infused and influenced with the culture and practices of our many ancestors. And with these incredibly valuable, intangible assets, we must continue to move away from the dependence on the energy sector and realize fully the economic potential of our entertainment and cultural sectors. We must treat creative works and expression as productive and valuable endeavors. So how does this tie into our policy prescriptions? The Vision 2030 Sustainable Development Goals identified, among other challenges, dependence on the energy sector, weak institutions, and rapid advances in technology as national challenges to be overcome on the way to achieving developed nation status. More effective management and operations of NAPA and SAPA will contribute to fulfilling the national vision statement by enabling members of the creative sector to feel valued and attain their fullest potential, supported by efficient management of these performance spaces. Providing a facilitative environment for fostering diversity and creativity. In other words, Madam President, changing the management structure improves the ease of doing business, which lays the foundation for creatives to create in a space that allows their work to flourish comfortably. The reason for and desired outcome behind laying these bills are in keeping with the development themes outlined in the Sustainable Development Goals. By changing the management structure of these performance spaces, we are able to promote decent work 
and economic growth through di diversification and innovation, promote job creation, entrepreneurship, creativity, and innovation, and devise and implement policies to promote sustainable tourism that creates jobs, promotes local culture and products. In addition, these bills will facilitate the protection and safeguarding of our cultural and national heritage by providing a more efficiently managed performance space. Madam President, permit me to go a little into the background of the National Academy for the Performing Arts and place on the record and provide some understanding the genesis of the creations of the two academies for the performing arts in North and South Trinidad. Of course, we're dealing with Napa in the North. The first major stakeholder consultation for the performing arts academies took place as far back as 1988 at the Jean Pierre Sport Complex under the NAR government. In 1990, a committee convened by that prime minister put forth a new plan for a National School of the Arts, Steel Band Theater, and overall creative arts gallery and administrative offices. Between the years 1990 and 1994, further consultations done over the period with concerned stakeholders conducted in part by former culture minister, Mrs. Joan Newell Williams, and it was from then that we find the evidence of the National Academies for the Performing Arts, and it was then that it was born. Fast forward to 2002 to 2004, consultations continued, and in 2005, the decision was taken by the then cabinet to construct the National Academies for the Performing Arts, funded by a concessional loan with the government of China and the IDF, in alignment with that government's aggressive pursuit of its Vision 2020 National Strategic Development Plan that was designed to ensure that by the year 2020, Trinidad and Tobago would be a unified, resilient, productive, innovative, and prosperous nation. In 2007, construction started on Napa at the Princess Building Grounds in Port of Spain at the estimated cost of $360 million for the construction works to be funded via the concessional loan while the design and other ancillary costs were to be funded by the IDF. The estimated cost of construction increased through a variation to re relocate the public tennis courts and other facilities from the Pr Princess Building Grounds to the then named King George V Park. The Napa facilities built on 26,000 square meters consist of three main and distinct areas, a theater area, an academy area, and a 53-room hotel. The theater area, now called the Lord Kitchener Aldwin Roberts Auditorium, is a theater 1,200 seating capacity one VIP room with a capacity for 10 persons, a box office, and an over 1,000 square meter stage capable of moving in sections, state of the art. Technical control rooms, both on stage and front of the house. Two main dressing rooms and smaller dressing rooms for more personalized atmosphere, as well as studios for the performing artists, and office space for administrative use. The academy area, which is occupied by the University of Trinidad and Tobago, has three large classrooms and 10 smaller classrooms. Two multifunction halls, which are conference rooms to host functions with lighting and sound systems on the ground level with a total capacity seating of 400 persons. In the hotel area, there are 53 rooms consisting of standard, single, and double rooms, as well as three suites. And two restaurants, one designed for Western cuisine with a capacity of 80 to 100 persons, and the other with catering to Chinese cuisine with a capacity of 130 to 150 persons. There are other areas 
on the complex, an atrium, a waterscape and garden feature, and a bridge connecting the hotel to the academy area. There is an outdoor area with landscaping and high mast external lighting that beautiful, beautifully lights up the skyline. Parking facilities with 172 outdoor spaces and 44 basement spaces within the compound. And of course, Madam President, a musical fountain. Napa was officially opened in 2009. But in 2008, prior to its opening, the then cabinet determined arrangements for the ownership, management, and operation of Napa, which might have, at that time, seemed logical in a public sector management sense. Government determined that the ownership of Napa would remain with government. A single entity, a subsidiary of UTT, was tasked with the management, maintenance, and security of the entire complex. UTT took responsibility for the academy area, and the state enterprise, ETEC, took responsibility for the hotel area. The Ministry of Community Development, Culture, and Gender Affairs took responsibility for the auditorium. In 2010, in came the People's Partnership Government, and in 2013, that government amended the management and operational arrangements of Napa, which would now be under the complete management of the Ministry of Arts and Multiculturalism, with MOUs entered into with the Ministries of Tourism for the operations of the hotel and Ministry of Tertiary Skills for the operations of the academy. The management of the auditorium would be managed through a management committee through the Ministry of Arts and Multiculturalism appointed by cabinet. So Madam President, it is no surprise that such a convoluted and ineffective model of management of the Napa complex by overly bureaucratic organizations subject to strict public sector rules and guidelines resulted in poor maintenance poor management, and poor decision-making. This, compounded by the People's Partnership failure to properly maintain the facilities, the employees of Napa in 2014 were compelled to initiate an investigation by inve inspectors of OSHA to have that facility closed for assessment and testing and subsequent remedial works due to poor maintenance resulting in poor air quality and dangerous states that existed at the facility. These remedial works had to be completed by a PNM government in 2016 and Napa was reopened in that year. And since then, Napa has been maintained through a facilities management contract provided by UDICOT. But Madam President, the failure to properly institute an effective management model for the maintenance of the Napa facility did not only manifest itself in the closure of that facility by OSHA. The management model has also had an adverse impact on the operations of Napa in terms of bookings, the inability to collect and utilize, utilize res revenue generated by bookings as well as grant funding. But Madam President, the Napa Hotel has also been underutilized since it has been created and the attraction of an operator continues to be difficult on account of a myriad of issues, including the ownership of the hotel, the absence of a legal contracting entity on behalf of government for the hotel and the ability to provide a proper lease to the operator for the hotel. Having regard to the adverse impact of the inefficient and ineffective management model for Napa, Napa being basically run by a unit of the ministry, it is our view and the policy of this government that the solution to the issues 
would be to create a statutory body, corporate known as NAPA, in a model that mirrors the successful Queen's Hall and Naparima Bowl model, where all the property and assets known as NAPA, meaning the entire facility, be vested in and the operations and management be led by a responsible and accountable board of directors. The establishment of NAPA as a corporate legal entity means that NAPA will be presumed to exist into perpetuity, despite changes in the members of the body, creating an enduring legal business structure. NAPA will be able to conduct its own transactions, enter into contracts and retain its own accounts and other related matters in an expedient and efficient manner and in its own name. The establishment of the Board of NAPA will allow for faster and improved decision making, greater ease of doing business as it relates to the proper control and management of NAPA and its commercial activities. The Board will be comprised with persons with the requisite qualifications and experience in the performing arts, culture, law, engineering, management, finance, accounting, IT, HR, marketing, and other related fields, which will in itself manifest into a resilient corporate governance framework. The board will also be tasked with strategic planning and ensuring the commercial viability, competitiveness, and sustainability of NAPA, where such planning was indeed absent in the past. So, Madam President, with your leave, I will now give a detailed overview of the clauses of the NAPA Bill to the House. The bill itself comprises of five parts with 40 clauses. And I also wish to make it clear that government has not sought to reinvent the wheel with this governance structure. In fact, this bill represents tried and tested legislative constructs used in similar circumstances that have already met the approval of Parliament, including, but not limited to, the Queen's Hall model, the Naparima Bowl model, and other relevant statutory bodies. So part one of the act sets out the preliminary matters. Clause one of the bill, sorry, Madam President, part one of the bill sets out the preliminary matters. Clause one of the bill provides for the short title Clause 2 provides for the commencement of the act by proclamation of the president. And Clause 3 defines certain key terms used within the act. Part 2 constitutes the substantive portion and crux of the bill, which is aligned with its purpose. Clause 4 establishes NAPA as a body corporate. NAPA will therefore now, as stated, have a separate individual corporate and legal entity. Clause 5 of the bill provides for the functions of NAPA. NAPA as a culture and the art showpiece will have five main functions. It will promote the development of culture and the arts in Trinidad and Tobago while providing state-of-the-art facilities that boast conference amenities, a sound laboratory, musical fountains, a 1,500-seat capacity cloaked in masterful architecture which is reminiscent of our Shakunia flower. It will serve as a theater and dance hall, featuring a variety of cultural and artistic events and performances. Critically, Napa will also function as a commercial and business entity so that it can, like its international contemporaries, explore more progressive business models beyond traditional historic management and therefore enter into contracts that optimally generate funds towards enhanced self-sufficiency and self-sustainability. Clause 6 of the bill establishes the board of NAPA, which shall comprise of not less than five and no more than 11 members, inclusive of a chairman and a deputy chairman, who will exercise their powers and duties within the ambit of the act and our other laws. The members are to be appointed by the minister and there is no specification for these members to high, have a very high certain degree of, sorry, there is, a, there is specification for these members 
to have a certain degree of skill, qualification, experience, and expertise. As, pre as previously mentioned, these members will be selected from persons who have certain specified qualifications or experience listed in the clause. A member will be appointed for a term not exceeding three years and is eligible for reappointment. Clause 7 provides for the responsibilities and powers of the board in respect of the management and control of NAPA. Government saw it prudent to vest the board with the responsibility for regulating and coordinating NAPA's activities, entering beneficial strategic partnerships and alliances consistent with NAPA's functions optimizing NAPA's revenue earning capacity, as well as its overall contributions to the culture and arts sector. The board will also be at the helm of developing and implementing management policies consistent with its duties and powers under the Act. Further, the board will have a generalized power to do anything which it finds necessary, incidental, conducive, or convenient for it to do or in connection with the functions of NAPA to remove any unnecessary fetter to the effective execution of its fiduciary responsibilities. Clause 8 provides that the appointment of a board member shall be on such terms and conditions as determined by the minister. The bill makes provision for instances where a member resigns or should be terminated from office. Clause 9 provides that a member may resign at any time or the minister may opt to terminate the appointment of a member in certain circumstances, which include the commonplace formulation such as unsoundness of mind, bankruptcy, being unable or unfit or unwilling to perform one's functions, absenteeism, misbehavior in office or misconduct and imprisonment. Where either resignation or termination takes place, there is a provision for filling the vacancy. The board will thus not be left improperly or insufficiently constituted. There is a further provision for temporary and acting appointments to the board where a member needs to travel outside of Trinidad and Tobago or is absent by reason of illness or some other reason that prevents him or her from performing their duties. Clause 10 ensures transparency in matters involving the appointment, removal, or resignation of members of the board. It requires the minister to cause notices of the appointments, termination, and resignation to be published in the Gazette. Pursuant to Clause 11, a corporate secretary will be appointed by the board. A person to be appointed as corporate secretary must be suitably qualified to fill that position and the terms and conditions of the employment will be set by the board. The board also determines the responsibility which fall to the corporate secretary. Clause 12 prescribes the manner in which NAPA must execute legal instruments and manage use of the official seal of NAPA. The clause details the seal shall be kept in the custody of the corporate secretary and shall be used with the board's permission. The clause also stipulates what necessary signatures must accompany the affixture of the seal. So where the law does not require the seal to be used, it specifies that signatures that will suffice will legitimize the document. Clause 13 provides for the manner in which documents may officially be served upon NAPA. Clause 14 and 15 provide for the meetings and minutes of the board. The board will meet at least once monthly or at such other times when necessary. The chairman may also call special meetings. 50% of the board's membership will constitute a quorum for meetings of the board and decisions are taken by a majority vote of the members present. Where there is a tie, the person presiding will have a casting vote. Further to Clause 15, it will be the responsibility of the Corporate Secretary to take and keep proper minutes of all meetings. These minutes will be confirmed by a member present at the meeting, certified by the Chairman, and then forwarded to the Minister. 
Clause 16 of the bill provides that the Board of Napa may appoint committees comprising of its members or other members to assist in the performance of the functions of Napa. This clause also makes provision for the remuneration and allowances, if any, of such committee members who are not board members to be declared by a resolution of the board subject to the approval of the Minister of Finance, and such sums shall be properly payable out of the funds of Napa. Clause 17 pertains to the disclosure of interests in keeping with the principles of accountability, integrity, and full transparency. All members appointed by the board must, having regard to their fiduciary relationship with Napa, within three months of being appointed, declare any actual or contingent pecuniary interest they may have in any company, firm, or other entity carrying on any business with Napa. Thereafter, each member must make such disclosure within three months of each anniversary of his appointment. Although this is a timetabled disclosure, provision is also made for instances where an actual or contingent pecuniary interest arises in respect of a member at any point. Where this occurs, the member must disclose the nature and extent of the interest as soon as possible after the relevant facts come to his knowledge. Disclosures will be recorded in the minutes of the meetings and the member to whom the disclosure relates will not take part in the deliberations or decisions of the board in respect of that matter. The member will also be disregarded for the purpose of constituting a quorum of the board at that meeting. Madam President, board members are stewards of public trust. It will be an offense for a member to fail to comply with the disclosure provisions and such member can be liable on summary conviction to a fine of $150,000 and imprisonment for a term of two years. Further, a board member who knowingly makes a false declaration as to his interest commits an offense and is similarly liable on summary conviction to a $150,000 fine and imprisonment for two years. The concern about personal liability is very real, and this is particularly true within the rapidly changing climate which we now inhabit. The government, will, gov the government therefore saw it fit to afford such protection to those board members and NAPA staff who diligently execute their duties towards an environment friendly to bona fides, efforts, and hard work. Clause 18, therefore, seeks to shield members of the board and members of staff of NAPA from personal liability when carrying out their duties so that these persons can effectively keep NAPA true to its mission and perform their functions without fear of legal consequences where their acts or omissions are conscientious and done in good faith. Clause 19 pertains to directions as to policy this is a boilerplate clause found in numerous pieces of legislation. It directs that the board, when exercising and performing its functions, powers, and duties, must act according to any special or general directions from the minister. In part three of the bill, provision is made for the staff and advisors of NAPA. In clause 20 of the bill provides that the board shall, on such terms and conditions as are approved by the minister, appoint a general manager. Clause 21 of the bill provides that NAPA may, subject to the approval of the minister, employ such persons it considers necessary for the due and efficient performance of its functions and exercise of its powers. Clause 22 of the bill provides that the board of NAPA may enter into contracts for services with persons for the performance of specific tasks. Clause 23 and 24 of the bill provides for the secondment and transfer of public officers to NAPA. Clause 25 enables public officers to exercise within three months of the date of coming into force of the act an option to one, voluntarily re resign from the public service, two, to transfer to NAPA with the approval of the appropriate service commission, or three, to remain in the public service provided at an office commensurate with the office held by the officer in the public service is available. Clause 26 requires NAPA to establish a pension fund plan
for the officers and employees of Napa. Clause 27 was drafted to effectively mirror Clause 17 and requ requires the general manager and such other persons employed or engaged by Napa as the board may determine with the minister's approval to disclose whether or not they have any actual or contingent pecuniary interest in any company, firm, or other entity which is engaged by Napa. Such disclosure is akin to Clause 17, which must be made within three months of the appointment or engage engagement, and three months after each anniversary of such appointment or engagement. Again, so as to enhance public confidence, we as well and as well, corporate transparency and accountability. This, is, this provision is backed by a stout enforcement provision. It will be an offense for such person to, one, fail to comply with the disclosure provisions, two, knowingly take part in a deliberation decision in which he has an interest which is likely to impact said interest, three, knowingly make a false declaration as to his interests. Such a person can be liable on summary conviction to a fine of $150,000 and imprisonment for a term of two years. Part four of the bill constitute the financial provisions. Clause 29 specifies that the funds of Napa will consist of including appropriations from parliament, sums borrowed, grants, covenants, and donations. It will also in consist of fees and charges collected by Napa and sums received and owed to Napa since the bill also contemplates Napa as a commercial and business entity. Clause 30 determines how Napa may apply its funds. Napa may not use its funds in any other manner or for any other reason than what is strictly provided herein. Funds may be applied to necessary items like operating expenses, acquisition of property, remuneration for the board, salaries, fees, allowances, advances, gratuities, pensions, research and development projects, and training and certification of staff. Clause 31 to 34 deal with reporting requirements for transparency and accountability in relation to Napa's income and expenditure. Under Clause 31, Napa must prepare and submit estimates of income and expenditure every financial year in line with the budgetary cycle. Clause 32 prescribes and describes Napa's financial year that runs from the first day of October in any year to the 30th day of September the following year. To, write, to reiterate, Clause 33, consistent with the theme of transparency and accountability echoed throughout the bill, requires Napa to keep proper accounts and records of all sums it receives and spends and provide a report on its activities and financial statements every financial year, which is forwarded to the minister and laid in parliament. Clause 34 provides for the auditing of Napa's accounts on an annual basis by the Auditor General. Napa will also have a power to invest its monies and borrow sums to meet its obligations where necessary. Clauses 35 and 36, these both powers are to be exercised with the, minister, with the approval of the Minister of Finance. Part 5 provides for miscellaneous matters in the bill. Clause 37 mandates that the board must prepare strategic and operational plans to be submitted to the line minister. It is incumbent on me to remind this honorable house that Napa's strategic plan will be for periods of three years or less, but its first strategic plan will be a three to five year plan. The operational plans are to be done yearly. In clause 38, the board is empowered to make rules for the management, control, and use of Napa, subject to the approval of the minister. Clause 39 vests in Napa all property that exists currently in relation to the National Economy for the Performing Arts. And lastly, Clause 40 exempts Napa from the payment of certain types of taxes similar to other statutory bodies like 
the National Museum and Art Gallery, the Environmental Management Authority, Legal Aid and Advisory Authority, Trinidad and Tobago Civil Aviation Authority, etc. But in this case, with the exception of value added tax. Madam President, in conclusion, government holds firm to the position that this bill is necessary for a more agile and strategic management of Napa. This government continues to recognize that culture and the arts, the creative sectors, are integral to our national identity, belonging, and pur purpose, as well as emblematic of the strength and energy of our people. The creation of Napa as a body corporate will contribute sig significant benefit to our creative sectors and, by extension, the national community. As a body corporate, Napa will be able to efficiently discharge its duties, including risk alleviation, befitting upgrade maintenance, business management, the competitive exploitation of its assets, both real and personal, improved financial record keeping and reporting, and other related matters. The newly configured NAPA will serve as a critical agent of change that will revitalize our competitive edge and provide even greater contributions to our existing cultural scholarship. Improved dynamic decision-making from a well-constituted board possessed of the key competencies will not only safeguard Napa's interest, but will also develop and champion Napa's business governance system in a manner that will further elevate this important national performing space for generations to come. Madam President, I look forward to the contributions to come from the other side. And in that case, Madam President, I beg to move. Honorable Senators, the question is that a bill entitled An Act to Provide for the Establishment of the National Academy for the Performing Arts and for the Management and Control Thereof and for Related Matters be now read a second time. Those in favor say... No, that's it, yes. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, the bill that is before us is seeking to establish a framework for the governance, management, administration, and ultimate control of this particular entertainment cultural performing center, which is known as the National Academy for the Performing Arts. Madam President, one would have thought that in seeking to promote the cultural, or I should say the creative economy, and to develop the industries associated therein. The government, through the Minister of Tourism, would have in fact provided this Honorable Senate with a basic framework and at the same time to connect the dots. If this particular 
National Academy is to play a very critical role in the development of our economy. Madam President, the first area I would like to pay attention to is the need for the government to embark on large-scale consultation on the matter that is before us. From my interaction with the artistic community and the cultural drivers of this economy, there has been little, or I should say, absolutely no consultation. So the minister went back in times to tell us about what took place in 1988 under the NAR and 1994. But in terms of 2022, Madam President, there is no commitment, no information sharing as it relates to the players involved in this industry being directly involved in consultation, participation in this decision-making process. So I would like to firstly say, Madam President, how disappointed we are with no consultation involving the stakeholders in this industry. And in this regard, I would like the Honorable Minister to seriously consider this matter being sent to a joint select committee so that we can have the various stakeholders' involvement in this matter. This is a very serious matter. Madam President, I want to indicate that this NAPA literally was designed to fail. The minister talked about being competitive and having this edge and being an agent of change using NAPA. How can you bring about change? How can you be an agent of change? How can you be competitive? How can such an uh, industry or an institution generate revenues and become self-sustaining, Madam President? If, when you look at NAPA, there are only two major rooms in that building that can be monetized, Madam President, that can generate revenues. You're talking about the auditorium, and of course, Madam President, there's another room that is in that building that is not properly outfitted. So when we examine what we have before us, Madam President, we are seeing where the government is attempting to promote this institution as a mechanism that can mobilize the cultural and creative sectors in our economy. But I'm saying, Madam President, it is impossible to do so given the current structure of the legislation. The legislation that is before us, Madam President, when you look at its clauses, Madam President, when you look at clauses four, five, clauses six, Madam President, and seven, you will see, Madam President, where the minister looms large. The, lo the minister is large and in charge. But this is a multi-million dollar exercise. Napa started off at around 300 million. It went to 500 million. 
There was another crossover runs. This Napa, Madam President, with the greatest respect, was never fit and never built for purpose. This is an irrelevant structure for the cultural community in Trinidad and Tobago. For this structure to have meaning, Madam President, for the cultural interest groups in our country, this Napa has to be restructured and redesigned. Madam President, if you have ever visited cultural centers in the world, if you go to the Opera House in Sydney, call it the Sydney Opera House, if you go to the Royal Academy, which is dealing with dramatic arts, if you go to the United States of America, if you go to Canada, and you look, Madam President, at what you call centers for the performing arts, centers that will promote the art, the culture, the music, Madam President, what you will see, Madam President, in a building, there is need for no less than 20 rooms for cultural purposes, for cultural performances, so that you can have the monetization of the cultural product in our country. This Napa was not designed for Trinidad and Tobago. It was designed for some other country. And Madam President, you know what was even more, what is even more disgusting and alarming is that when the cultural community who have been fighting for over 50 years to establish a cultural center, a home for the arts in our country, and it was manifested, as the Honorable Minister said, when a decision was taken in 205, to begin construction in 206. Everybody was happy. They felt something was going to take place. But Madam President, when that was announced, designs were already determined. Everything was already concluded. Nobody got a chance to participate. There was no involvement by the cultural community in our country. Sometimes we wonder, Madam President, was this Napa designed in another country? The country that loaned us money, and I have no problem with that country because I love it. The question here, Madam President, is whether that country designed Napa without the involvement of Trinidad and Tobago cultural community. Senator Mark, I have to just caution you that we are dealing with a particular bill here. The bill is setting out certain um, issues, but you are not dealing with the issues that are in this bill. Okay? And I, I so know that you have to put things in perspective, but I also know that whatever you're putting in perspective, at some point in time, you have to come to the bill and be relevant to the matter at hand. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, all I'm saying is that we are dealing with something called the National Academy for the Performing Arts. And that is a structure that is there before our eyes, right here in Port of Spain. And that center, that academy, was designed to achieve certain objectives. And I'm saying, Madam President, it, when you examine that structure, it is not designed, it is not built for purpose, Madam President. But Madam President, let me go on, as you have advised. Madam President, let's look at what is being proposed in, the, in this bill, Madam President. Madam President, when you go to clause five of the bill, you have a number of functions being outlined for this body called NAPA. But if NAPA is a statutory authority that we are trying to establish, shouldn't NAPA, Madam President, be responsible for the maintenance of this institution called NAPA? Shouldn't the board of directors, that is, Madam President, 
be given that responsibility under Clause 5? I am not seeing a provision in Clause 5 as it relates to the functions of, NAP, of NAPA to de dealing with the maintenance of that structure that they would be responsible for. We heard from the minister that there is a facility maintenance arrangement with UDCOT. But what UDCOT has to do with NAPA? They had a function to perform, Madam President. They executed it via Shanghai Construction Group. That has now been completed. We are now trying to establish a statutory body. And I'm saying, Madam President, one of the functions of that statutory body should be the maintenance of that structure. And I'm saying to the minister, it is not included in the legislation. So that is, a, that is a, an amendment I'm flagging very early for the government's consideration. Madam President, may I also indicate, when you look at the composition of the board, we are either going with nine persons, or we are going with seven persons, or we are going with six persons. This thing about less than, no, no more than, no, no, how do I have it here, Madam President? Not less than five, Madam President, and no more than 11. Let, do Queen's all nine persons. You must be able to think this thing through properly, Madam President, and say that the board will be made up of nine members. Right? And Madam President, that is another area, as I said, I would like to address in an amendment that will come. Madam President, let's look at the composition of the board. Right? We are talking about nine persons or 11 persons, I should say. And we talk about the experience and the qualifications that they would have. Madam President, this is a center, an academy for the performing arts. The stakeholders should be involved in the governance of this structure. I would like, Madam President, through you, to indicate to the Honorable Minister who piloted this bill, we should look either at the model of the National Insurance Board, or we can look at the model that we, the matter that we were just debated and we adjourned, Madam President, the Livestock Board, where you will deal with interests. So when you are appointing a board, Madam President, you either go on a tripartite basis because of the nature of the industry that we are dealing with, or you focus on the interest groups in making up the board to govern this particular center or academy, Madam President. So, Madam President, what I'm saying in essence is this. There is something called Tuco. They deal with Calypsonians. That is part of the cultural and art form in our country and community. Madam President, there is the National Band Leaders Association. There is Pan Trinbago, Madam President. Madam President, there are many other bodies established in this country dealing with the theater, dealing with drama. Those are the individuals and interest groups that should be um, asked to appoint a member to this particular board. And the minister's only role would be to issue the instrument because the appointment is being made by Pan Trinbago. It is being made by the Band Leaders Association. It is being made by Tuco. Not for the minister to sit down in his um, lofty area or office or wherever he's located and then deciding, Madam President, 
that, you know, I want this one in law. I want this one in technology. I want this one in culture. And most likely it might be a PNM board. Jobs for the boys. But if we want this thing to work, Madam President, we have to be serious. And that is why, Madam President, I said very early, let us refer this to a joint select committee. Let the stakeholders come in and indicate how they want to see this National um, Academy for the Performing Arts work and not come from any politician to determine who are the members of the board. We are, we are putting the card before the house, Madam President. How is this go, going to work if the minister alone, does the minister have the sole repository of knowledge in this country? No. What role does the minister have in understanding how the cultural forms develop here? That is the people's business, Madam President. Culture is about identity. Culture is about the way of life. Culture is made up, Madam President, of people. And therefore, they must have a say in how the institution works, how it is governed. And that is why, Madam President, I am putting forward very, very firmly that there is need for interests to be represented on the board and the minister's only role is to appoint or to issue instruments of appointment, not to appoint these people, Madam President. So I want to make that very, very clear. And wherever you look, Madam President, the minister is looming. Large. The, the, the minister, Madam President, is even determining your terms and conditions of employment for the workers. How do the minister get involved in that? That should be a function for the personnel department. That should be a function for the CPO, if this is a statutory body. But the minister wants to determine not only the terms and conditions for the um, CEO, or the general manager, the, um, who the board is appointing, but the, the, the minister wants to determine, as I said, Madam President, the appointment, um, the terms and conditions of the workers. So we have, a, we have a real challenge, Madam President, with what is being proposed in this particular um, bill that is before us. And Madam President, if you want Napa to generate revenue, if you want Napa to generate income, if you want Napa to be financially self-sustaining, you have to put the power in the hands of the stakeholders. And Madam President, most importantly, Napa has to be redesigned. So that's, a, that's another very important matter, Madam President, I want to draw to your attention as it relates to this institution that we are trying to um, deal with here today. Madam President, you know, the minister made reference to diversification and competitiveness. And I want to agree. But Madam President, if you are going to use the cultural or what I call the creative sector, or the creative economy through the creative industries manifested in all of the different areas of the arts. How are you going, Madam President, to generate income? Madam President, you know, we had a good, the idea, Madam President, was extremely good. When you talk about Napa, Madam President, the minister indicated in his contribution, there was a, there's a hotel there. There's also um, an academy where, where they are training and education under UTT, Madam President. That is there as well. And then you have the auditorium. So th there was a connection so that persons who want to be trained, Madam President, who wants to be certified, who wants to get a degree in the performance or in the performing arts, in whatever area, Madam President, UTT 
would have been able to provide that training. And therefore, they would have, these people would be able to blossom and earn income, Madam President. But how it is structured right now, because of the fact that monies are not generated, income is not being earned, people are not being employed, there is frustration, Madam President, because this whole matter of the cultural industry has collapsed. And there's no vision or direction for the industry. I thought, Madam President, the minister would have sought to link the draft cultural, the draft national cultural policy that was tabled in this house in June of 2020 to this matter that we are dealing with so that we could see the connection between the draft national policy, na draft national cultural policy, and NAPA, and showing how NAPA can play a very critical role in the transformation, in the development, in the growth, in the transformation, in the generation of, Madam President, revenues, income towards our GDP, towards sustainability. But, Madam President, lo and behold, at last, we didn't see it. We didn't get that connection, Madam President. So if we really want to see and play a very important role, we want NAPA to play a very important role, Madam President, we have to be serious. You must talk with the cultural individuals and forces in our country. You cannot bring a bill here, Madam President, without consulting them. Senator Mark, you have been speaking now for quite some time and you have now circled back really to where you started. You've made this point already, so you need to either make some new points, but you can't stay on this point again. So Madam President, let me, um, Madam President, you know I always look for your guidance, and you know sometimes I ask you, when we are dealing with a bill, second reading, we deal with the merits and the principles. And I just want Se to ask Se you Mark, whether you. when I'm dealing with Se this. No, no, Senator Mark, hold on. Thank you so very much for your guidance. But may I just point out to you that you are now repeating yourself. Whether you are speaking generally about policy, you have dealt with this issue already. Let me um, continue to deal with what is before us today. Madam President, we are dealing with this institution or this center called the Performing Arts, um, NAPA, the Academy. Let's go to part three of the bill, Madam President, as I try to connect the dots, right? Again, we see in these clauses the government is seeking to establish what they call, Madam President, workers on contract, which we have a problem with. So if you go to clause 21 of the bill that is before us, it reads that NAPA may employ such persons as it considers necessary for the due and efficient performance of its functions and exercise of its powers on such terms and conditions as agreed upon between that particular body and persons subject to the approval of the minister. Again, Madam President, we are talking about the government and maybe, Madam President, the minister will need to clarify. Are these workers going to be employed on a permanent basis, Madam President? Who are going to be employing these people, Madam President? Is it the Statutory Authority Service Commission? Or is it, Madam President, going to be the general manager through the board of directors and approval being given by the minister? In those circumstances, Madam President, are we talking about workers being employed on contract? And this is an area, Madam President, we would have a concern with. Madam President, I also want 
you to pay attention to the ability of this particular um, academy, according to the bill that is before us, Madam President, to have the power under Clause 35. Madam President, I refer to Clause 35, and I refer to Clause 36, right? Where they have the power not only to invest in insecurities, but they have the power to borrow. But Madam President, this body will not be earning any income from what we are seeing and what have advanced unless there's a radical re reformation of its structure. So therefore, if it is not earning revenues, Madam President, it means to say it will have to be dependent, it will have to be dependent on the state, on the government, on the parliament through its budgets in order to get income to generate, to generate rather, its activities. So if that is the case, Madam President, if it is depending on the state, on the government of TNT for subventions in order to carry out its work, then its capacity to borrow becomes questionable. And even if it borrows, Madam President, the question is, how is it going to repay? How is it going to repay? And in this regard, I want to serve notice, Madam President, and I'm taking advice and guidance from my honorable friend, the Minister of Tourism. He did indicate in his presentation that they have extracted a lot of provisions from existing legislation, Naparima Bowl, Queen's Hall, in order to arrive at what we have here today. So I want to serve notice on the Honorable Minister that I will be taken out from the Queen's Hall Act and the Naparima Bowl Act, Bowl Act, certain provisions that will give the parliament a certain degree of oversight as it relates to borrowings. Where when you borrow, Madam President, you have to inform the parliament. There must be a statement that you bring to this parliament indicating, Madam President, the terms and conditions of that loan, who you have borrowed from, and when it is going to be repaid. Those are matters, Madam President, in accordance with the Queen's Hall Act is inherent in this piece of legislation. So I'm going to follow my colleague's advice and extract from the Queen's Hall Act these provisions so that the Parliament, Madam President, will not only be given that power to borrow and not only given that power to invest in securities, but we in the Parliament will have an oversight role in that capacity to borrow and that capacity to invest. And there must be accountabilities in this matter, Madam President. So, so when we are talking about the National Performing Arts or the Academy for the Performing Arts, Madam President, we have to see it in the context of its ability to, as I said, um, invest and borrow. I also believe, Madam President, that in Clause 37, where we are talking about strategic plans and operational plans, it is very important, Madam President, that those plans, as well as the operational plans, yes, be established to guide the board and to guide the management as it relates to the future projections of this particular body or institution. Madam President, if you go to clause 29, 30, 31, 32, and 33, which deals with financial provisions, Madam President. Let's go to the financial provisions and where these funds are going to come from. 
And as I told you, Madam President, that the funds of NAPA in, in Clause 30, Madam President, if you follow the bill that we have before us, you will see in Clause 30 that any financial defrain, the defrain of financials under NAPA will come, Madam President, from the funds, will come from operating expenses, capital expenditure, which will be subject, Madam President, to the approval of the minister. NAPA will have the power through this arrangement in the frame expenditure, Madam President, under Clause 30, to acquire property, Madam President, in the course of its function. Also, Madam President, the remuneration of the chairman and other members will fall under that provision of the legislation. Salaries, fees, allowances, advances, loans, etc. All of this. Research and development projects, Madam President. So, we are seeing where NAPA will have access and it is telling you where their expenditure and how they are going to defray their expenditure to deal with their day-to-day -day operations, Madam President. Madam President, I would like to also say here that it is important that when we talk about revenue generation at the level of this body, we not only focus on an allocation coming from the government through its annual budgets, but we also need, Madam President, to pay attention. I would like the minister, and I would like the minister to share with us his thoughts on local content. On local content, Madam President. Madam President, if we are to generate the kind of revenue to make NAPA self-sustaining, there is need for legislation, and I'd like the Honorable Minister to address this matter of local content. So that, Madam President, will encourage local production. So whether it is the broadcasting services involved here, radio, television, the film industry, we must promote local content. And Madam President, in promoting local content, it will go a long way in bringing about financial self-sufficiency for this particular academy. Senator Mark, you have five more minutes. Yes, thank you. Madam President, another area I would like the Honorable Minister to address when he is responding to this debate is whether the government has given thought to the equivalent of a National Arts Council. Madam President, you need seed, seed capital, S-double-E-D, seed capital for the artists. They need it, they need a predictable, Madam President, amount that they would be getting every year for them to carry out their work and their activities. So right now, Madam President, we are in a pandemic, and what the cultural artists have been able to get is a $2,500, a $5,000. That is, that is not going to keep, do anything to them. They want to be self-sufficient. They want to generate their revenues. But Madam President, to do so, there is need for us, as we are talking about the performing arts, and we are talking about culture, and we are talking about the cultural industries, we need to focus on not only local content, but we need to pay attention to what is called, Madam President, a National Arts Council that would be transparent in its distribution of resources to the various stakeholders involved in the creative economy and the cultural industries. And they must, that must be predictable, Madam President. 
So that is an area, Madam President, we'd like the government to pay attention to. Madam President, I know I only have a few moments left. In, an, in these few moments, I can't escape re raising with you, or through you, the, the need for the government to pay attention to spaces, open spaces. Madam President, Trinidad and Tobago is a nation of festivals. Madam President, and if you're talking about promoting this Napa, Madam President, if you are to have real festival e events in our country, where are we going to have these things, Madam President? Where? At one time, the government of Patrick Manning and may soul rest in peace, was talking about the building of a carnival center in our country. Because we still do not have in our country today, Madam President, we don't have buildings with spaces for all our festivals so people can go and display, whether it's Ramlila, whether it's Diwali, whether it's Huse, whether it is carnival in terms of panorama, whether it is steel band music, Madam President, you need open spaces for these things. But we don't have these things available to us. So, Madam President, when we talk about Napa, we are talking about generation of growth. We are talking about diversification of this economy. We are talking about the generation of revenues. We are talking about putting our cultural artists on a sound financial footing so they do not have to live from hand to mouth. They must be able to earn their own keeps, Madam President. Madam President, we would like the government, in closing, to have this matter referred to a Joint Select Committee in closing. We would like stakeholders to come before this Joint Select Committee to discuss what they think about Napa. And Madam President, I would like the government to pay attention to the present design of that building called Napa to see how we could redesign it to make it more fit for purpose to help our artists earn their keeps and to establish, Madam President, in closing, the link between John D. Visual Arts and the artisans to look at the animation industry with UTT, link up all of these things into one overall arrangement so there'll be one governance structure with outlets in different parts of the country. Madam President, I thank you very much for the opportunity for allowing me to say a few words. Thank you. Before I call on the next speaker, I just want to remind members that any proposed amendments must be submitted in writing before and be ready for circulation as we begin the committee proceedings. So I just want to remind members of that, please. Senator Vera. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I, I, I wonder if you or perhaps anyone else picked up on the delicious irony, perhaps even incongruity, that on the same day, government extols the ability of an advisory committee within the Ministry of Agriculture as justification for the doing away of a board. Literally minutes later, government is asking us to establish a board to counteract the inadequacies and failings of Napa being run by a unit within the ministry. I should say that um, 
by way of declaration of interest. Uh, I have for many years, not now, but in the past, acted as legal advisor to the Queen's Hall and for a number of stakeholders in the performing arts and cultural sectors. And as someone who has lobbied for our performers and artists <clears throat> to have affordable access to established spaces to perform and promote their art, at first blush, this appears to be welcome legislation. I've long promoted the concept of making our republic the artistic and cultural capital of the Caribbean. As the minister has rightly pointed out, we certainly have the talent, whether it be music, dance, drama, literary work, carnival, mass, we punch well above our weight. We are the birthplace of pan, calypso, soca, chutney. We have produced Nobel laureates in literature. We are in the Guinness Book of Records for limbo. And yet, so many of our performers and artists are struggling financially and seem unable to make a decent living. Even when there is a demand for their work, uh, many of our talented performers and artists are undeservedly poor. And one of the reasons for that is that the art economy is disproportionately distributed. Another reason is the need for our performers and artists to get guidance and training on how to use entrepreneurship to deliver sustainable, equitable economic growth. And a third reason relates to the need for clusters, networks, and districts of interconnected and interdependent performers, artists, funders, professional advisors, government agencies, and the private sector working in symbiosis. The need for a creative ecosystem developing, promoting, and sustaining our creative and cultural sector as an engine of growth and development. To the extent that this legislation offers promotion and development of culture and the arts, the provision of state-of-the-art facilities for performers and artists, the showcasing of performances, cultural and artistic events, and the provision of technical training in culture and the arts for upcoming practitioners, as set out in the functions stipulated at clause five, I think. I'm supportive of this bill. Having said that, I have some concerns and there are certain aspects I would like to get some clarification on. It's not clear, for example, if this body corporate, this proposed institution for the advancement of culture and the arts is portable. That is to say, can it be located anywhere in North Trinidad? Or is it fixed at the Lord Kitchener Auditorium? It's not clear if Clause 7D, which speaks about implementing the policies of government in relation to the management of performing spaces, as may be directed by the minister from time to time, is in relation solely to NAPA, that is to say, the body corporate and the complexes under NAPA's responsibility, or if it has wider application. For example, whether it will extend to an impact on the Queen's Hall, uh, the Little Carib Theater, National Stadium, and so on. It's not clear if Clause 39 vesting in NAPA all right, title, and custody to property of the government in relation to the National Academy of the Performing Arts is just in relation to the Lord Kitchener Auditorium, or if we are talking about the entire complex, and it includes the other areas, such as the academy, right, uh, run by UTT in the hotel. So as the minister is signaling, uh, and I'm happy to see he's signaling that the bill encompasses all the complexes, plant and machinery between Frederick Street, Kate Street, Queen's Park, Savannah, 
and chance really. Yes, because that is necessary. As the minister has confirmed, we, we have had a complex which has been plagued with issues arising from multiple organizations using different parts of the premises um, with, as he put it, convoluted and ineffective responsibility for maintenance and repair. The Lord Kitchen Auditorium falling under the Ministry of Arts and Culture, even at one time being looked after by the management of the Queen's Hall. The academy area providing educational courses in culture and the arts falling under the University of Trinidad and Tobago. And the hotel, for a long time, being something of a no man's land, with responsibility shifting from Ministry of Trade to ETEC to the Ministry of Community Development, Arts and Culture. And then there were also issues such as the facility not being purpose built, as Senator Marcus talked, with monetizable rooms for participants and stakeholders in the sector. Maintenance and repair falling under Udicott and mismatches between the electrical system which was installed by the Chinese contractor and our own Tientech electrical system. I'll deal with the purpose built point later. Hopefully, hopefully the electrical and the other technical issues have been resolved and if this legislation can rectify the overlaps and gaps occasioned by various ministries and operators occupying and using different parts of the complex, if this bill makes one board fully responsible for everything, management, maintenance, security, and operation of all the complexes at the premises, I am very supportive of that. That is a good thing. But clarification is needed. Also, if the hotel and the teaching institution run by UTT are to remain operational, are to remain at that premises, will they fall under the management of the Napa board? Or will they be autonomous enterprises operating there as tenants of Napa with their own budgetary requirements and funding? So that, that, that's not clear, but I think it's something I'd like to get guidance on. And if UTT and the hotel operator are tenants, then what provisions will be made for the attendant arrangements arising out of such relationships? The minister rightfully points out that board members are stewards of public trust. Certainly they will be responsible for a billion dollar complex, but they will also be wielding considerable influence on the development of arts and culture in our capital city. So I suspect a number of people are going to be troubled by the fact that it is the minister who will be running the show, as it is the minister who appoints the board. Now, when it comes to concert halls and performance institutions of excellence, Carnegie Hall, whatever, they're different models at one end of the continuum, government allocates the funding and then government will forensic how the money is spent with little or no interference on the management and the day-to-day -day operations. But at the other end of the spectrum, there is complete ministerial control. Now, the minister said that the board will be at the helm of implementing policies under the act. I am hoping that the board will operate as directors are supposed to function under the Companies Act, where they are required to exercise independent judgment and to exercise reasonable skill, care, and diligence in the best interest of the company. Significantly, under the Companies Act, directors cannot passively allow others to manage the company. They cannot abrogate personal responsibility or allow their independent judgment to be compromised. The minister spoke of a resilient corporate governance framework. But these board appointments fall outside the ambit of the Companies Act. So I'm hoping that the minister can give assurances regarding board autonomy and political independence. 
Will the board members be allowed to run the show, pun intended, using discretionary judgment where it may be most needed? Will the board members be immune from the arbitrary exercise of authority? Because this is necessary if we are looking for the faster and improved decision making that the minister spoke about. A related concern is that the board members must be professionals of excellence and not mere political appointees, especially having regard to the fact that, as I said, they'll be responsible for a billion dollar complex and they will be at the center of our creative industries. If agile and strategic management is to be accomplished, members must have the requisite expertise, necessary experience, but also gravitas and standing within the arts and cultural world. Ideally, hopefully, the minister will consult broadly and equitably with the community, with sector representatives when making board appointments. Because in this area, when you're dealing with artists and performers and communities of artists and performers, stakeholder buy-in, community involvement, community support is critical, right? The, 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 the ministry and the board have to work hard towards building trust and gaining legitimacy. And that can only be achieved with a certain amount of dialogue and consultation and involvement. May I also suggest that at least one board member should have knowledge and experience in the collective management of intellectual property rights. And I'm thinking in particular, copyright and neighboring rights. Because when you're talking about shows and broadcasting of events, this is a very much rights sensitive area and um, critical. Uh, ironically, in the same breath, I, as I express concerns about political patronage and interference, I must confess feelings of apprehension when I look at clauses 22, 23, and 24. Senator Mark has raised the issue of employment as a matter falling for special consideration. My concern is from a slightly different angle. I'm, I'm concerned about the quicksand bureaucracy that obtains in the service commissions. Uh, I can't help but think about uh, recent complaints. I was hearing about um, the city engineers reputed unwillingness and failure to perform with apparent immunity. So striking the right balance between maintaining political neutrality and improving efficiency remains a fundamental challenge, not just for this organization, but across the board. Turning now to the purpose-built issue, my understanding is that many performers have complained that the rehearsal rooms don't have proper dance floors and facilities. Stakeholders have also complained about the lack of available low budget and low cost rooms, even though a quarter of the facility is underutilized, unused, and unusable. So the board members are going to have their work cut out for them in customizing the place, and presumably there will be members on the board or on staff who understand event programming and the use of space. I expect that work will need to be done in customizing the facility and perhaps even allowing for stakeholders and sector representatives to have, more, to have offices or to be able to maintain, even if it's just a shelf presence, but a presence within the complex. We want it to be part of our cultural ecosystem. It must be the center. Further, there should be multiple theater spaces and rooms that can be used all year round to the benefit of practitioners and the public, not just the big auditorium. It really would be a shame if this magnificent facility were to become a white elephant, as seems to be the case with some of our national stadia. This complex and the potential it has, it has to offer is too important to fail. I am satisfied that the bill adequately covers what is necessary for the establishment of an entity 
responsible for the management and operation of a performing arts facility. My concerns are really directed to how it will operate and how it will transition within its incorporation, with its incorporation. Um, in fact, Senator Mark had mentioned Queen's Hall. The irony is Queen's Hall would very much like aspects of this bill to be brought as amendments to their own bill. So I'm hoping that that is something that the minister could also look at because um, the amendments to the Queen's Hall bill are, are sorely needed and have been, been calling for, for some years now. But whether Napa ultimately makes or breaks will depend on, in the language of Darren A. Smoglu and James Robinson, who wrote the book, Why Nations Fail, on whether we are creating an inclusive or an extractive institution with this legislation. On the one hand, an inclusive institution, if professionally run, will generate sustained economic growth. But on the other hand, if it turns out to be an extractive institution, well then it's likely going to generate over-centralization, infighting, and will ultimately undermine the sector. Either way, this legislation matters because it's going to affect the lives and well-being of our performers and artists. And as the Honorable Minister confirms, the hope here is that it will contribute significant benefit to our creative sectors. I thank you. Senator Burgess. Madam President, I thank you for this opportunity to present and to share a comment on the, this bill, Senate Bill Number 1 of 2022, an act to provide for the establishment of the National Academy for the Performing Arts. Madam President, I've looked at the bill, and I wish to comment on one section, Section 38, which provides that the board may, by resolution and with the approval of the minister, make rules for the management, control, and use of NAPA or any other matter or thing which the board may consider necessary or conducive to the performance of its functions. Pursuant to Section 5B of the Act, it states to provide for the, the functions of, the, of NAPA are to provide state-of-the-art facilities for culture and the arts in Trinidad and Tobago, including theaters, concert halls, and other places of assembly for the presentation of music, opera, drama, dance, visual, or auditory arts and conference facilities. And C, to provide any service and carry on any business or activity relating to the provision of facilities and other amenities for the purposes of promoting culture and the arts and facilitating persons engaged in the performing arts. 
Madam President, as we are aware, children form a large part of the persons who are engaged in performing arts. Thus, in making rules for the management, control, and use of NAPA under Section 38, there ought to be an emphasis on child protection and on the child protection policy for this, this institution. And why do I say that the Act ought to require the Board to institute a child protection policy for NAPA? Madam, when we look at the issue of child abuse and child maltreatment, we would recognize that it is a horrendous problem around the world today, which has devastating lifelong consequences on the child, the family, and the society. And Madam, we are re referring here to all kinds of child abuse, the different forms, which I'm sure we are all aware of, physical, sexual, emotional neglect. Just to give a brief snapshot of the kinds of statistics of this ill that we have around the world today, according to the World Health Organization, a report dated 8 of June 2020 stated that globally it is estimated that up to 1 billion children aged 2 to 17 years have experienced some form of child abuse in the last year. We also have several ports, reports of child abuse in several organizations. And then in, in UNICEF in 2014 to 2017 reported that sexual abuse affected over 120 million children. In the USA, the official government data over seven, states that over 700,000 children are victims of violence. In the Caribbean, the incidence of child abuse is also widespread across the Caribbean. A UNICEF report, which was done based on a regional assessment on violence against children conducted in 16 Caribbean countries in 2005 to 2006, which included Trinidad and Tobago, stated that the problem of child abuse and neglect is rampant in the region. It takes place across all ethnic, socioeconomic, and religious groups, and significant numbers of children are affected. Additionally, it was found that child abuse takes place in multiple settings, including homes, schools, communities, on the streets, in families, work environments, and in institutions. And in all of these settings, child sexual abuse is a major problem. Even looking at the incidents in Trinidad and Tobago, Madam, or Mr. President, in 2019, the annual report of the Children Authority, it was reported that in fiscal year 2018 to 2019, the Children's Authority of Trinidad and Tobago received 4,333 reports of child maltreatment with an average of 361 reports per month. 54.4% of the victims were female, 43.3% were, were male. In Trinidad, the majority of the victims were 10 to 30, in the 10 to 13 age group, and in Tobago, the majority were in the 16 to 17 age group. The highest reported categories of abuse was child sexual abuse. Reports of child sexual abuse also have consistently been the highest reported types of child maltreatment to the Children's Authority over the years that it has been instituted. In January 2020, the Child Protection Unit of the, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service reported that almost 600 people were brought before the courts in 2019 for crimes against children reporting a 137% increase in criminal acts against children. The CPU of the TTPS indicated that the figure includes a 45% increase in violent offenses like cruelty to children. Then also, Mr. Vice President, a review of the local news reveals that for the entire COVID-19 period in 2020 and 2021, to date several persons have been charged for abuse against children. 
And then it is also significant to look at this issue because of the impact of child maltreatment on children. Because sometimes as adults, we tend to think that it's only a child and he or she will get over it. But the research reveals that violence against children has lifelong impacts on the health and well-being of children, families, communities, and nations. In an article published by the World Health Organization on the 8th of June 2020, it was stated that exposure to violence at an early age can impair brain development and damage the other parts of the nervous system, as well as the endocrine, circulatory, musculoskeletal, reproductive, respiratory, and immune systems with lifelong consequences. As a consequence, the cognitive development is negatively affected, resulting in educational and vocational underachievement. The World Health Organization also reported that child victims are substantially more likely to demonstrate negative coping and high-risk behaviors, such as smoking, drug and alcohol abuse, and sexual behavior, which may result in unintended pregnancies, induced abortions, gynecological problems, and sexually transmitted infections. Child violence also results in a higher rate of anxiety, depression, other mental health problems, and suicide among children. It also contributes to a wide range of non-communicable diseases, such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and other health conditions, largely due to the negative coping and health risk behaviors associated with child maltreatment. It has also been found that child victims are more likely to drop out of school, have difficulty finding and keeping a job, thus increasing the risk for later victimization and perpetration of gender-based violence, thus affecting future generations. The reality is that the incident just does not go away from the mind of a child. Child maltreatment is traumatic. Its effect stays for a lifetime and affects the way that children develop socially, mentally, and emotionally. And so, Mr. Vice President, it is against this backdrop that I wish to emphasize the fact that the board of Napa, in implementing section 38 of the act, should establish rules for dealing with children for these institutions. According to the National Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children in the UK, if you are organizing or providing performing arts activities that involve children, you must prioritize their well-being. And this includes making the environment as safe as possible for children and young people, ensuring that children are properly supervised by the right people, and following the relevant legislation and guidelines for child performance. So why do I say that it is important for, to have a child protection policy for NAPA? A child protection policy is necessary because children, staff, volunteers, paid workers, and all stakeholders of an organization are at risk without guidelines for behavior. A child protection policy for NAPA would therefore provide guidelines for any staff selection, background checks, appropriate behavior, oversight of children who are involved in the performing arts, and the reporting of inappropriate behavior. In the circumstances, Mr. Vice President, it is therefore critical that the board of NAPA, as they develop the rules for the operation of the facilities under Section 38 of the Act, should include the establishment of a child protection policy, which will create a safe environment in the facility to ensure that children are safe while they are using the facilities. Furthermore, Mr. Vice President, in the light of the high incidence of child abuse and the devastating impact 
that it has on children, and that's because of the critical importance of this issue. I wish to suggest that consideration should be given to the inclusion of a subsection under Section 38 that would require the board to make specific rules for child protection, even to the point of instituting a child protection policy for the facility to ensure that our child performers are safe. And furthermore, there should also be a subsection on the liability of any, for any instances of child abuse or child sexual abuse. In the circumstances, Mr. Vice President, with respect to Act 2 of 2022, which will be discussed later on, my thoughts are the same for that act. I thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Honorable Senators, permit me to congratulate Senator Burgess on her major contribution in this chamber. Senator Batalmi. Thank you, Mr. Vi Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Colleagues and citizens joining us on Parlor View, welcome. Mr. Vice President, before I get into my maiden contribution, you know, sorry, not my maiden contribution. <laughs> um, before I get into my contribution, I would just like to congratulate Senator Burgess on her maiden contribution. And I just want to say, you know, when, I'm, when I am preparing my contributions, I always think about the average citizen and uh, who finds themselves in debates concerning what happens here in this house and the other place. And I believe as a member of parliament, as all members of parliament, we have a responsibility to ensure that anything we say here, um, it's the facts and it's the truth. And we always well equipped our citizens to join any discussion that they may be having with a colleague, friend, family member, or stranger concerning legislations and bills passed in this house. With that being said, Mr. Vice President, I, I, I just want to um, address some comments made by Senator Mark when he said that this bill shows no commitment to our cultural industry. But everything in this bill is geared towards only the benefit of our industry, of our creative industry, our creative entrepreneurs, and our country. He even spoke about us passing, passing it on to a joint select committee, but in my opinion, that is just him trying to waste time. How will it become sustainable? And he even made mention to, it, to there being only two major rooms, but, Mr. Vice President, just allow me to share. Our Napa Center has a theater area also called the Lord Kitchener Theater Auditorium that can hold 1,200 in seating capacity, a VIP lounge that can hold 10 persons. Um, we also have, we, yes, yeah, right. So there's also 10 small classrooms, three large classrooms, two multifunction halls, which are conference rooms to host functions with light and sound systems. We even have two multifunction, multifunction rooms with lighting and sound system on level three. There's also, the Napa, there's also the Napa Hotel with 53 room accommodations, two restaurants, and an atrium area. Uh, Senator, Senator Mark even went on to speak about why the minister must be the person um, or why the minister should be so involved. But this is the same senator. Um, if anything forbids, anything goes wrong, will be the first senator to call or to host a um, press conference to speak about what went wrong and basically blame our minister for, for whatever uh, issues that occur. 
um, he asked about who will be hiring. Clause 21 in the bill clearly states that Napa will be responsible for whatever um, hiring will occur, obviously, with the approval of the minister. With that being said, my, uh, Mr. Vice President, just allow me to jump into my contribution, and I will be I will be attempting to explain the purpose of this bill through the three Ws. What is the purpose? To establish a corporate body for the National Academy for Performing Arts. In other words, make it a company, a business, a profit-bearing entity whose main goal is to support the government as it pertains to promoting culture and the arts of Trinidad and Tobago, in addition to providing training to upcoming practitioners. But why is this bill necessary? To reduce the, the bureaucracy by accelerating decision-making and policy implementation. It has been observed that the current operation of, of the management committees of NAPA is inefficient based on the significant delays in giving effect to the committee's decisions, since the decisions must be considered and approved by the line ministry prior to implementation, making these committees more closely resemble that of an advisory committee. The committees possess responsibility for oversight, policy advice, and managerial ex expertise for the, ex for the respective entities. However, the powers of the management committees are limited compared, for example, to, the body, to that of a body corporate. The, and this has led to certain managerial inefficiencies. Some of, the, some of these inefficiencies come in the form or came in the form of expenditure exceeding our revenues by approximately $5 million. In addition to this, the, in addition to this, COVID and unstable oil prices have, I have highlighted the need to diversify our economy away from petrol focused into other profitable and promising activities like that of the creative sector. This enables Trinidad and Tobago to further support efforts to invest and expand in what we called the orange economy. But what exactly is the orange economy? According to UNESCO, the orange economy, also known as the creative economy, is the bringing together of sectors of the economy whose main purpose is a production or reproduction, promotion, dissemination, and or the marketing of goods, services, and activities that have cultural, artistic, or, sorry. What I just described, Mr. Vice President, will be the main functions of NAPA, the company. But to ensure NAPA is successful, it must be converted into a money-making entity capable of making its own timely decisions that will allow for investments into the development of our culture and the arts. But who will be the persons responsible? Mr. Vice President, as we said, we will be looking at the Queen's Hall model. As such, it is important to have a well-qualified board overseen by the minister to ensure that Napa can move into a profitable direction, allowing the development and reinvestment into the orange economy. By employing a qualified board and, adopt, and, and adopting the Queen's Hall model, we stand to benefit in the following ways. We will be provided with strategic direction, ensuring your company develops and implements business plans, strategies, and policies to operate with profitability and sustainability in mind. It will help us to set, monitor, and it will help us to set and monitor our performance targets as, NAPA, as far as NAPA is concerned. It will also help us in compliance, ensuring that our company or NAPA complies with its legal and accounting requirements. Risk, ensuring our company identifies and mitigates risk and looks for new opportunities. So Mr. Vice President, this bill can come in a better time and its impact, can, and its impact cannot be discounted. As we move into an orange future, it is one of the ways that we can assure that creative entrepreneurs blossom here at home, regionally and internationally. Arts and culture related spaces such as Napa provide direct economic benefits to Trinidad and Tobago. It will create job, jobs, attract investments, generate tax revenues, and stimulate our economy through tourism and cultural purchases. With this shift in operations of Napa, Trinidad and Tobago can move into expanding our cultural industry 
year round. With those few words, I thank you, Mr. Vice President. Senator Sobers. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice President, and I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to make a minor intervention here this afternoon on this bill, an act to provide for the establishment for the National Academy for the Performing Arts and for the management and control thereof and for related matters. Mr. Vice President, if you would allow me just a few moments as I um, begin my contribution to just uh, actually touch on, on a, a few issues raised by the Honorable Minister of Tourism when he piloted the bill. Um, and it ties squarely into some of the things that Senator Mark was saying um, and a couple of the things Senator Vera and even um, myself. I, um, I could remember vividly when the Napa was being constructed 2007, I think I would have been about 17. Yes, I am that young. And um, I remember the immense amount of discussion, the traffic that the construction caused and the flurry of conversation to be had by many persons within the length and breadth of the country. Um, because this particular building was touted as something that would promote arts and culture and whatnot to the world, put Trinidad and Tobago on the international stage. Um, and when the Napa was completed, it was a, um, a fantastic structure. I don't think anybody would have any difficulties in saying so. But then you started to hear about the issues related to Napa in terms of the, prom the actual thing that it was supposedly designed to do, which was to promote our culture on an international stage. Give our arts, our arts, our artists um, and individuals an opportunity to promote themselves internationally. Um, and I could recall the level of discontent shared by many citizens when they spoke about Napa, the issues they had, the gymnastics that they had to perform to try to be able to actually perform in Napa. Not so long ago, please, Mr. Vice President, um, there sat a senator in this chamber in 2020, senator by the name of Jason Williams. And I remember as a young man, I used to like to watch his programs on Synergy TV. Um, I can't remember the name of the program now. I think it's Synergy Nights or something like that. And I remember S Senator Williams or Jason Williams speaking um, about how upset he was when he wanted to film a video, a soccer video in Napa that he exclaimed that he had so many things he was required to do. And he did them. And whosoever was the management of Napa at that point in time, and this would have been in 2009 or 2010, they told him no, he couldn't utilize the facility, that the facility was not constructed for those types of activities. The same activities that it was being promoted to actually promote. And he wrote them several letters asking if he could film the video or the shoot itself on the steps of Napa. And he wrote back to him and he told him, no, he couldn't do that either. So what he resorted to doing was actually filming his shoot on the streets in front of Napa so that he was able to get the backdrop he procured the required permissions from the 
commissioner of police at the point in time, and he had the video. And it was a very nice video, if, I, if memory serves me correctly. But I say all that to, to, to say that this conversation that Napa was built for specific purpose, it actually escapes us. This conversation now about Napa and the implementation of this management structure to finally start to promote Trinbegonian culture, especially in a time or in an economic situation where we are not getting foreign exchange, is in fact a welcome position. But the real question that I think should be put to the floor and really squarely put to the minister and to the government and the administration is that we would really need a commitment, not only in words, that this is actually going to be done. Since the construction of the Napa, and in the other bill with, with respect to SAPA, 2007, I think SAPA would have been completed by the People's Partnership Administration. How many international concerts have been held at Napa that would earn us some Forex? I don't know of any. I mean, when you look at the global stage, Someone was um, speaking to me the other day that um, Adele is having a concert now in Vegas. I think she's resident there. To get a ticket to go to see Adele now is upwards of 4,000 US dollars. And persons all around the world are still paying that money to go see her. And we have local acts in Trinidad that are spoken about with international acclaim that should be allowed to perform in these venues, and they are not. When is the last time, whenever Marshall Montano was performing, did he have a concert in Napa? Or Kess have a concert in Napa? Or any one of those local soca artists with international acclaim have concerts in Napa or Sapa? And I think that is the point that many of us are trying to make. I sat listening to the Honorable Minister. Good presentation, the Minister is a good man. Listening to him, and today, since 2007, was the first time that I heard Napa had a restaurant. I never ate there, and I suspect no one in this chamber may have eaten there either. It's the first time that I heard Napa had an atrium. I heard about the hotel. I don't know anyone personally who would have stayed there. And then in terms of the facility being utilized by UTT for, I think it would have been fashion. I knew someone who, who was enrolled in that fashion course. So yeah, maybe it was used at some point in time. But it tethers then the conversation as to subsequent to this management committee being set up, what are the real plans to promote this place, to maybe change the place so that it can in fact facilitate the things that we need it to do, to be fair and to be frank, to make the money that we need at this point in time. So I would really be listening to the Honorable Minister in his winding up to hear from him what plans possibly, at least in terms of, of governmental plans, they would want um, coming out of that, that NAPA. Now, in terms of the bill itself, the bill um, setting up a, a company, a body corporate, is not something abstract to any of us, at least those who would be involved in corporate or commercial law, or persons generally involved in running a business or an organization. Um, I looked at section six, which dealt also with the composition and management of the board members. And I saw that the act or the bill went to great lengths to specify certain persons with certain qualifications but then it also left it a bit open to allow for any other person with a related or relevant field of expertise to be allowed to be a member of the board. 
And I thought it a bit strange that I didn't see anyone from the, the media, a person with media expertise being included here. I think it would be a valuable asset and it should be something that should be considered. I also looked at section 15, section 15.3 in particular, at page eight of the bill. Now, what section 15 speaks to is, would be the minutes. And uh, minutes are something extremely important, especially in terms of it being the contemporaneous or most contemporaneous note to be taken um, to reflect the will of the body actually having that particular meeting. And the way in which this particular section reads, it says that the minutes in proper form of each meeting shall be kept by the corporate secretary. All decisions, resolutions, and rules made by the board with respect to the operations of, of NAPA shall be recorded in the minutes. Minutes prepared in accordance with subsection one shall at a subsequent meeting of the board be confirmed by any member who was present and be, be certified by the chairman or deputy chairman. And then four, it says that the minutes should be forwarded to the minister within one week of being confirmed. Now, how minutes actually take place, at least in a corporate structure, is that subsequent to the minutes being compiled at the meeting, before the minutes are actually confirmed, the minutes are supposed to be circulated to all members present at that meeting. And if any member may have had an issue with the record of the minutes, the member would be given an opportunity to amend the minutes. The amended version would then be recirculated and then they are confirmed via email. And so at the actual board meeting, the minutes would just simply be circulated and actually confirmed. This doesn't, in terms of the construct of section 15, it doesn't allow for something like that to take place. And in terms of civil matters or matters that may well engage the court's attention, when the court needs to decide or to determine what actually took place within the meeting, the way in which this particular construct is for this section, it could in fact allow for a situation where that which was actually said was not actually recorded because it's one person treating with the recording and not getting the input from all the members of the board as, as contemporaneous as they should have been. Moving on, I looked at uh, section 16.1, which dealt with ap appointment of persons to specific committees. And section 16.1 allows for those persons to be appointed accordingly with the necessary approval from the minister, who would then set the terms and conditions, which would be the re remuneration and allowances. And if it is in fact that most of these appointments have to be done with some type of approval or involvement by the minister. I recognize that at the actual beginning of the bill, as it pertains to the corporate sec secretary at page six, section five, I think it is, the corporate sec secretary um, is actually appointed by the board and the terms and conditions of that corporate secretary is also appointed by the board and there's no involvement of the minister with respect to that actual appointment. So in, in an effort I suspect to be tidy, the corporate secretary would be someone in an extremely important position based upon the construct of the, of the act, of the, of the bill. There should be some level of involvement there as well to at least interaction with the minister for that particular appointment. Then I looked at section 17.1, which dealt with um, the declarations that persons would have to make subsequent to them being appointed. Now, the disclosure of interest as, as, it, as it is stated here in the bill. Now, section 17.1 states that every member shall within three months of his appointment and each anniversary of his appointment submit to the minister um, a statement declaring whether he has any actual or contingent pecuniary interest in any person or entity carrying on any business with, with NAPA. Now, 
Here, as opposed to what is contained in 27.1, where the exact same construct treats with the general manager, the construct for the general manager in 27.1 talks about a, a prescribed form or an approved form that the GM would have to di disclose these interests to the board and to the minister. Well, number one, there's no prescribed form attached to the bill. So we don't know what that prescribed form would look like. So I suspect that's something that would need to be fixed. And two, I would hope then that in this section 17.1, it would be the same prescribed form that these members would have to fill out as well. And then that prescribed form would also need to be included and referred to here as well. So, in closing, um, I would just want to hope that whatever decision is, is adopted, however this board is actually constituted, and in terms of, of whatever policy they're in fact going to try to execute, it would be in the best interest of the persons associated with arts and culture within our country. And let's actually try to promote our arts and culture so that the next time anybody goes on Ticketmaster and they're trying to get a ticket to go to Marshall Monday or whatever, Cast Tuesday and those sort of activities, it'll be extremely difficult for them to buy the ticket because it'll already be sold out in Napa or Sapa. I thank you. Senator Richards. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice President, for allowing me to make a contribution to this act to provide for the establishment of the National Academy for the Performing Arts and for the management and control thereof and for related matters. Before I start, allow me to join my colleague, Senator Bethelmy, in congratulating Senator Burgess on her maiden contribution in this honorable house. Uh, it's interesting that we're debating this bill, which really is, a, is as act, sorry, which is really an act that is seated in the promotion of the creative arts in Trinidad and Tobago. We're basically six weeks away from what would have been our normal carnival. We've had some kind of indication that we'd have some kind of carnival. And I'd like to start by uh, following from Senator Sobers' final comments when he says uh, this, the establishment of this board, and I guess the board without running afoul of the standing order of anticipating a uh, debate upcoming shortly for Napa and then Sapa will be seated in terms of the furtherance of the policy to accomplish the mandates of the board which are stated in, in uh, part two, clause five. And so I ask the question, where's the policy? What is the policy? What is the overriding national policy on creative arts, the creative sector, arts and culture? I know that the Honorable Minister Mitchell's predecessor had a draft policy, if I'm not mistaken, I could be corrected, I'd stand corrected happily, but I don't know that there has been determined and approved a national policy on, creative, on the creative sector, on arts and culture, and how that policy fits into the national framework for diversification using the creative sector. Senator, would, the, Senator, would you give way? Yes, please, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, the, the national uh, cultural policy was laid in, in Parliament in the last session. Yeah. Appreciate the correction. Thank you. Right. 
So then let me move to the next point. Are we closer to optimizing our creative sector? And I'm not talking only about carnival, because when we talk about the creative sector, we like to talk about carnival alone. But the creative sector is wide, diverse, and extremely sustainable if executed properly. Two, do our, art, do our artists, creatives, have a clear sense of how they fit into the national economy in a sustainable matter, manner through the policy as identified by the minister a short while ago, and I thank him for that. And will the establishment of these boards, or this board in this particular act, accomplish the mandate as set out in clause five? And also what may be missing from this? And I, I'll go through quickly because it's important in, in terms of the context of parts of my contribution. What the functions of NAPA are. And I really, and I, I'm trying to, not to run afoul of the standing order of anticipating a debate that's coming up. But I'm confused as to why NAPA and SAPA have to be separated into two acts uh, because Port of Spain is 20 minutes drive from San Fernando on a clear Sunday. And this is a small country. And then there's a Queen's Hall Act also, all under the context of uh, the creative sector and maximize, maximizing these assets because they're assets. They're all assets of the state in Trinidad and Tobago, all under the creative sector in the promulgation of what has been articulated by the Honorable Minister Mitchell and his colleagues of efficiency and of achieving the mandates of promoting the development of culture and arts in Trinidad and Tobago, providing for state-of-the-art facilities for culture and the arts in Trinidad and Tobago, including theaters, concert halls, other places of assembly, for the presentation of music, opera, dance, visual, auditory arts, I would add digital arts to that, and archiving, I know we have a National Archive Center, and conference facilities to provide any service that see to carry on any business or activity relating to the provision of facilities and other amenities for the purpose of promoting culture and the arts and facilitating persons engaged in the performing arts. D, to showcase cultural artistic events, uh, and I'm editing here. E, to provide technical training in culture, which is being done in collaboration with UTT by my understanding already. And F, to engage in any other business or activity that is incidental to which is capable of being conveniently, conveniently carried out in the performance of its functions under the paragraphs. In, in, in this regard, I would add to that humbly the, the issue of heritage and conservation. Because I think as a board, that should be specified in the act because of the importance of heritage and conservation in, this, in, this, in the context of culture in Trinidad and Tobago and also in terms of monetizing culture in a diverse way. And I'll give you an example. When Trinidad and Tobago was on the verge, through you, Mr. Vice President, on the verge of attaining its 50th anniversary of independence, I was tasked with producing some featurettes for then CNMG, now TTT. So part of one of the, the, the chronicling the journey of Trinidad and Tobago from independence to 50 years, was looking at the various high points in our country's history. And so I was forced to call the Smithsonian Institute in Washington to try to get digitized archival, archival footage of then Prime Minister Dr. Eric Williams, the late, and, and others raising the flag to declare independence. And the, the cost of that for a three-minute clip for one airing astounded me. It was in excess of 11,000 US dollars back then. That is the potential of our cultural history in Trinidad and Tobago. That is the potential of us digitizing and maximizing it. So in the context of the function of NAPA, and I know we have a National Archive Center, in a more direct way, I think, the, the issue of our heritage in Trinidad and Tobago and documenting that, one, for our own history and, our, and for uh, educating generations to come, but also for monetizing that because it's valuable around the world, whether we realize it or not, I think should be a stated part of the function of NAPA uh, and the board of NAPA in, in this act. Mr. Vice President, the issue of setting up of these multiple boards in such a small country 
to me, is counterintuitive. And I'm really hoping the minister who piloted the act can go into more details of the rationale for how this is going to make it more efficient in Trinidad and Tobago. Given the levels of bureaucracy we already see and the issues we have with governance and accountability in the present context of Trinidad and Tobago, to me, more boards just means more drama because we don't seem to have gotten the board construct in Trinidad and Tobago right because very often, not always, the boards are populated with persons who are ill-fitted, who are sometimes political appointees and who are sometimes anathema to achieving the mandate of the board uh, at the expense of, of political expediency sometimes. And I'm not saying that is definitely going to be the case here, but it has been a strong part of our history and we have to recognize that. What is going to make the difference in this case? We're going to have a Napa board, a Sapa board, a Queen's Hall board, all trying to maximize these assets in a really small place. So I'm hoping that I can get some more clarity of the, on that from the minister when he does the, the wrap up. We also need to look at how we develop and organize the creative sector in a, in a sustainable manner in Trinidad and Tobago. Senator Sobers, I think Senator Leider, Leider uh, my colleague Senator Vera, all touched on it. A large part of maximizing or ensuring that the creative sector in any economy is focusing on the issue of copyright and in intellectual property in the context of our cultural artifacts. And I, I haven't seen, and I know that this may be a, an operational manner, matter, but I'm not sure that the provisions in this act really clearly spell out that if we are to be serious about maximizing the assets as is intentioned in this bill. Because very often we don't look at culture and art and history and heritage as structurally as we look at oil and gas in Trinidad and Tobago, because sometimes they're a little more abstract. And because we do it so naturally, we are such a creative people, we take it for granted the value of these cultural artifacts in Trinidad and Tobago. So I think that also needs to be focused on in more detail in Trinidad and Tobago. And, and, and it's interesting that we're discussing maximizing these assets through the establishment of a board six weeks before Carnival would have been when I've been bombarded with calls, messages, WhatsApp messages from persons in the creative sector who knew this, this act was coming to parliament and beseech me to ask, okay, you're going to be debating a Napa bill and a Sapa bill, act, act sorry, in the context of maximizing these assets and maximizing the creative sector and maximizing the work of artists and artisans and wire benders and, and digital documenters and stuff. But there's no clear plan for even Carnival 2022. In their minds, no clear plan for what or how they will participate in that in a, in, in a context of a creative sector. And, and I've been bombarded by those messages and questions. As, as we debate this kind of bill. So again, to them, while this may be part of the process that the minister and slash the government has for putting the framework in place, the immediate needs of our artists, artisans, etc., are in limbo after they've already missed 2021 in terms of their revenue and income earning. So it seems kind of a little scattered to me in terms of understanding that it all has to work together in interest not only of the entities and the assets, but also the biggest, the most important aspect of this, the human resource capital, the artists and the creatives themselves. And when they look at this kind of act, they don't see their role clearly spelt out. They don't see the plan moving forward. They don't see how they fit in to it in a seamless, integrated manner. And there's a very public situation now where, and I won't call any names for obvious reasons, where there's a, a, 
an investigation ongoing into an event by a private promoter who, in many cases, ended up there because private entrepreneurs, cultural entrepreneurs, have to feel their way, feel their way through a very unsure, a very nebulous future for creators in Trinidad and Tobago. Because again, there is no clear plan. And six weeks out of what is usually their biggest money earning, earning time, they are still wondering, how do I do this? How do I do this and participate safely? How do I ply my trade in the absence of clear guidelines and an integrated process to put on events in the space of culture and carnival in Trinidad and Tobago while we're discussing this, this act. It seems ironic to me in many, many ways. So I hope that my plea on behalf of them is heard that a clear, well-articulated guideline on how we as the mecca of carnival, the center of the greatest show on earth, are going to execute a year after we had none last year, in a year where other Caribbean territories and other carnivals have moved forward. Mr. Vice President, through you, uh, Senator Sobers also identified one of the, the areas I think is lacking here, where for, from someone who's been involved in media for over 30 years, there is an inextricable critical link between monetizing cultural and creative artifacts and expressions and the media, because that is really how you garner the biggest income. Broadcast rights, digitize, digitize, digitization of the content, streaming rights, intellectual property rights, copyright funds. And I am not sure it may be operational, but as a board, this needs to be clearly articulated in this act as how we are going to monetize this in a sustainable way moving forward. Because you can make, you can have an artist, a creative can have one performance. They can make one cultural artifact, but it can be sold millions of times, or the video or the stream can make billions of dollars after one performance. And I'm not sure our mindsets are there yet. And we can see that because of the absence of the understanding of the importance of the digital connection to cultural arts in Trinidad and Tobago, inclusive of entities like Napa and Sapa and how they fit into it. And yes, uh, uh, Section 5, Part B, mentions, and I quote again, to provide state-of-the-art facilities for culture and the arts in Trinidad to big, including theaters, concerts, and other places. But it doesn't specifically reference digital broadcast and streaming facilities. In the age of COVID and when we are seeing the US pivot to through versus the versus series, artists performing with each other and against each other to, to get millions of streams, etc. Where is the game plan for us moving forward in this new scenario? It is not business as usual. It probably won't be business as usual for the next two to three years. And even when the pandemic is starting to subside, the world would have shifted to a new paradigm and we don't want to get left behind. So I think that aspect of it needs to be clearly articulated in the act and as a mandate for the board to pursue. It is not an option. If they do not pursue the digital aspect of this or the broadcast aspect of this, we'll be missing what is perhaps the biggest opportunity. Mr. Vice President, through you also, one of the gaps I see in this is that the board is not specifically mandated to identify, probably in collaboration with the Honorable Ministry of Trade Industry, and develop and facilitate regional, international, and cross-cultural linkages for opportunities for our cultural artifacts or artists in other jurisdictions. Because that is part of what selling our culture is. Very often our artists, uh, and, and this, is, this could be part of what Napa uh, does. This is, could be part of what the Napa board does to facilitate that sort of linkage development so that our artists, our artisans, our cultural products 
can be exported more seamlessly in a more integrated, sustainable fashion. I think that is also missing from reference in the Act, and it also speaks to, and I think it was a wonderful idea for this government to integrate the ministries of tourism, arts, and the culture into one because they're really intricately linked. And I think understanding that part of the mandate of this, working with the, in, inside of the, 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 the overall Ministry of Tourism, Arts, and the Culture, is for boards like this to identify those sorts of linkages to export our cultural artifacts and our cultural expressions as we would do oil and gas, ammonia, um, chubby, and everything else. Because that is part of how we can also promote brand Trinidad and Tobago internationally. And I think that also is kind of missing from expression in the act. It would have also been quite helpful through you, Mr. Vice President, for the minister to even give us a, a simple framework of a strategic plan, you know, in terms of, well, we're doing this, we, we're presenting, piloting, and piloting this act today, or these acts today, in furtherance of these objectives in the medium term so that everyone gets a clearer sense. The minister did a very good job of giving us the history of Napa, which to me coincided, uh, uh, coincided with the, the, the uh, arrival of Her Majesty and then President Barack Obama as one of the venues for hosting, uh, is it the Summit of the, Summit of the Americas, I think it was? Chugam, sorry, Chuck Chugam. So I know Parts of the issue that we faced in the construction of Napa was because we had to rush it. Let's not forget that, to meet that deadline. And then we had to change retrofit parts for actual performance, uh, so it cost us a little more in the long run. But I mean, it is what it is now, and I think the potential is immense. So in conclusion, Mr. Vice President, I hope the minister can uh, address some of the issues I've raised uh, to develop a more comprehensive, sustainable framework and idea of how these state assets are going to fit into the medium and long-term optimization of our cultural expressions and artifacts in Trinidad Tobago, and also act as a really strong foundation for heritage. And I think the government has done an excellent job in terms of the parts of the heritage landscape with the, the restoration of the buildings around the Queen's Park Savannah and looking at other heritage sites in Trinidad and Tobago and, and refurbishing them. But it all has to be uh, integrated in a seamless, clear manner so that we all know what our role is, especially as we, we're all creatives in one way or the other. I haven't even mentioned the, 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 uh, the, uh, I, the, the IT part of this and how that integrates with with culture around the world, the development of apps so that people can get our own uh, products and services in one portal, uh, which hasn't happened as effectively as we would have liked because that is also part of a development of a single portal for uh, promotion and access to our culture in Trinidad Tobago. Quite frankly, I think it's there already. I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. We have TTT, which has a strong digital presence. It is state-owned media we can really use TTT in a more effective manner to push all our culture, culture and artifacts to one place in a different kind of engagement. There's no need to reinvent the wheel and have three, four portals so you don't know what brand or portal Trinidad Tobago is as a whole. And with those few words, Mr. Vice President, I thank you. Senator Thompson A.
Thank you, Mr. Vice President. It would be easy to underestimate the importance of this bill that we are debating here today. This bill for an act to provide for the establishment of the National Academy for the Performing Arts and for the management and control thereof and for related matters, as well as its sister legislation, which we'll debate later, is crucial in all present circumstances. Indeed, it may yet provide the fertile ground for a bountiful harvest in this economic GOVA season. But sadly, we may not recognize that for as the late brother resistance sang in Put On Your Dancing Shoes, and as our actions or lack thereof too often evidence, we do not stand firm for our culture. Yet, we lament the passing of our cultural icons who have left us within recent times. Treasures like Singing Sandra, Torrance Mohammed, Tony Voisin, Anan Yankaran, Bobby Mohammed, Devon Melville, Joy Caesar, Peter Joseph, Winsford Evans, Brigo, Mighty Bummer, Kenny J, and Clive Zander Alexander. Now I speak on this bill from a twofold perspective as parliamentarian and long standing performer in the arts. From birth, my destiny was sealed. My mother used to tell the story, as I related it, some might say ad nauseum, that when I was born and the midwife announced that I was a girl, my father had exclaimed, another girl again? And my mother said, child, you will have to be a performer for your daddy to love you. She lived to regret those words, because from a toddler, I was an entertainer, and she would sigh, I can't find the switch to turn you off. Be careful what you speak in the children's lives. I'm excited by the prospect of the establishment under Clause 4 of this bill of the Body Corporate, the National Academy for the Performing Arts, hereafter NAPA. The functions of NAPA, as enumerated in Clause 5, are to A, to promote the development of culture and the arts in Trinidad and Tobago, to provide state-of-the-art facilities for culture and the arts in Trinidad and Tobago, including theaters, concert halls, and other places of assembly, for the presentation of music, opera, drama, dance, visual or auditory arts, and conference facilities. C, to provide any service and carry on any business or activity relating to the provision of facilities and other amenities for the purpose of promoting culture and the arts and facilitating persons engaged in the performing arts to showcase cultural and artistic events and performances and expand the range of available artistic opportunities, to provide technical training in culture and the arts for upcoming practitioners in the field, which builds the cadre and proficiency of national professional artists and perform performers through timely and consistent access to NAPA, and finally, to engage in any other business or activity that is incidental to or which is capable of being conveniently carried on in the performance of its functions under the preceding paragraphs. Now let's start with the first, to promote the development of culture and arts in Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Vice President, Trinidad and Tobago is rich in culture and the arts. Someone once said that we have more talented persons per square mile than any other country, and I endorse that view. God has been good to us in that respect, but I cannot say that we as a society or that any government past or present has truly recognized the worth of those who have been blessed with talents in the culture and the arts, or that we have paid as much attention to investing in the development of our culture and the arts as we should. The culture and the arts of Trinidad and Tobago constitute a sleeping giant that has yet to be awakened. We do not see the manifold benefits of the culture and the arts and their great potential contribution as some other countries do. It is particularly important now, more than ever, since our revenue from oil and gas has declined, that we nudge awake this sleeping giant from its slumber. Now, what contribution can arts and culture make to our economy? In a publication entitled The Conversation, Jen Snowball, professor of economics at Rhodes University stated, there is growing international interest in the potential of the cultural and creative industries to drive sustainable development and create inclusive job opportunities. 
She revealed at Cultural Times, the first global map of the cultural and creative industries, assessed the contribution of cultural and creative industries to economic growth and estimated that they generate US $250 billion in revenue a year, creating 29.5 million jobs worldwide. And that, so that this report had to demonstrate the value of arts and culture and provide a good rationale for government support of the arts and culture, especially in developing countries where there are so many other demands on the public purse. In South Africa, a cultural and creative industry mapping study in 2014 showed that the industry had created between 162,000, um, 8,9,192 410 jobs, about 1.80 to 1.28 of employment in the country, and they contribute 2.9 to GDP. Other spin-offs from these industries are their potentially important contribution to social cohesion and nation building through the promotion of intercultural dialogue, understanding, and collaboration. Now, in 1993, I attended the first World Congress on Family Law and Children's Rights at the International Convention Center in Sydney. Somebody mentioned that convention center earlier. It was a defining moment in my life. As I gaze at the spectacular building that is their premier convention, exhibition, and entertainment center, I wondered if my country could ever have something so grand. The taxi drivers who took me daily to the venue on inquiring about my accent were thrilled that I was from the same country as the much revered Brian Lara and treated me as a celebrity. They didn't just speak his name, but breathed it with a degree of reverence and awe. Brian Lara. I basked in the sunshine reflected glory. I was low to admit I had not at that time even met the man. Today, when I take Caribbean visitors to Napa, I feel a sense of pride that we had not done too badly. The architecture looks spectacular. However, it does not meet some of the key planning issues for the provision of cultural facilities as set out in a Hong Kong study titled Cultural Facilities, a study of their requirements and the formulation of new planning standards and guidelines. And some of these were like accessibility, most important, the locational requirement of cultural facility, must be directly influence the level of participation by artists, audiences, and community location near homes to encourage community participation and networking, proximity to transport system, workplaces and homes, as well as accessibility by the elderly and the disabled. Agglomeration of cultural activities and facilities that may be achieved through horizontal or vertical integration of facilities. Horizontal now means different types of facilities with a similar role. So if you're having dance, you have a number of um, session that can go on the same time. Horizontal, you have different type of facilities with a similar role. Sorry, vertical being different type of facilities for one or a few related art forms at one location. For example, you have a dance center with venues for performance, rehearsal, training, and research, all under one roof. Now, Napa is situated near the Savannah, which is not a residential area. There is no transport hub nearby. So for shows like Best Village Competition, which have been held there, people have to be bussed in, or if they do not have a private vehicle, depend on others for transport. So the, the hotel on site, I think, they hardly could be afforded by locals. I know one person who ever stayed there, and, I, and she was there for, um, because she had come in from um, the UK, and because of COVID, she had to be quarantined there. And she said it was an excellent location. Now, COVID-19 and attendant laws and regulations created a situation that was challenging for Napa. Notwithstanding, there was no enabling legislation. Napa was being used along with other venues as Queen's Hall and Napa Rima Bowl to promote the development of culture and the arts in Trinidad, which was its first function. But with the coming of COVID, Napa doors were shut. Not a roar came from the premier house of the sleeping giant. But it did have to be like that. In 2019-2020, the annual performance review of the ICC, which is in Sydney, reported that like nations, industries, organizations, and individuals, ICC Sydney felt the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic quickly and severely. Travel and gathering restrictions led to the cancellation of all events, and with huge sadness, we had to temporarily scale back our team. But what happened? At the end of the day, that ICC in Sydney in 2019-20 generated 510 million in direct expenditure for the state from delegates attending events at that venue during COVID. 
73% came from international and interstate visitors. Events further led to 981,445 overnight stays in Sydney and created 2,806 local jobs. Now, how did they achieve that? They had the same COVID we did, but they created an event-safe operating framework, a set of operating principles that enabled the venue to safely run events in an environment transformed by the pandemic. And this has implications for our plans for the possibility of some form of Carnival 2022. Because when you look at the review, it reveals that the operating principles involve a comprehensive set of protocols which span 16 key areas of event management, including the customer journey, environmental hygiene, food service, technology and equipment, and employee and public awareness and covers meetings, conferences, exhibitions, live events, and internal operation. It integrated best practice from ASM Global Venue Shield, a program of the most advanced hygienic safeguards informed by public health authorities, medical and industry experts, which is being employed in ASM Global 325 worldwide facilities. So we ought to study that and see what happened. And the review also informed that the framework operated within the safety protocols of Safe Work, Australia's codes of practice, and drew on ICC Sydney's work with national and international industry bodies to develop industry-wide protocols in response to COVID-19. Now, these have evolved into a venue-specific framework which responds to the needs of clients for a level of detail that allow them to confidently start planning future events. So it would seem, therefore, that to advance to a state of normalcy, the potential clientele must be made aware of the details of the protocols and have been put in place for their safety, such that they feel confident they will be absolutely safe at the venue. Now, the second function is pretty straightforward, to provide the state-of-art facilities for culture and the arts in Trinidad and Tobago, including theaters, concert halls, and other places of assembly for the presentation of music, opera, drama, dance, visual auditory arts, and conference facilities. Now, as I recall, and as we've heard here today, there were some initial challenges at the venue. But I did also learn that Udicott came to the rescue and sorted out quite a bit of the problems. Apparently, the, the people who were constructing couldn't take it for granted and didn't take it for granted, everyone designing and constructing a performance venue. That they didn't understand that performers need not only to change to an out of their costume, but they also they needed shower stalls and none were there. That when steel bands now have to appear on stage, there should be a waiting area so they can move in and out swiftly so those things were not in place. So at every stage performance does not turn into a long, weary panorama night. Now, the minister did say that there was a, a the myriad of other problems with the facility that need to be corrected. Now, the third function to provide any service and carry on any business or activity relating to the provision of facilities and other amenities for the purpose of promoting culture and arts and facilitating persons engaged in the performing arts. Now, over the years, finding a facility for performance has been a great challenge. Directors and producers had to wait months of time to find a venue to stage a performance. Venues for rehearsal were a headache. I remember Derek Walker Theatre Workshop like the bold weaver looking for a home. We met various at Holy Name Prep in Cascade, Bishop Ansty High School in Port of Spain, Little Carib Theatre in Woodbrook. On Sunday last, I listened to the interview on the radio with Short Pants and his daughter, and he mentioned Legion Hall, and it brought back memories of my performing on that stage and attending meetings and rehearsals there and at the town hall with Freddie Kissoon's Strolling Players Theatre Company. So we have had um, performances. I have been there at Central Bank, Naprima Bowl, Queen's Hall, Morsica Teachers College, E. Wooding Law School Auditorium, Daga Hall, Shorelands Hotel, Uwe Car Park, and Normandy Hotel, Tennis Courts, penthouse and so on. I've traversed them all. So we have a number of public spaces, but they are not all created equal and they're certainly not purpose built for the functions. The fourth function is to showcase cultural and artistic events and performances and expand the range of available artistic opportunities. The provision of the state of the art facility for culture will certainly go a long way in fulfilling the board's function to showcase cultural and artistic events and the expansion of the range of available artistic opportunities will require some more thought and planning and will only be properly executed if the board is properly constituted with members of the required competence, experience, exposure, and integrity. How will the board decide whose cultural and artistic event and performance will be showcased? And in what direction the range of available artistic opportunities should be expanded? 
What recourse is there for an artist who is frustrated in showcasing a cultural or artistic event or performance or denied an artistic opportunity? So for the children beyond Hazel Ward, you're 12 and under. Auntie Kay on the road, um, on the radio for the young ones. And you've heard one of um, the presenters here, one of the senators, talk also about children and the, the importance of um, keeping them safe. Now for the older heads, you had two shows, Scouting for Talent and Mastana Bahan. I, I know I wasn't a child, but when I was taking part in Scouting for Talent, as being sexually harassed, victimized, forced to discard my performance for which I was professionally trained, and a piece which was written by a noted poet, had to, I had to write my own work, train myself, and provide a new costume, all in short order. As I had told the host, he couldn't touch me with a 10-foot pole. So children at risk, we remember Marshall Montano on the night too young to soccer, what he had to put up with at the Marsh Grand Night. So, as he is concerned, we have to provide technical training in culture and the art for upcoming practitioners in the field to build a cadre and proficiency of national professional artists. So I urge that persons who are chosen to conduct the training must be persons of integrity. The persons who are chosen as board members will be key to the success of this objective. When I took part in Best Village Trophy Competition, my village, Mount Hope, Mount Lambert, was not successful. But after the show, Ms. Wong San and Dupini informed me that um, they wanted me to give a command performance on the night of the finals at Queen's Hall. No transportation was provided, no refreshments. I don't think I even got a, um, a verbal thank you. So artists are always exploited, and it would be interesting to see how it is that um, the Napa structure is going to in fact, um, protect artists for what can happen. You have, of course, some of the impresarios, some of the organizers who are very fair, like Aubrey Adams. He was always fair to us. When he brought in the artists, he, whatever you were doing on his show, he certainly would pay you. Margaret Walker would make sure that we were paid. And um, you had Freddie Kisuni he had a structure in place as well. But many artists are exploited in a number of ways. Many times you go to foreign countries, I'm able to go on a tour and learn of the heritage of the city or town. A few years ago, I was invited by one of my former Guyanese law Senate, students. Senator, Senator Thompson, I, if I may, um, you have been speaking for a little while now, and I've, you know, leeway has been given to you. But I want to remind you what we are dealing with here and the, the the remit of the, the matter that is before us, okay? Um, at this point, I am dealing, Madam, with, um, Madam President, with function F, which is the functions of the authority. So what I've been saying here is how we are going to execute the various functions. So I talk about A to E, the performance of the functions. So this is where I am. So one of the things we did was to visit a site where we were taken on a simulated journey through time to learn of the early beginnings of the history of the Cayman Islands. Very dramatic, and I would like to see something like that created here for tourists and locals alike. Because we showed what we were capable of with Carrie Festa, there is no reason we cannot do it here. Clause 6 provides for the minister to appoint a board comprising not less than five or no more than 11 members and specifies they must have qualification or experience in the performing arts, culture, and so on. Um, management, finance. So from the, among the members, the minister appoints the chairman and deputy chairman of the board. Given the potential for arts and culture, I wish to see someone with experience in business appointed to the board. I also wish to see someone who's interested in conservatism, con, you know, conserving, because we are a throwaway culture. Every year, our designers create spectacular costumes. Should we not preserve the best costumes for tourists and school children to come and view? Also, with our literary works, we do not value those. And um, I know that I have been trying myself to, to um, save some of my works. Because recently, I was asked to produce um, something I had written some years ago for Lawyers Under Lights, and I could not locate it. And the International Society of Family Law, they, they, look, they put a um, publication together. And I'm trying to get, again, some of the works so that it could go into the publication. It's been difficult to recover some of the works during the time. Clause 8 to 19 of the bill, which detail appointments to the board, termination of board members, and operations of the board are fairly standard and raise no red flags that I could see. 
part three of the bill deals with um, appointments of staff and advisors of NAPA and duties and responsibilities of staff. With regard to, to, regard to clause 20, I wonder that the reason the minister must approve the terms and conditions of the general manager who is appointed by the board. Since the board must comprise members qualified or experienced in finance, accounting, and human resources, could the board not be trusted to make a determination on remuneration of their employee? Clause 26 is one for which I commend the drafters of this bill. I do not know if it is an innovation, but it's certainly one which I welcome. I've chastised the government on more than one occasion with good reason for being unfair to retirees and persons whose contract have expired. So I particularly welcome this subclause 4, which states that where a person who is transferred in accordance with section 24 dies, retires, or his post is in Napa is abolished, or he's retrenched by Napa prior to establishing or joining the pension plan, and if at the date his service is terminated by any of the above mentioned methods, he was in receipt of a salary higher than the pay, pensionable emoluments, or salary referred to in subsection 3, the superannuation benefits to his estate or to him, as the case may be, shall be based on the higher salary. So I hope that this principle will be adopted across the board in all government departments. Too often there are persons who are acting in higher positions than their substantive posts for years, and when they retire, their benefits are calculated on their substantive posts. It's unconscionable and inhumane and certainly not the hallmark of a caring government and should be stopped. Clause 27, which deals with disclosure of interest, requires that the general manager and such persons employed or engaged by NAPA, as the board may, with the approval of the minister determined, shall within three months after his appointment or engagement and each anniversary of his appointment or engagement, submit to the board a declaration in the approved form stating whether or not he has actual or contingency pecuniary interest in any personal entity which is engaged by NAPA. A person referred to in subsection 1 was an actual or contingent pecuniary interest referred to in that subsection shall not in the course of the performance of his duties nor only take part in any deliberation or decision which is likely to affect that interest. And Madam President, I ask the question that I asked when we were debating the Special Economic Zones Bill, which had a similar provision, namely, what is meant by not taking part in the deliberations? That the member sits in the room and takes in the discussion, surely not. That cannot be acceptable. And I repeat my recommendation that what must happen is what is provided for in other laws and the practice that obtains here, namely that a member with a conflict of interest shall excuse himself from meeting while the matter is under discussion. Clause 30 details how the funds of NAPA are to be utilized. And I was very happy to see in subclause F that included among the items for which funds of NAPA will be applied are research and development projects, training and certification, and other related matters. Research is very important to inform best practice, and, and that leads on to excellence. Training is, again, very, very important for the development of the expertise. I would wish to commend the government for bringing this along overdue bill, which deals with a subject close to my heart. When I present a paper at World Conferences, I view myself as an academic. After presenting a paper at the World Conference in Cape Town, one of my compatriots, senior counsel Gilbert Peterson, told me I was not a presenter but a performer. So I've always compartmentalized my rules. But um, it seems that when we, we, we you look on at, at us, you see that sometimes we are performing in a way that we are also ambassadors for our country. The December, we have a wealth of talent that needs to be harnessed, provide income, and um, enhance the economy. In the December 2021 issue of Creative New Zealand, a publication from New Zealand in an article titled The Evidence to Support Your Advocacy, it states that the arts contribute to New Zealand's economic, cultural, and social well-being. We know and have proof that the arts, and it is listed in this production, what the importance of the arts. It contributes to the economy, creates jobs, generates household income, supports tourism, and contributes to the economic development of towns, cities, and regions. And UK Creative Industries, and it was worth 84.1 billion pounds per year was generated for the economy through British films, music, video games, crafts, and publishing. And they're taking a lead role in driving the UK economic recovery. Senator thompson -Ai, you have five more minutes. Thank you. It improves educational outcomes. When I use drama in the classroom, I find the children keen and stimulated and excited about learning. So once when they say, Miss Religion, so boring, and I began to dramatize the classes, what a transformation. They began to look forward to religious instruction classes. 
It creates a more highly skilled workforce. It improves health outcome. It improves your personal well-being. It rejuvenates cities. It supports democracies. It creates social inclusion. And it's important to our lives. So the article concludes that state can use the arts to, arts to boost their economy in a variety of ways from community development and promoting arts assets as boost to cultural tourism. They should also adopt strategies that support and strengthen their creative industries. States can support the inclusion of arts in community development strategies by offering grants and creating public space for arts. This way, states will reap numerous benefits that help generate stable and more reliable communities. So in all of the circumstances outlined, I urge the government to wake up the sleeping giant and boost the economy, and I'm quoting here from Creative New Zealand, by understanding our cultural industry by first mapping our cultural and art assets, do an inventory to gauge the contribution of art and culture to the economy, get the data. Develop strategies to support culture and art sectors, support individual entrepreneurs, give small grants to encourage creative individuals. Enter into public-private partnerships, provide technical assistance with planning and marketing. Target specific sectors that offer significant economic growth, films, craft, design, and environmental art. Offer training programs to encourage growth in the industry. Include art and craft into statewide planning. Seek input from stakeholders. Identify a vision. Attract tourism dollars. Tourists attending cultural events not only spend on events, but also spend money on dining, gifts, and services. Help weak econ economic areas as creative industries can benefit residents in rural areas and urban core. Heritage and tourism are main components of a sustainable economy, so states should develop innovative strategies to encourage tourism planning and marketing their unique arts. States can use to, the arts to boost their economy in a variety of ways from community development and promoting art assets as boost to cultural tourism. They should adopt strategies to support and strengthen their creative industries. They should offer grants and create public spaces for arts. That way, states will reap numerous benefits that help generate stable and more livable communities. So do not let COVID-19 defeat, um, defeat us. There are ways that we can use the arts to boost our economy. And I commend the suggestions by these international researchers to us in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you, Madam President. Senator De Freitas. Thank you, Madam President, uh, for the opportunity to contribute uh, to this debate that has been engaging us from uh, this morning to this current time. I don't intend to be very long because I think a lot has been said so far by all the speakers that have gone before me in relation to the history of Napa, um, its functioning in the way it operated now, and what is being proposed by way of its operation in this bill. What I would say, Madam President, is that uh, from all of the speakers that have gone before, one of the things that I think is common uh, on the opposition side, the independent side, and the government side is that everybody recognizes that Napa has great potential. I think where we diverge is in terms of the ability to realize that potential. And one of the things that comes across in this bill by way of putting in this type of a structure, which I've heard other speakers say follows the Queen's Hall model, is that it allows the culture and arts community and the institution and structure that is Napa to truly realize that potential. And let me explain why. Every single creative I have ever encountered in my life, one thing has been common to all of them. They are normally free spirits. They tend not to do well under any kind of a stricture or any kind of restrictive environment. And if you, you think about it, you think about painters, you think about musicians, you think about dancers, they're free. That's the, the one thing that comes to mind. They're free to create, they're free to express themselves, and they are free to you know, release the energies that they have as creative individuals. And one of the things that comes across in this bill, by putting in the structure by way of having a board that has certain responsibilities, is that they have a greater level of freedom to be able to put things in place 
to really allow that particular building or that particular, what I would call, cultural and arts center to realize that full potential. And let me explain by going to Clause 7 and looking at Part B, where it says entering into strategic partnerships or alliances to facilitate beneficial activities consistent with the functions of NAPA. When I read that, the first thing that came to my mind is that as a creative entity, one of the things that can happen or I envision is that that board can enter into a memorandum of understanding, if you call it that, that's the best phrase I can use to explain it, with theatre companies in the US. We all know about Broadway, and we all know about the plays that they put on. We all know, based on what Senator Batelmier stated in her contribution, as to what is residing within Napa in terms of the infrastructure. And I can see, in terms of the roles and responsibilities under that particular section, in the future, once this bill is passed and this structure is put in place, a memorandum of understanding occurring between Napa and a Broadway company that puts on regular plays on Broadway in the US, and having that particular play, let's call it Shakespeare or Othello or any other play that comes up that has, let's say, a large amount of popularity, that that play can be held in Napa through that memorandum of understanding, therefore bringing foreign exchange and therefore increasing revenue of that particular institution. And that's one of the things that this particular structure is able to do because they now have the freedom to go ahead and do something like that. I heard Senator Sober speak to having events such as Kess or Marshall and those type of events at Napa, and he indicated that when Mr. Williams, former Senator Williams, was trying to, to do a music video at Napa that he wasn't able to do so. Well, Senator Sobers, what I would respond and say is that this bill allows the board to be able to look at the benefits of something like that and make a determination on spot as to whether they want to do something like that. But what I would say is that even though you're saying that these things could be done. You also have to be careful because I don't know of any Marshall event or concert where you sit down and listen to Marshall. I know it's a moving event. I know it's an event where you're dancing and you're, you're, you're up and there's a large crowd and whatnot. The kind of concerts I thought that would be held at Napa would be the ones where you sit down and you take in the event. He mentioned Adele as a concert, for example. One of the things with those international artists, as far as I remember, is that their contracts, Minister of Tourism might be able to expand upon that, tend to come with something called riders. So it's not just a matter of I pay you, you come, you sing. They would have other things added into the contract, one of which might be you need to put me up in a five-star hotel, for example. And if you can't do that, then I'm not coming. And the thing is, is that as much as I agree with Senator Sobers in that sense, where you can start to have those type of concerts to bring in foreign exchange in Napa, the fact is that prior to the structure that we're putting in place now, that would have been a difficult thing to do in terms of the management that's there now. However, with the board, with the kind of hiring practices that they can engage in, with the kind of team that they can put together, you can now engage in bringing those individuals into the country to perform at a state-of-the-art state facility like Napa because you would be able to ensure that the hotel attached to Napa with the 53 rooms, as Senator Batelmi pointed out, could be upgraded to a five-star entity, that the restaurants, the two restaurants that was mentioned earlier, could be upgraded to a five-star facility, allowing you to be able to attract these type of five-star artists to the venue. That is why this particular bill is important. That is why this structure is important. And I heard when Senator Richards said that based on the fact that we've been putting boards into institutions before and they have not operated to 100% efficiency, what makes this one different? What I would say to Senator Richards in response to that is 
I have a lot of faith in our creative industry in Trinidad and Tobago. I think it's one of the best in the Caribbean region. I'm not going to get into a, a, a spat to say Trinidad and Tobago is better than any other particular island in the Caribbean, but just to say that we are one of the best, I think we have some very good artists, we have some very good creatives. And it is based on that sentiment that I believe having these individuals on this board made up with other individuals like lawyers and accountants and whatnot, that this particular board and this particular management structure has put in place will be able to see Napa realize its full potential. Because if it's one thing these individuals are, is that they're creative. No matter what obstacle they may face, they are creative. So my response to Senator Richards in relation to that is, we have to have faith. There's a saying that goes, no institution can be greater than the people that make it up. It's not possible. And if it is, as I stated, we have some of the best creative individuals in the Caribbean, then it stands to reason that this particular structure in relation to a board that has people from the industry in it, I expect great things from Napa going forward. So Madam President, Senator Richards also went on to speak to why it is that we have a Queen's Hall Act and now a Napa Act and a Sapa Act. And I listened to him carefully when he was speaking and I, and I thought to myself, in that he's correct, why is it that we don't have an act or one act to govern all of these types of institutions in Trinidad and Tobago? And then it hit me again. Do you want one act to govern all of these institutions, institutions that in and of themselves are expressive, and when you think about it, Queen's Hall is built and is expressed by way of its building, structure, and the way it's shaped and everything in one way. You have Napa being expressed one way, and then you have Sapa being expressed one way. So is it that you want one piece of legislation to govern them all, or is it that you want the ability in the future that if it is Napa is going in one direction based on how the board takes it, that Sapa can go in another direction based on how the board takes it, and same with Queen's Hall. Because at the end of the day, these are institutions that are there to assist the cultural and arts industry in Trinidad and Tobago. And like I said earlier in the beginning of my contribution, you do not want too much stricture involved in that. You want them to be able to express themselves, and in doing so, you want to be able to have that uh, flexibility to amend where you would need to amend as each one moves forward going into the future and expresses themselves. So I would say to Senator Richards, I understand how having one act to govern them all could have its own benefits, but in relation to this particular industry and how it expresses themselves, I think it's actually better to have it done this way to allow for that flexibility going forward in the future as each one starts to emerge in terms of how they operate and how they express themselves. So Madam President, as I indicated, I wasn't going to be long because a lot has been said. I think arguments have been made on all sides. I think that the potential for Napa to do what it was set up to do in terms of helping the creative industry in Trinidad and Tobago is made greater by the provisions in this bill. This bill is nothing more than the systematic setting up of systems to allow Napa to operate efficiently by way of putting a board in place, by way of ensuring that they are financial so that they can budget properly and ensuring that all of the, the, the checks and balances are in place as it relates to that are also in the bill by way of reporting to Parliament, by way of reporting to the Minister and so forth. So Madam President, before I run into a tedious repetition, I think enough has been said. I support this bill and I look forward to what Napa can do with a board of creatives and other professional individuals. With those few words, I thank you. Senator Dial Singh.
Thank you, Madam President, for acknowledging me to partake in this bill. And Madam President, I must say that in Trinidad, we are very fortunate where we have such a diverse diversity of cultures that we have here. We have seen um, you know, persons from all parts of the globe brought here, and the cultures have been flourishing. We have seen fusion of cultures, and this is something we have to be very grateful for. And I, I must say that even songs and culture and whatever persons hear, it, it, it actually, what they grew up listening to, it, it, it actually forms part of their memory. And we found that even elderly persons, when they are having problems with Alzheimer, listening to sounds in their past could definitely trigger that happy memory where they first heard it. Um, it gives them that joy, you know, where they first danced it. So it is important to have culture and cultural expressions within the spectrum of a country where, you know, it could be handled in such a way that it will be fair, it will be in a way that it, it actually will be in a way that it will encompass all. So therefore, this um, bill serves to, produce, um, to have a board which would be, you know, looking at our culture, being actually, as, as somebody had mentioned, it will be there as, as some, you know, looking at, at the culture, looking to see if, we, you know, to, to see how we could manage it, to see how they could market it, to be stewards, I think um, somebody had mentioned, to be stewards of our culture. But these stewards have to be a little careful in the sense that, you know, to ensure that what they portray, what they push there as culture is in the truth and in fact nationalistic in its, 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 its um, portrayal. And this is where I want to just take it a bit, Madam, in the sense that the importance of the board members. Why I look at this is we have to be also cautious what occurs in a country as diverse and blessed as us. Recently in America with the Black Lives Movement, we had um, persons claiming that there was a dominant culture, but there was a subculture of the Afro-Americans. And there was still a fight for those persons to be, um, you know, to get that identity, to, to, to be there in the main events, the cultural events, and the books and what. And we, we had that. And in, you see, in our country, we also have to be sensitive to the different cultures, to the different um, races that exist there. And we have seen it recently where persons may have said they were discriminated in um, burial rights or cremation rights, and we have to be sensitive that we don't ignite anything. So this is why it's important, the composition of the board, and this is why I want to push, because I don't think many per persons mention about the composition in terms of the sensitivity to other cultures. And why I make this, I would like to, to just um, read into it, Madam, just an uh, article that I have here, where it's called Challenging Discrimination, Promoting Equality. And it was really a committee on the elimination of racial discrimination, trends, and developments. And this was by Theo van Boven, and it was presented in the European um, Rights Center. And just one thing I want to put into here, that it was, it was actually mentioned the importance of the state in combating racism and racial discrimination where they said failure to recognize the distinct culture, lifestyle, language of certain groups and minorities um, are forcing them to assimilate and it also forms part, part of the patterns of denial. So basically what they are try trying to say is that we have to appreciate the cultures of other persons. And the role of the state is that what, with its capacity to legislate and enforce which is institutions to monitor and to control with its responsibilities in the area of teaching, education, culture, and information, and with its task to promote social welfare and, and political justice. The state has a crucial role to play in combating racial discrimination and, and promoting racial equality. This Napa bill here, if it is somehow handled in a way where different persons feel that they are included in the mainstream culture, you find it will do much to, you know, you know, negate any sort of racism or inequality people think that they have. And the composition of the board, I think the minister has to ensure that whoever is in that board would 
look at the undercurrents that exist in our country. And, I, and the undercurrents, I just want to make mention, Madam, just two papers I just want to read in very quickly. Ethnic Identity, National Identity, and Music in Hindu Trinidadian Culture. It's by Peter Manuel. And what Peter said is that, that within Trinidad, the East Indian um, person, some Trinidadians, you know, the cultural, Trinidadian cultural policy is, uh, he put it as, it's, it's, it's ad hoc. And there's a marked favoritism towards Creole culture and music at the expense of Hindu Trinidadian counterparts. So he made this, he also made a point that Hindu Trinidadian culture is similarly marginalized in, um, you know, in state funded best village, um, folklore contest, and one Indian academic told him, we are made to feel unwelcome there. And the orientation is mostly Afro-Trinidadians and we were criticized um, as clannish for sometimes, you know, when we came out and were not mixing and participating. So there are definitely the undercurrents. And um, there's another article, Racialism in Trinidad and Tobago, which has the similar sentiments where there are certain East Indians who figure they are not included in culture. And let's think, is that true, is that not true? Well, we have seen a dominance of, of, of calypsos, we have seen a dominance of, of pan and all these things, and, and we have to appreciate, I grew up, madam, uh, looking at um, Indian variety, looking at Masana Bahar, looking at um, you know, calypso competitions, attending functions. I had, I had a Baptist church near to me, I used to go to it and, and hear the music, um, listen to soft rock, this is my culture. I, I have been exposed to all these things. Now, if there are certain persons who figure that if they're within Trinidad and Tobago and they are not represented, represented in the mainstream cultural activities, they may feel isolated. So we have to work at that. We have to work at that. And those two studies I quoted were the sentiments of certain people. So our duty, I think, is not just passing laws for Napa and whatnot, but ensuring that they reach out. Someone mentioned to me that there was, a, there was the um, event, madam, where they, they got a grant for persons to go and perform abroad. And the person actually told me, hey, look at the composition of those persons. And, and he was trying to imply it was racially skewed. He may be right, I did not look at the composition. But what I'm saying, if that is so, we or those in authority, those in this new board, have to reach out to those other persons and include them. Have them included so we'll have a society where everyone feels that they have that connectivity and that movement. And this is all I'm trying to say when, when I'm looking at the composition of the boards, we have to ensure that. Madam, also, what I must look at is that there is the, you know, the move to have this um, NAPA you know, conceptualized with its own board, its own money-making process. And Senator Patel said, if we could have things running right through cultural events, this will be a remarkable thing, because then we can actually have as an income earner, as a tourism event, arts from everywhere. There, there's the Chinese artists, we have the uh, Orisha, I've not, Orisha music, uh, Bobo Shanti. We have to engage these cultures to come out. So we, as a, as a Trinidadian, will say, all those are parts of us. We have to realize that um, East Indian music, you may, you may not like it, but other people like it are Trinidadians. Put them in there, let them feel, let them feel that they are also part there. They are Trinidadians too. I also would look at the fact that if we are going to create this um, body, I had a question to try to find out. Funds would be going in to pay these board members, funds would be going in to, to get it running, I remember when they started the Napa, and it, it was actually, you know, it came about where there was a lot of money spent and overspent, and, 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 and persons had the, the, the um, opinion that even the, the structure itself had a lot of defects we had to, to fix. So we are now going to be putting money there into this um, body or body to run it. So I'm just hoping that we would eventually be able to get some sort of profit out of this um, this, this body, uh, or those bodies. And Madam, right away I may say, in our economic times, I also have to agree with Senator Richards when he made mention that he didn't see the need to have Sapa and Napa. Because Trinidad is a small place. By doing that, you're going to create 
a further geographical division. People in South, they say they are South of the Carney Bridge. Hey, Trinidad is small. We can have one body looking at both of them, one body maintaining both of them. Why? The advantages, less chance to say, well, I'm south of the Academy Bridge, there's, there's discrimination. The other advantage is cost. You are now looking at putting board members in Napa, board members in Sapa. And this to me, we cannot really afford that in times like this. And again, again as Senator Vera mentioned, we were now speaking about uh, disbanding the livestock board because of funds, and here we are trying to create. So I don't agree. Why do I agree? If we can make something that could run efficiently, that could be a tourist attraction, that could help the arts and really have something there that persons could just carry their family to see all sort of genres of music. This is something I'm agreeing to. But we cannot afford, as I'm saying, to have boards being run. People may accuse the government of job for the boys. I don't know. So this is something we have to be careful of, of, of not, of, of probably thinking this. I also think is, instead of having supper, why can't we have um, the give Tobago something. Because remember, Tobago have ha their own. When I went to Tobago and saw the folk dances, the, the culture there is different. Even if we do not want to have something else like an academy in Tobago, again, the new board has to not only look at East Indian artists and look at Bobo Shanti, look at other Chinese music, whatever, but they also have to accommodate Tobago culture within that framework. So at any time, you can go in and see things happening there. So I, I don't like the, 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 uh, that, that aspect of the spending. I also wonder what will happen to Queen's Hall and Napa Rima Bowl. Will we be having a duplication of services? Because Queen's Hall... They have, I mean, they have had good, uh, good history, good performances. They, are, they have moved with the times. Um, I think Santa Vera had mentioned that they were the, one of the first to have online tickets. So they, they actually were running things properly. So they could probably learn from, um, Napa could learn from them and vice versa. They could probably, um, as Senator Vera said, get some of their legislation in place to help the Queen's Hall and the um, Napa Rima Bowl. Um, Mama, I must say so that the Napa had gotten criticism before, when it, it, it and even from uh, you know um, persons who looked at the structure, the certain artists' associations said they were not consulted. But this is the time I'm thinking we could bring them in and figure: Is there anything that needs to be fixed there? Is there anything that needs to be added on to at least get that greater accommodation to that? I want to know, madam, is when I look at the bill, I had some aspects here that I just wanted to go through, and I, I looked at um, part two of the bill, the National Academy for Performing Arts, where um, there's an established body corporate to be known as the National Academy of Performing Arts, and I said I really wanted to be nationalistic, really, in its true sense, inclusive of all. I think the country deserves this at this stage. We have moved a long way. In fact, we have senators here who are, have a great cultural, um, uh, you know, they're, they're deep in the culture. Senator Sagram Singh, I know, has that culture for your East Indian culture, and you're involved, Senator Avina Singh, and they might be ones to help guide policy to be more inclusive. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy we have those senators on board here. So finally, we can put a rest to person saying um, uh, there is discrimination in culture and a dominant culture there. Madam, when I looked at the fact that um, um, I looked at um, the part two, uh, seven, yeah, seven D, the the Napa actually would be implementing the policies of government in relation to the management of performance spaces, culture, and arts education as they may be directed by the minister from time to time. So I'm happy I saw this because I was wondering initially if you're going to have Napa and Sapa and they're going to have um, diverse um, opinions, like there's a chairman down there who doesn't want to include a certain um, culture for whatever reason, there's another one doing his own thing in, 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 in North, that will, you know, at least if they government himself could have that overreaching policy drive to say we have to be all inclusive, we have to run it this way. So I think part 7D 
the importance really is the minister in this um, who overseeing uh, minister would have to be the one to give the clear guidance how we can move this forward. I want to say that the part seven two e mentioned that the they will be you know having to provide technical training in culture and arts for upcoming practitioners in the field, which builds the cadre of proficiency of national professional artists and performers um, through timely and consistent access to NAPA. So in a way, what we would be doing here is we would be, I'm hoping in the future we would be seeing, I think UTT was involved, and I'm hoping that we could still have the involvement of UTT. We could still have um, the offering of, of, of not just PAN, but Harmonium, but other events where people could come and, and uh, you know, get their whatever training you, you have there. So the, the, the idea of having this training there, it's something that I think we have to ensure that there is a push for it. You see, recently, there was a... There, there was, um, I think the Ministry of Youth had put out some sort of ads for persons to come and um, learn um, to set up sound systems. And I think it was certain areas in Trinidad. And again, in social media, I looked and I saw people criticize it and say, look, those areas are mainly areas that are, are you know, occupied by government um, members. Um, uh, 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 members of parliament have won by the uh, uh, government side. So while you hear that undercurrent and persons making that, it's easy to solve that. We expand this, the, the, that program, sound development program, uh, to other areas, so that, that, that uh, you know, dialogue we wouldn't hear. Or mm -hmm. when you have this snapper, you have this snapper here mm -hmm. in such a way mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. any sort of persons mm -hmm. from any part of Trinidad could be able to come to either Napa and Sapa. And, and well, Napa, I was hoping we don't have, um, did I, well, the same, same academy mm -hmm. where they can get that training in any mm -hmm. art form they want, any mm -hmm. culture they want. So I'm thinking mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we need also, um, the, the, the country needs to know what are, uh, they often, what cultural forms they often, what sort of, um, um, you know, instruments they are allowing to play. Madam, we have something in, in, in psychiatry where, where you call um, uh, um, music, you know, it's, it's like art therapy, music therapy. And we have African drums, we have a guitar, and a patient came to me and said, but doc, I am in the Ilsukur area, I, I grew up playing tabla and harmonia. Why don't we have that here? And it was a valid question. So as a doctor, I was trying to reach out to the Indian High Commission and say, give us something now, because there are people who will come for something and they have to have an instrument that they want to play. And it's a similar thing. When I see this in my private practice, I want to see in the public, especially if it is uh, the domain of taxpayers' money running these entities, these entities has to be fair and fair and, and, uh, 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 you know, fair and to all and all inclusive. And madam, I want to say something. If you have this board running this and it's taxpayers' money and they are promoting music, like, like music with um, wine and jam and dance and alcohol, things that I don't like, could I now object to say, hey board, I don't think, you know, you should have uh, uh, you know, if you're going to give taxpayers money into this, you should have a better sort of civic or social responsibility where certain songs like the wine and jam and certain songs are not um, um, somehow benefiting from taxpayers' money. Because let us say I am a, a Muslim individual who don't like to show my body and I'm seeing this thing now there, you're using my taxpayer money, I could be a bit... Um, you know, upset with it. So you have to now balance certain things. And again, I always say, I heard our um, independent Senator Burgess mention about the children. And I was shocked once when that lovely song came out, um, um, Dollar Wine. And I love that song, I love the artist. But uh, when I saw standard five children doing the Dollar Wine, it was not age appropriate. So somehow this body will have to look at making 
certain songs, age appropriate, certain things children cannot be performing in, certain things children cannot be, we should shield children, come just as we have movies 18 years and over. I'm thinking we should have this. Se Senator Dial Singh, mm -hmm. I just need to remind you that we are dealing with what we are dealing with here, which is the, to set up the establishment of the National Academy for the Performing Arts, and it, what the bill talks about management and that sort of thing. What you are dealing with right now is going beyond the remit of the bill. So I would ask you please to try and tie in what you're saying to the, to the mat subject matter. Thank you, Madam. What I'm trying to tie in is that if you have members of the board to be selected, I'm looking at part six, three. Members shall be selected from persons who have qualifications or experience in the performing arts, culture, law, engineering, management, finance. I want somebody there from the IRO. They may have a greater sense of morality in terms of what should, what should pass as certain cultural events. And this is why I was trying to form that link between certain types of music, certain portrayal of certain types of culture, and um, what we should be promoting. So I would really love somebody from the IRO to be there. I also want is if we have to try to be all inclusive from the studies, I show some people think that the East Indian culture has been left out of the intrigued culture. Um, not just here, but in the States, we have had that same thing with the Afro-Americans. Somebody from the NCIC should also be appointed there to make sure there are members there who can look after and ensure that not just um, you have persons with performing arts, culture, law, engineering, management, finance, but somebody there who could ensure that there is that inclusive East Indian culture. Because, ma Madam, I remember, I also often wonder, what happens to all the artists who I used to see in Mastana Baha, who got first, second, third prize? We've not seen them. Where are they? They learn, they are talented, they learn to play instruments, but they are not seen in the, in the public domain. It's like they are hidden away and they are cast aside and, and they have to, we have to reach out for them. This is why I'm saying the membership board should be somebody from NCIC who can look at all these um, shows from before, reach out for these artists who might be very talented, depressed with the COVID, could play harmonium, could play a violin, could sing some music, and say, come, come love, let's bring you here. Let's engage you in society now. Let you be inclusive in society now. We, the government, we, the um, new board, uh, Napa would be able to um, now reach out and find certain members. Um, so Madam, while I also looked at the fact that uh, part six too, the board shall comprise not less than five and no more than 11 members. I, I, I think that's overkill. Make it, uh, you know, why, why 11? Make it seven or even nine. And why I say an odd number in case you have to vote on certain instances, you would have that. So um, Senator Vera mentioned that somebody with intellectual rights should be there. And this is something I agree with him because you have, um, we have, Great talent here, great fusion music. We have wonderful things here, and then we, somebody with intellectual rights, I think, um, should also be included in, um, in, as part of the makeup of the board. I looked at um, part nine of the bill, well, section nine, and part six, where an acting appointment of a member under subsection five shall not continue for more than six months. I, I, Madam, I think if you are serious about culture and, and, and certain boards, we should have it three months. I think, I think six months is too, too, too long. And even when I looked at subsection A there, where a person is acting as a member and the office becomes vacant while that person is so acting, that person may continue so to act until the ministry otherwise directs the vacancy is filled or a period of six months. Again. Most respectfully, I think if you're serious, have people there who would really be reappointed quickly, have persons there who are not going to take some long time off so they wouldn't really know what's going on. And I think um, at least we would let persons know we are serious about um, the uh, culture of our country. Um, again, when I looked at section 14.4, the quorum of the board shall uh, be not less than 50% of its members. So again, if we are sticking with um, seven members, which I hopefully, think it's a small amount, it should save, save uh, again, taxpayers' dollars. And um, you find the, the, the larger groups, sometimes they are disbursement of effort. So sometimes the smaller groups might be able to, to, to uh, you know, work more. Also, I, I looked at section 15, um, part four, 
where it says that the copies of the minutes, when you have the minutes, should, um, shall be forwarded to the minister within one week of being confirmed. And I find that's a bit tedious. Why should we burden the minister? If the minister has gotten this board to act and do their work. Senator Dialton, you have five more minutes. Thank you, madam. I don't think the minister needs us to get a minute every month. I mean, if there's an issue, they can go to the minister rather than burden him with this. Um, then the board, part 16, the board may appoint committees comprising its members or other persons. I would like to have, a, if they're going to, to get committees, let it be a public um, a, a, a knowledge who are in these committees. So we would be published, so we'd say again, there's a, there's a, a diversity of culture representative in certain committees there. Um, part 17 sp spoke about the, each member shall wait in three months of his appointment and each anniversary of his appointment, um, you know, submit a statement declaring whether he has an actual or oh, some pecuniary interest. I think this is excellent because you may start out there without having an interest, but afterwards you could develop an interest. So that's putting them on a, on a, on a, a, a level of transparency that persons there would be able to know, um, you know, if they're in a board, not gain some other interest after without letting it come to the light of the minister. When I looked at part 17, five, a person who commits an offense under subsection four commits an offense and is liable um, on some conviction to a fine of $150,000 and imprisonment for a term of two years. I'm wondering why it's and, why it couldn't be O, and O, because I'm thinking if you put in it and, you actually, you know, even though we want no sort of a, a corruption or fraud to occur, so bit part five and six, I'm looking at and the imprisonment, um, I was thinking it should be O. Just, um, uh, when I looked at the, the, the rest of the piece of, of this bill, madam, it mainly looks at salaries and transfers of people moving out from the relevant ministry and coming there to act. So there's nothing there that I would really say that I would have wanted to, to change in that sense. I would want to say, though, that it, 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 it seems to me here that we have a uh, a time here where we could really get the, our act in such a way that we could include persons, we can actually have it in such a way that if handled correctly, um, persons may feel they belong here. We can have it, you know, and Madam, when the Black Plague struck Europe, the Renaissance period after was a period where the artists came and they had buildings, architect, art pieces, and, and, and culture really expanded. Similarly, after COVID here, if we play this right, the young person who could play the ammonia and pan, we will, the artists, we will give them a world where, you know, they can have the stage post-COVID. So I think we have to get it right, and I'm hoping we can get it right. And um, I thank the minister for bringing this bill. It's just that um, those little concerns I have, I'm hoping we can address it. Thank you. Minister of Tourism, Culture and the Arts. Minister, may I just remind you, you have 30 minutes. Thank you very much, Madam President. Hopefully I will not need all of the 30 minutes. Um, I also want to thank you, Madam President, for the opportunity to respond to some very valuable contributions coming from the other side, from the other senators, um, of course, with the exception of Senator Mark, who tried to re-engage the issue of the construction and the design of Napa, and of course try to take us into some very ridiculous positions that as a very experienced senator, he knows not to be true. Notwithstanding, uh, Madam President, I am truly grateful, truly thankful for the contributions of senators from the other side, for their suggestions and for their expectations um, with respect to the creation of this statutory body that we now want to create to manage the operations of Napa. I can start off perhaps with addressing some of the concerns of the last speaker, Senator Dayal Singh. I would say to Senator Dayal Singh that Tobago is not left out and there is the Shaw Park Cultural Complex 
that is the, um, a, a very advanced state of the art, um, state of the art performance space for Tobagonians, for their cultural expression, and it is well used, well utilized in Tobago. With respect to East Indian culture, um, perhaps the senator um, may not know. And again, it comes down to the ineffective and the inefficient management of these performance spaces. Because a lot of times in Naparima Bowl or even in the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts, the next bill that we're about to do, there are lots of East Indian shows that occur in San Fernando in the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts. In fact, during the Diwali period, there is a group that puts on a show. Um, they put it on last year and the year before that during the COVID environment. And it was aired on ZTV. And that show, which was an East Indian show, it was around Diwali time, garnered over 20 million views in the Indian diaspora, persons who view ZTV. So it is incorrect to say that um, you know, the East Indian performers and East Indian culture are not expressed at these performing spaces. They are. But where these performing spaces are properly managed and they have their marketing arrangements down, you would find these things being advertised, being marketed, the use of social media, the use of technology, digitization in terms of being able to procure a ticket and entry via QR code, etc. But those things are not in place because what you have, what you have virtually is a ministry with all the bureaucracies built in and bureaucracy for, for good reason and good purpose, managing these commercial performing spaces that have a lot of potential. So I hope I've answered Senator Dial Singh there. Um, I touch on Senator Sobers, very valuable contribution. And Senator Sobers spoke about the gymnastics that are involved in trying to utilize these auditoriums, um, the, the Napa Auditorium in particular. And he gave an anecdote of uh, former Senator Jason Williams having to write and enter into this back and forth pen pal arrangement with somebody at the Napa um, to be able to get the space and eventually he was refused. So let's speak plainly here. That is what occurs and that is the reason why we need to create separate management arrangements. What occurs on a daily basis if there is an organization or a group wishing to uh, retain the National Academy for the Performing Arts, the auditorium, what happens is you go to the, the administrative offices and you fill out a form. The form then gains pre-approval. The form then goes to the management committee and then gains pre-approval. The form then goes to the ministry, and it goes to the receiving desk, whoever desk that might be. And then the form goes to the desk of the deputy permanent secretary. And then it moves from there to the permanent secretary, who now has to sign off. And the period of, di of time that takes depending on whether that officer wishes to have someone else remove the documents from his outtray to take it a number of footsteps to somebody's in-tray, the time that takes is about two weeks. And sometimes during that period, the opportunity is lost. The higher up, the organization, most times they've lost interest 
they no longer go to, 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 to the Napa to try and engage Napa. They, go to, they prefer to go to Queen's Hall or they prefer to go to somewhere else or they just prefer not to have their um, show. That is what occurs and that is what we're trying to fix here today. Faster decision making and faster procedures so that there can be more shows and there can be more activity, more cultural expression, more economic activity for those event managers, for those promoters, for those artists, for those cultural performers. And it's no fault of the employees of Napa. It's just the system that has to be corrected, but that is for another debate. Senator Suba has also asked about a number of concerts and international concerts, and he spoke to about Marshall Montano or other of our very outstanding artists being able to perform in these spaces. And I agree with, with, with Senator Sobers, but it has not been our culture. Our culture has been for outdoor type um, concerts. It is the very nature of our music to get up, you move it, the music hits you, you get up, you move, you dance, you enjoy yourself. But last year, interestingly, because of the COVID restrictions, a number of those artists decided that they would hold these concerts indoors. And what happened, the, all the concerts were oversubscribed. You had Second Star in, in, in Queen's Hall, you had a number down at Sapa, you had concerts in Napa, all of them oversubscribed. And I truly believe that the event promoters, they discovered something different. The exact same thing, the Adele, the Bruno Mars, and you go to a concert and you sit and you perhaps stand. They've discovered that there is another way and they can reach a different audience. Prior to the pandemic, those things may not have occurred. The policy of the public servants may have been, well, no soca, no concerts, nothing to go on in Sapa or in Napa. But now the soca artists, the cultural practitioners, they've realized that they don't necessarily need to go outdoors into a big field with a big stage to have a, a concert or a fete or a performance, they can reach an older audience. They can reach persons who might be disabled, who these performance spaces cater to. They may reach persons who love the soca music or love the calypso music, but may have an issue with the wine and jam and the alcohol. Persons who truly just want to enjoy the music. And that is what we saw in the year 2020. We also saw a number of different types of cultural expressions during the carnival period. There was a production called Mass. It was absolutely brilliant. And when you go into Napa, of course, many of us have been to Napa during the Independence Day Awards, and, and that may be it. But when you go into Napa, there are so many, the, 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 the stage is so technologically advanced. I did not even know that there was a massive, big LED screen behind that stage that can be incorporated into these performances. And there is that little sunken area, I don't know what it's called, that the orchestras can play in, in line with international performing spaces anywhere in the world, but we don't know. We don't know that. Senator Mark spoke and indicated that there are only two areas that can be monetized in Sapa. Clearly, Senator Mark has not been into the guts of, of Napa. And I don't blame him for that. I was only taken there as, as minister with responsibility for culture. There's so much behind there that we don't even know about. 
the two restaurants that are there, they occur and they are within the, the hotel arrangement. And strangely enough, it was between 2010, 2015 that they were mostly utilized by the UNC for hosting of dignitaries, hosting of visiting dignitaries, the hosting of awards, the renting out of those spaces to corporate entities, etc. And there was a big, big issue. I mean, on the file, you would see a num number of correspondences going back and forth, and persons quoting the, the Audit and Exchequer Act and what to do with the money that the corporate entities pay, and it cannot be deposited anywhere. It has to go directly to the, to the, um, to the Treasury, and it has to be written to the Treasury. And I mean, it was a mess. And it was truly discouraging, especially as someone with a business background who know that you can truly utilize this space. There just aren't, Senator Mark, two spaces that can be monetized. You have the entire four-year area. You know, Napa is one of the only places that I've seen, and it struck me as a person who is in love with art. There's no art hung in the Napa foyer. None. There can be art exhibitions. The entire front of Napa can be the host of weddings, can be the host of recitals, can be the host of many different things, including music videos. It can be done when you go in there and you see the real estate, and that's what it is. You are licensing or leasing out real estate. There are many little areas where little black box theaters can be, can be put up, where persons can practice, where persons can do recitals, whether it be spoken word or whatever else. There are many things that can happen in there, but of course, you need a board establishing a strategic plan with a mission, with a vision, to get that done and to truly monetize and to truly utilize the space that is the National, uh, National Academy for the Performing Arts. And in 2020, Senator Sobers, um, we, between the Ministry of Tourism and the Ministry of Culture, uh, we held several discussions and the National, the National Academy for the Performing Arts, the auditorium, did extremely well with the number of cruise tourists coming in, and they were directed there, and we held a number of shows using our local cultural practitioners. So it can be, it can be utilized. With respect to the minutes, again, the act itself, being a parent act, will not get into all of that minutia. Section Clause 14.3 uh, determines that the board can regulate its own proceedings and it would regulate its own proceedings with best, best, corporate, best practice corporate governance. And I truly expect, as occurs in most state enterprises, that the minutes will be circulated before time and then presented and persons given an opportunity to object. With respect to Senator Burgess and the issue of Clause 38, I do agree with Senator Burgess that a number of rules, including rules that treat with discipline, that treat with um, maybe not directly, but indirectly, the issue of child protection will be done by the board of Napa. In this section, along with section 71E and 72, a rules for a number of matters need to be created. There are rules that deal with discipline among the employees and of course discipline how people behave within the precincts of the National Academy for the Performing Arts. There will be rules that deal with grievances. There will be rules that deal with OSHA. There will be rules that deal with smoking. There will be rules that deal with many different things. There will be rules that deal with maintenance. So I do expect that 
these rules will be created by the board and promulgated uh, within the statutory body. With respect to Senator Richards, uh, Senator Richards asked uh, why two boards? Why two boards for Napa and Sapa? It's 20 minutes from Port of Spain on a cool day down to Sapa. I really don't know what, um, what speed Senator Richards drives at, but I come from Port of Spain every day. It's not 20 minutes, it's a lot longer. But that notwithstanding, these are two facilities that are not worth millions. The word millions was said, and I know, I know exactly what senators meant. These are properties that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And if you take into consideration the contents, if you take into consideration the potential, it could very well be into the billions. And I don't see why in terms of having regard to best corporate governance practices, why we should confine these two very, very, very valuable properties to just one board. I think it should be split because of the value of the properties in terms of its true value as well as its potential and just for best, best, best practices with respect to corporate governance. I mean, we have state enterprises here that have subsidiaries and every subsidiary has a board because that's how it has to be under the Companies Act. This is a statutory board, but I believe that with respect to best practice corporate governance, there should be two boards, one for the National Academy for the Performing Arts and one for SAPA. The National Academy for the Performing Arts, that board has to be very experienced and qualified. As Senator Vera said, that board has to be excellent. It has to be made up of people with excellence because you have prime property in the form of the hotel that needs to be leased out to an operator so that the operator can... Um, can utilize and monetize and commercialize that property. You also have the academy. You also have the auditorium, as well as the car park, the front, the fountains, etc. There is a lot that that board has to deal with with respect to Sapa. Sapa does not have a hotel per se, but there, it is a substantial property as well. Senator Richards, as well as Senator Vera, also spoke to the monetizing of IP rights and ensuring that someone who is well conversant with intellectual property rights uh, be on the board, be mentioned specifically with respect to the experience and qualifications of the board. I am no intellectual property expert. I've just touched on the, the thing cursorily, but I believe that the way our section that treats with the qualifications and the expertise um, for the board of Napa, it contemplates persons with other relative, other relative experience and somebody within the intellectual property realm can be considered for the board. But I wondered, and, and Senator Vera, you may correct me, um, knowing your experience in the area, and I wondered whether we were conflating a number of different things. Because while Napa is a performing space and does have, at this time, the capacity to film all of its productions, who does the productions belong to? Does it belong to the producer? Does it belong to the artist? Or will it belong to Napa being the ones with the camera and the equipment filming? Or does it, has to be, does it have to be consensual? So I'd give away if you wanted to explain. That's exactly why you need to have someone with IP experience. Yeah. 
because the producer really would be the person with whom, who's made all the arrangements for the particular show. Napa would be the venue. But even though you are the venue operator, you need to get necessary licenses and permissions and releases. So once you're dealing with performances and multiple rights interests competing with each other, you need someone that could really steer it through. Because if you don't get it right, the consequences could be dire, financially, um, damages, and even criminal infringements. Understood. Understood. Understand clearly. But um, the impression I was getting was that Napa could have benefited, and they can, um, but they could have benefited as part of its revenue generation on those IP rights. But I'm hearing from you now, and I totally understand and agree, there has to be an understanding of where the ownership of the rights lie and to ensure that whether it lies with Napa or it lies with the promoter or the artist, that it is monetized and it is protected. And I totally agree with that. But the section contemplates persons with those intellectual uh, property skills, but the board as well, under the part that deals with staff and advisors, can um, engage the assistance of advisors to properly um, ensure that those at Napa, the managers, etc., are properly aware of the intellectual property rights. Senator Richard said that it's not business as usual, and I could not agree more. And it's why at this time, after over a decade, that it's, this government uh, felt it was now. Now was the time to ensure that Napa, as well as Sapa, but in this instance, Napa, is properly managed and can see its full potential in terms of its diversification efforts and in terms of giving its cre creatives an opportunity for creative expression and to benefit from that. He spoke about a single portal, and I was very, very happy to hear it because the ministry at this time, we are in talks with TTT, with the Carnival Institute, and with a provider for a single platform where all of Trinidad and Tobago's cultural expression can be placed and can be monetized. So we have shows like No Boundaries, Sugarcane Arrows. When you go back and you look at those shows, you're in awe at the skill and at the quality that these productions were produced and with very little money. And if you go to YouTube now, you can see all of these shows for free. Somebody makes money off of the advertising, but even if the, the owner of the content who has put it onto YouTube makes a little money from the advertising, who is the advertiser? And that is something they can't control. Perhaps it should be Carib, perhaps it should be Angostura, perhaps it should be tied in to our trade so that we can now express ourselves, not just in, in the culture, but also in trade. But YouTube does not give you the option to control that. With this platform, which is a platform, it's an app, you download it onto your television, just like Netflix, just like other apps, and you have everything laid out there. Minister, you have five more minutes. Thank you very much. So we are actually in discussions with TTT, with the Carnival Institute, and we will continue discussions with other persons who are holders of content so that we can ensure that these things are monetized. With respect to Senator Mark, I'll just touch on it very quickly. Senator Mark knows that it is not the minister who selects the board. When you say minister, in this construct, it means the cabinet. It is the cabinet that is responsible for appointing the board. With respect to the qualifications, expertise, and the different sectors, um, 
that the Act contemplates, the creative sectors are well covered on the board. With respect to the terms and conditions to be set for staff, Senator Mark very well knows that it is the HREC, the Human Resource Advisory Committee of Cabinet, that sets the terms and con conditions of employees of these statutory bodies and state enterprises as advised by the CPO. And in giving that advice, what the CPO does is the CPO does a comparative analysis across all the sectors for positions doing the same thing or similar. Senator Mark knows that, but if we were to bring a bill tomorrow creating a statutory authority with these same boilerplate, boilerplate sections and constructs, I know I have every confidence that Senator Mark will rise and he will make the same objection on the same sections. So, Madam President, again, I am grateful for the ability to pilot this bill and to wrap this up. I again thank Honorable Senators opposite. I think that we have an incredible opportunity um, to utilize the space that is Napa to get a hotel operator so that hotel can finally be functional, to get more and more um, artistic expression, performances, plays that would create work for event promoters, for the ushers, for all concerned, there are many, many, many sectors that would benefit, including the tourism sector. Somebody comes to the Hyatt for a business meeting or business convention. Somebody comes to the Hilton, and they can just go to the Napa, enjoy a show, enjoy all that is Trinidad and Tobago, and pay a very small 50 US or 100 US dollars some. We can earn some foreign exchange and of course, it will be to the benefit of our economy and redound to the benefit of our citizens. Madam President, with those few words, I thank you. Minister, I need four specific words from you. And I beg to move. Thank you. Honorable Senators, the question is that a bill entitled An Act to Provide for the Establishment of the National Academy for the Performing Arts and for the management and control thereof and for related matters be now read a second time. Those in favor say aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. A bill entitled An Act to Provide for the Establishment of the National Academy for the Performing Arts and for the Management and Control Thereof and for Related Matters. Tourism, Culture, and the Arts. 66 1. I beg to move that the National Academy for the Performing Arts Bill 2022 be committed to a committee of the whole Senate forthwith to be considered clause by clause. Honorable Senators, the question is that the, national, that the bill entitled the National Academy for the Performing Arts be committed to committee of the whole Senate forthwith to be considered clause by clause. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. This Senate will now go into committee of the whole to consider the bill clause by clause.
Ja? I'm missing the Attorney General. Where is he? So, Senator Mark, uh, we will begin. Honorable Senators, I remind you that there are 40 clauses to this bill. Okay. Clauses one to three. Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses one to three stand part of the bill. Yeah, Honorable Minister, I'd just like to ask the Chair whether the policy of the government is cast in stone as it relates to the National Academy for the Performing Art being the centerpiece of the governance structure. And you have, for instance, Southern, the Performing Arts, Central, Tobago, as the case may be. Uh, so, in other words, what, what I'm asking you is whether the government of Trinidad and Tobago wants to stick to two arms or whether the government will want to have this body called the National Academy for the Performing Arts as the centralized agency for the operations of the Performing Arts in Trinidad and Tobago, with the Southern Academy being an outlet and we can develop something for Tobago as well as let's say central. So before so the I just want to ask you if you have any thoughts. Sen on that. Senator Mark, Minister. Senator Mark, the minister in his winding up addressed most of the issues, if not all, that were raised during the debate. Your question that you're now posing to the minister is with respect to policy. We are now at the committee stage where we are going to deal with the details of the bill. So I will ask you, please, let us move on. We have, we have put clauses one, two, and three to the committee. Senator Vera. Thank you. Um, Honorable Minister, through you, Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around the nexus between the body corporate and the plant building and complexes which comprise the premises. Um, the body corporate is the person. Senator but, Vera. But, well, I'm I, looking at the definitions. But we, the de we, we're dealing with clauses one, two, and three. Yes, and so NAPA means the National Academy for the Performing Arts Established. But that seems to conflate both the body corporate and all the plant and premises that comprise um, what the body corporate will be taking care of. Where, where, where the, where's the connection? Minister. Through you, Madam President, the, the, the body corporate is called NAPA. In terms of the property relative to the National Academy for the Performing Arts, all of that property, and I, I did forget to address it in the, in the wind-up, but all of that property, the car park, the land, and the facilities, all of that will now be vested into the body corporate. I see, and, 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 and that was always the assumption, but yes. sometimes you usually see some sort of schedule making clear what it is exactly we're talking about. It's just I'm saying is we are conflating the two and we're assuming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think it's down to the nomenclature. Well, just one second, Senator Lachmiel has, has a question. Uh, Minister, I just, um, I was wondering, because based on what Senator Vera asked, the, so that we don't get mixed up between the property and the company, wouldn't it be more um, useful then to establish a body corporate called the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts Company Limited, like how we have normal state boards with that attachment to it, so that you don't 
confuse what is the name of the entity and the corporate body with the property itself, because I think that's what you're getting at. Um, it's usual with state enterprises that you add something to the end and not name it the same thing as the property itself. falls under the Company Act. This is a statutory body created by, by Parliament. I mean, I understand the, the slight challenge of, of calling it NAPA, and then, of course, reading the National Academy for the Performing Arts. I understand that. It was discussed. But um, I don't think we can call it anything else. Senator Mark? Yeah. Um, Madam Chair, I'm just asking my honorable friend. Well, I'm talking about clause three, I'm looking at board, I look at the definition of the board, and they make reference to six one. Again, I want to ask through the chair whether this board is not taking on board the National Academy as a centralized agency and not the Southern Academy. In other words, what I'm asking is that when we look at the definition under clause three, whether the government's intention here is to have this board as the agency, the centralized agency, and you'll have Southern Performing Arts as just an outlet and not an independently standalone arrangement, given the definition we have in clause three. So, Madam Chair, I'm trying to just get clarification on clause three as it relates to board on the sixth one. So really and truly though, Senator Mark, what you have just done is to repose the question that you initially asked that I did say to you was really part of policy and not dealing with the details. But to bring this matter to an end, because I am going to put clauses one, two, and three to stand part of the bill in five seconds, I will allow the minister to answer the question. Well, Madam President, through you, there are two bills before us, and the two bills deal with two specific statutory bodies. With respect to policy of NAPA being the centralized agency for all the arts in Trinidad and Tobago, the answer to that is no. So, honorable senators, the question is that clauses one to three now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those again say no. I think the eyes have it. Clauses one to three now stand part of the bill. Clauses four to six. The question is that clauses four to six stand part of the bill. Senator Ma. Yeah, Madam Chair, um, again, through your good self to the Honorable Minister. In Clause 5, there is no mention whatsoever of the role of NAPA in maintenance of the very expensive equipment, causing millions and millions of dollars on an estate worth billions and billions of dollars. So I'm asking the Honorable Minister, whether given the fact that you're given legal clothing and you're moving away from a management committee, whether it would not be appropriate to insert a provision or a clause under Section 5 or Clause 5 of the bill focusing on the maintenance of all the equipment and plant of NAPA by this board that we are about to appoint. So I'm asking, should the Honorable Minister. Chair, if you could clarify that for us. Thank you very much, Madam, Pres uh, Madam Chair. Uh, with respect to Clause 5, if you look at Clause 5B, maintenance there is incidental to the provision of state-of-the-art facilities for culture and the arts in Trinidad and Tobago. If you look at Clause 5F, also to engage in any other business or activity that is incidental to or which is capable of being conveniently carried out on in the performance of its functions under paragraphs A to E. Uh, it is incidental to and it does not have to be specifically stated. 
that maintenance be a part or a function of the board. Maintenance is a part of the, 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 the function of the board. I don't understand your point. Um, but, uh, is the minister inclined to incorporate the word maintenance so that it could be specified? Because the, the reason why I'm saying so is that many of our challenges in this country is the lack of maintenance. All I'm asking is that we are passing legislation that appears to be vague. I would like it to be specific. So if you could incorporate maintenance along with security, at least it would give the members of the board clarity in terms of the legislation. That is all I'm asking. We call all, all of us on the same page. We want this thing to survive. It must be maintained and must be secured. So that's what I'm saying. Minister. Madam Chair, I, I hear what the Honorable Member has said. I don't think it's absolutely necessary to put the words maintenance as well as security. When we go on to, to, to seven, you also see that there are powers of the board and there are powers that enable the board to create um, operational plans and um, other matters, uh, Madam Chair. So I, I don't see that we need to put the word maintenance or we need to put specifically the word security. Senator Vera. Uh, I'm looking at the Queen's Hall Act. And in their definition, they say the hall means the Queen's Hall situate. So they separate the board and the hall. And then in the establishment of the board, a Queen's Hall board responsible for the management, control, and maintenance of the hall is hereby established a body corporate. Now, in one fell swoop, you've dealt with the board, you've dealt with the premises, and you've, you've dealt with the body corporate. There seems to me in this act a lack there. That, that nexus I don't get clearly. We are assuming. Senator Lachmidial. Just, I just want to point out that the exact same wording applies to the NAPRI Mobile Act. And it's also, I think, a lot clearer. And I mean, consistency in drafting our laws, because we have now what will essentially be four pieces of legislation establishing four different boards, Queen's Hall, NAPRI Mobile, NAPA, and SAPA, which are intended to do the same exact thing. But you have two of them drafted one way and two of them drafted another way. And I, I don't, um, I think that that's not just bad drafting, but I think it's, it's, it's not, I don't see the reason why these two pieces of legislation have to be so broad when we have precedent existing in our law for the identical functions being carried out at different premises that are drafted in more precise language. Minister. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I hear what Senator Lodge Media is saying, but it shouldn't be lost on us that um, legislative drafting have, has modernized these um, the Queen's Hall, as well as the Napoli Mobile Acts, have been done since the 1960s or 70s. Madam Chair, I'm looking at the, 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 the long title of the Act, and it's an Act to provide for the establishment of the National Academy for the Performing Arts and for the management and control thereof and for related matters. So I really don't see why we need to specifically put maintenance or security in there. It's, it's a part of their fight. It's a part of the board's fiduciary duties. Yeah, but all we are saying is that you have to be consistent, Honourable Minister, in the Queen's Hall Act, in the Naparinimal Bowl Act. It has management, it has control, and maintenance. So all we are saying is that let us have some consistency. Leave out security, but please incorporate maintenance in that section. That is all we are asking. So it would be very clear to those who are taking charge of this operation. That's all I'm asking. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I have not seen an amendment coming from the Honorable Senator. However, the section itself speaks to the functions of NAPA. I think it could be entertained from the, the Honorable Senator at Clause 7 when you see functions of the board. So um, 
I believe that you may be ahead in terms of um, making your suggestion at this section. Honorable Senators, the question is that close. It's six. 46. Yes, well, I am. So you, move it, so you had something else to say? Yes. All right. Well, then, honorable senators, the question is that clauses four and five now stand part of the bill. Those in favor, say aye. aye. Those against, say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses four and five now stand part of the bill. Clause six. The question is that clause six stand part of the bill. Senator Mark. Yes, Madam Chair, again, show you to my honorable friend, um, the honorable minister, that is. I would like to ask the Honourable Minister whether the government would be inclined to look at interest, interest, as a, talk about interest groups, as opposed to just experience in, and qualification engineering. That could be anybody. But when you're dealing with the national performing arts in this country, you're talking about interest groups, Tuco, Pantra and Bago. You're talking about the Band Leaders Association. Somebody mentioned NCIC. You're talking about the Dance Theater Company. So what I'm saying, Honorable Minister, through the Honorable Chair, is that if you want the stakeholders to be in charge of this operation, then the, the legislation should be amended to reflect so. Otherwise, another government come in here, may you may not be there, uh, you might know what your intentions are now. And somebody will just put cronies, right? And they may just put party hats to be here. Whereas if you deal with interest, and you talk about Pantry and Bago, you talk about Tuco, you talk about the band leaders, you talk about the theater hall performers, you talk about NCIC, then it means that they will not be responsible for nominating an individual, a professional, to sit on that board. But you, as the minister, will be issuing the instrument to that individual who is appointed by the stakeholders to run the affairs of Napa. So Mi that is what minister, I would like minister. to suggest for your consideration. Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I understand what the, the Senator is saying, um, but that is the political system that we exist in. Um, we know all too well what occurred between 2010 and 2015, and in terms of putting persons who are qualified uh, with real qualifications, not fake qualifications, and persons who have real expertise could very well be an issue. But I don't see that there necessarily need to be interest groups introduced into this bill. Those interest groups that you just spoke about are well represented on the National Carnival Commission Board and on other boards and in other organizations. Um, I believe that the sectors are, it is contemplated that they be represented here. It is a facility, an auditorium, a hotel, and otherwise, um, that treats with the performing spaces and the performing arts. So I'm very, I'm very certain that um, those persons will be represented. And in any event, the board um, is empowered to co-opt members from interest groups and from other stakeholder groups in subcommittees. Just one second, Senator Mark. Senator, Senator Mark, just one second, Senator Richards. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sri, when I apologize, if I don't know this, if this question should be reposed in, is we talking about clause six, right? Yes. If it should be reposed in clause six, seven, eight, I apologize because I'm not legally trained. Does the minister envision that these board appointees be prohibited from serving, if you're on Napa's board, on Sapa's board or Queen's Hall board? Because we have situations in the country where people sit on multiple boards, and if the intention is for these to be autonomous in their remit for Napa, Sapa, and et cetera, they should be ineligible to sit on other boards of this nature. 
Minister? It, it is not um, unlawful for a person who sits on the Napa board to sit on, on any other board. Right. Um, it may be uh, bad corporate governance practices, but it's not unlawful, uh, well, say. Through you, Madam Chair, I'm not saying it's unlawful, but I'm saying if the intention as stated by you when you piloted the act is for these bodies that govern Napa, Sapa, and Queen's Hall to operate in on their own, in terms mm -hmm. of furtherance of these three assets, there should be some in an eligibility criteria for them sitting on multiple boards because it, def it defeats the purpose of the, the entities operating independently, to me. Yeah, no, I understand, I understand exactly what you mean. Uh, um, I didn't mean to presume that you meant um, it was unlawful, but there may be a situation, for example, where you need some interrelation or you need someone from the Napa um, on the Sapa. There may be, for example, that Sapa or even Queen's Hall. I mean, there was once a time when the Queen's Hall board ran um, and managed the, the Napa Auditorium. There may be instances where there is someone on the board with a great amount of expertise who may wish to sit on both boards for a period of time to ensure that that expertise is shared. And let me just say to Madam Chair, um, what we have right now that uh, in, at the ministry is an arrangement of a committee of best practices among those government-owned performing spaces to ensure that perhaps Queen's Hall, who benefited from training in Europe and other places in terms of lighting and sound engineering and so on, they can share those experiences with the other performing spaces so that we can all rise. Finally, Madam Chair. Senator Vera, please. So I wouldn't everything. want to prohibit that. Senator Vera. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, I know that minister means cabinet. Um, I'm just registering my concern that the minister or cabinet um, selects persons who have qualifications or experience in these fields, but there is no requirement for consultation and there is no requirement for any sort of sector representation. It's whoever the minister or the cabinet feels meet these particular fields. And, and I think that that could, I, I'm just registering that as a concern, leave it at that. Senator Mark. I am not too sure if the minister is aware of modern international practices in different countries of the world, whether it's Europe, Canada, the United Kingdom, the United States. Trustees of these very important cultural institutions are made up of the stakeholders. The state, which is the government, they build buildings like Napa. But what they do is through trustees and boards of trustees, they put the stakeholders in charge of these buildings. You are continuing a line where a minister through a cabinet is going to appoint these people. And the stakeholders, the interest holders, the people who actually produce the culture, they are left out. And I'm saying that is a dangerous thing. Madam Chair, may I once again, through you, as the Honorable Minister, if you want to consider a tripartite approach, so you'll have, like, for instance, the, uh, the, the interest community. If the point, I don't think you need to elaborate any further. Um, I will allow the minister to respond. Senator Richards, you wanted to ask something? I think uh, I'm good. Thanks. Minister. Yeah. Uh, to you, Madam Chair, I, I understand um, Senator Mark's point, but that is one side of the coin. Now, when we look at the Queen's Hall model, the Queen's Hall model has the Queen's Hall model of, of, of governance and management has performed well and does not include stakeholder interest. And if you look further in the bill, the other side of the coin could very well be that there may be conflicts of interest arising where you have these stakeholder groups controlling the governance arrangements and controlling the management of the board to the exclusion of others. 
So I believe the construct that we have presented here is correct, and I would ask that you accept it. One final intervention. Are you aware that at one time a management committee in charge of Napa refused Pantrin Bego use of Napa? Do you know at one time they refused the National Chutney Association? Right. So, Senator Mark, at this stage, no, Senator Mark, at this stage, I think there has been enough discussion on the clause, and I will now put the clause to the committee. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 6 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those again say no. no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 6 now stands part of the bill. Mm -hmm. Clauses 7, 8, and 9. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clauses 7, 8, and 9 stand part of the bill. Uh, Senator may Mark. May I again to you ask my honor, honorable friend, I miss the Attorney General. I must tell you. Senator Mark, I am sure that the Attorney General will be touched that you are missing him. But can we proceed? Paul, so you cannot arrive here? Senator Mark, if you wish, you may step out of the chamber and make that call to the Attorney General. But I think, yes. Yeah. Yes. I want to take up my honorable friend's offer. Offer, honorable minister to the honorable chair, can you formulate through your legal people here a provision that will deal with maintenance under clause 7, as you promised a short while ago? We should take it up under 7, and that will be the appropriate place rather than where we were proposing. So can I ask you to assist this committee? This committee? to formulate this area. I don't know where you'll want to put it, so I'll leave that in your hands in terms of maintenance. Anyone else wants, needs to raise an issue? Minister. Madam Chair, through you, I did indicate that under, sec, under Clause 7 was the more appropriate place to place the word maintenance, but on reflection and looking closely, more closely at 7.1e, I believe that maintenance is captured there without using the specific word maintenance. And also, I do not have the benefit of Senator Mark's intention through circulated amendments. So I would um, have to decline your invitation, Senator Mark. Help. That's all we're trying to help. So if, if the minister feels that he does need our help, you know what I mean? I am very grateful for your help, Senator Mark. And if you look closely to at 7-2, clause 7-2, you would see there that it, it, it also is all-encompassing and it should catch the maintenance and security aspects. Senator Vera. I, I hear you, Minister, but... As you know, when you piloted the bill, you did indicate that because of the problems and issues concerning with maintenance and repair over the years, that is one of the fundamental reasons why we are coming with this legislation. And um, you know that sometimes as lawyers, people can take a very narrow, pedantic view of section. And so someone looking at section 7-1 says, well, where's maintenance and repair and all of this? We are uh, implied it's implied, it's not at all expressed. No. Is, I just ask, echoing Senator Mark, does it hurt making clear that we are looking to maintain, repair this billion dollar plan? Minister. Um, Madam Chair, it pains me to try and amend legislation on the fly, but I am thinking in 7-1-A, after the word operating, we can place a comma there and include, insert the word maintenance. Is it operating and maintaining? Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And that is what we get when we do it on the fly without the benefit of circulated amendment, Senator Mark. But on this one occasion, I can concede 
for operating and maintaining sorry operating comma maintaining no it would be operating comma and maintaining napa and regulating coordinating and conducting all of its activities in accordance with the provisions so what we are including and this is something that i frown upon as members know because when we try to make amendments from the floor it will lead to numerous difficulties but here we go so operating comma and maintaining, and maintaining. No, operating and maintaining so no comma no comma Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 7 be amended as follows at 7.1a by including the words and maintaining after the word operating. Those in favor say aye. Oh, well, this is lovely. Those in favor say aye. <laughs> Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 7, as amended, now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 7, as amended, now stands part of the bill. Clauses 8 and 9. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clauses 8 and 9 now stand part of the bill. Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses 8 and 9 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 8 and 9 now stand part of the bill. Clauses 10 to 12. Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses 10 to 12 stand part of the bill. Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses 10 to 12 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Clauses 10 to 12 now stand part of the bill. Clauses 13 to 15. Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses 13 to 15 stand part of the bill. The Honorable Minister, to you, in clause 14, sub, sub clause 4, the, um, Minister, you wouldn't prefer to have a number rather than say a percentage, you know, 50 percent. Uh, uh, it's a very unusual kind of clause 14 for Minister of legislation. You know, you normally say, well, look, a board is made up of X numbers. X number rather, and then the quorum shall be X, you know, rather than saying 50%. I, I, I just find a bit awkward in terms of the framing, so I just, uh, you know, you know, raise that for whatever is concerned. You know? Uh, no, Madam Chair, I'm not um, able to accept his recommendation at this time. Honorable Senator, the question, Honorable Senators, the question is, it closes 13 to 15, now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Closes 13 to 15, now stand part of the bill. Closes 16 to 18. Honorable Senator, the question is that clauses 16 to 18 stand part of the bill. Um, you, in clause 17, um, sub 1, why should a member who is conflicted, right, um, indicate within three months? No, man, if I'm conflicted, from day one, I must declare. First day. So I will give us an ease up to that person. One week. I am not going to allow somebody to sit in meetings 
for three months and then give him that time to say, I'm conflicted, I have a problem? No. Madam Chair, I would like the Honorable Minister to alter this three month period. One week is enough for you. Has anyone else has something to Senator Subas? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, in terms of 17 1, it, in terms of the disclosure of the interest, I raise the issue of the um, approved form. So if you look at 27, when it deals with the general manager having to do the same disclosure of interest, and it states that um, he has to do so, declaration in the approved form, but in terms of 17, one, there's no in the approved form. So I was just wondering whether or not we could stick it in, in 17, one, so it would read a statement declaring in the approved form whether he has any actual or contingent pecuniary interest. And also on that point, what is the approved form? Any other question or comment before I ask the minister to respond? Minister? Yes. Um, firstly, to Senator Mark, I believe in 17.1, I think the, the three-month period um, is satisfactory because once appointed, the board may not immediately meet um, but it ought to meet within the first three months of that board's appointment. So I think that is, um, is satisfactory. But even if you go on to 17.2, you will also see that any member who has an actual or contingent pecuniary interest shall, as soon as possible after the relevant facts come to his knowledge, the close in writing to the board and to the minister the nature and extent of that interest. Senate and Senator um, Sobers. Senator Sobers, I'm sorry, um, it was on the approved form. Yeah. So um, the board has the power to regulate its own affairs and to make its own rules governing um, the functioning of the board. And it is through that process that they create a statement as uh, the HGC does, bo does, HGC board does, and other um, boards do. They create um, a form where you must um, place your statement, indicate whether you have an actual or pecuniary interest, and lodge it with the, the board and with the corporate secretary. So, so that, would be the prescri that, would be the that would be what is, yeah, the, prescri the prescribed form. Amending 17.1 to state that a statement declaring in the approved form so that it would mirror that which obtains in 27.1. Yeah, uh, you see, not necessarily. Um, I think it's different from the general manager because the board itself, that declaration may come out in a board meeting. So they must make that statement and the statement must be recorded in the minutes. And I don't think it needs to be in any prescribed form in the minutes. But the general manager, of course, um, would make that in a prescribed form. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same type of declaration, but one is for the general manager who's an employee of the body, and the other one is for the board itself. Senator Mark. But the statement would be made during the board meetings, and they would have it. So a board member would say, I would like to have recorded so and so is my cousin, is my family member. Um, I have no pecuniary interest, but of course there is a conflict. That person is my mam uh, family member. Please record it in the minutes, and I will have nothing to do with the decision relative to that matter. Senator Mark. Yeah, Madam Chair, I'm just wondering in clause, um, it's clause 17 or so. I like to. Why is the minister? Yeah, Madam President, I have it now. Madam Chair, 17 sub clause, 7, clause 17 sub clause 2. The last two, the last, the second and last se sentence or line. Um, why is the minister, Honorable Minister, truly chair? Why would you want to be informed 
of whether the person has a conflict of interest or not. There is already a board appointed and the person has to report to the board. And once the person uh, um, reports to the board, uh, you get minutes and you will see the information, but to have it specifically the minister as well as the board. I was just wondering, for instance, whether that is not... Sorry, we're talking about 17.1? No, I'm talking about... 17.2. Two. Two. Yeah. You know? So I'm just asking, Honorable Minister, to the chair, your, whether it's you or the minister or somebody else, I think the board should have that responsibility, and through their minutes, they've informed the minister. But I don't see why a person who is there must declare their interest to the board and to the minister at the same time. So I, I, I don't know. I just find that. Yes, yeah, Chair, I'm on the same point. So, um, first of all, we are talking about two disclosures one to the board and one to the minister. And again, as you had said, in the normal course of things, one would make a disclosure to the board and you would proceed. But here we go, not just to the board, but to the minister as well. Mm -hmm. and to my mind, this is unnecessary, but it just underscores the level of ministerial slash government control of this board. And I, I don't know if that is not a little unhealthy and if not overkill. If the board wants to disclose it to the minister, that's fine. But I just find that two disclosures is a little bit much there. Um, I, I don't see that it's two disclosures. I mean, it must be first disclosed to the board and it must be recorded in the minutes and then it is reported to the minister. Where the minister, um, where the cabinet through the minister appoints these board members, I think it is appropriate um, corporate governance practice for the minister to know and understand um, those persons on the board who have some sort of actual or pecuniary interest or any conflict thereof. Uh, it, it may very well be for the minister to determine that, okay, this person may have been a bad pick, um, they're too conflicted, and it, it, it may cause um, for, the, for the removal of that person. But I think the minister is the person who is ultimately responsible. When Senator Mark comes into this parliament in a different proceeding, you call upon the minister to answer. So I believe that the minister, and I believe it's appropriate that the minister be aware of these conflicts of, of interest as they arise. The minister, why don't you incorporate the parliament? In other words, make the parliament your protection. Make the parliament your protection. Minister, Minister. And Madam President, the, the Parliament is involved, lower down. We will see that administrative reports must be laid in Parliament. So, <laughs> so Honourable Senators, the question is, the clauses 16 to 18 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Seriously, those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 16 to 18 now stand part of the bill. Clause 19. The question is that clause 19 stand part of the bill. The question is that clause 19 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 19 now stands part of the bill. Clauses 20 to 27. The question is that clauses 20 to 27 stand part of the bill. But, Madam Chair, may, may, may I just indicate to you that I have no problem with clause 20, although I believe that the minister, again, should not be involved in these things in terms of the, uh, approving the appointment of the general manager. But, you know, reluctantly I would go along. But when it comes to 21, I don't understand what role the minister is playing in this matter. Because, Madam Chair, as you know, 
Well, if, let's let's just ask the minister because sorry, it's, you sure, but but yes. What I mean, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, there is something called the statutory authority service commissions. When it comes to the appointment of persons to statutory boards, there is an independent commission that does that. This clause 21 is undermining the independence of the statutory authority service commission. So the minister is bringing legislation in order to take away the power of the SASC and give him the approval to the board to appoint these people in terms of their terms and conditions and so on. And I find this to be quite you know, troubling, Madam Chair. How can we undermine an independent commission, which is called the statutory authority? Madam Chair, if I got it right, we are told by the minister, this is a statutory board. Right. And if it's a statutory board, and you're Senate, appointing people Senator to Mark. Work, yes. Yes, Senator Mark, you know, we are dealing, we are in committee stage. And one would expect that interventions are made in a very precise manner. So there's no need to repeat what you're saying. I think the minister gets it. I have heard what you had to say. Before I ask the minister to respond, Senator Vera, you wanted to say something? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to register my disagreement with that last part of the sentence, subject to the approval of the minister. You have a competent board. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now they're looking to employ people. This is not just a veto power. After you go through all of the recruitment exercise, you, 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 you line up your people, you now positively need to get the approval of the minister. I think that's just too much ministerial control. Let the board do the employment and take it from there. Minister. May I start with Senator Vera first? Sure. Um, to you, Madam Chair, that is what um, ministerial oversight, that is what government accountability, transparency, and all those buzzwords that routinely come out of Senator Mark's mouth is about. Now, let me please explain um, how it works in practice. The organization is designed either through the ministry, through a consultant with the assistance of the CPO. It is provided to a cabinet in the form of a cabinet note and cabinet approves the organization. The positions then go to the subcommittee. Each position, all the job descriptions, etc. they go to a subcommittee of the cabinet called the Human Resources Advisory Committee. As a part of that committee, the CPO is heavily involved. The CPO gives its advice with respect to each position on the organizational chart according to the organizational design, according to the job descriptions. And then it is approved by the cabinet. So it is not the minister, but it has to have oversight because what you don't want, and we have seen this before, you don't want where a board with a chairman who may be very powerful um, actually or otherwise, giving someone, some friend or family member, a job and paying that person way over the standard um, remuneration for that position. So there must be oversight. With respect to Senator Mark's point about the Statutory Authority Service Commission. Senator Mark knows that the Statutory Authority Service Commissions, the number of statutory authorities that they have responsibility for is circumscribed in the schedule to that act. And this is not one of them. Minister, so someone is looking to hire a manager, a secretary, a lights operator. This requires cabinet vetting and approval. I, I, I just find that that is just 
overkill. No. It is too much. And, 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 and in any event, as, as you no. pointed out earlier, they would have had to make a declaration, they would have had to disclose the conflict of interest regarding this potential employee. It's just too much ministerial control. No, what cabinet approves, cabinet approves the position and the terms and conditions attached to each position. It's not the person, it is the position. Once that is approved, then from henceforth, until the remuneration arrangements change. That's not what this section says. May employ such persons. Yes, but well, the persons have to go into the positions. But in terms of the last line that you object to, subject to the approval of the minister on such terms and conditions, the terms and conditions are attached to the position on the organizational um, structure. And those persons. Sorry? And those persons are subject to the approval of the minister. The people, the idea that the minister has to approve the persons, not the positions. No, no, it's the terms and conditions. Terms and conditions as are agreed upon between Napa and those persons subject to the. Yeah, no, it's between the terms and conditions that are agreed upon between Napa and the persons. Subject to the, so it's between Napa and the persons, but the persons are not approved by the minister. And if we try to put in commas inside of there, it may con confuse the thing a little more, but it's between the terms and conditions as are agreed between Napa and the persons, because the, agree the employment agreement have to be, has to be between the person and the organization, the Napa, subject to the approval of the minister. It's the terms and conditions that the minister approves. Senator Lachmidial. Sorry, Madam President, may I suggest through you that we split that section then to make that very clear because I think it is vague and I think that it should be that SAPA may employ the persons. Um, Napa. Sorry, Napa may employ the persons um, for, and so on and so on. And then a separate, uh, like a clause B, um, the terms and conditions of employment subject to the, should be approved by the minister that would make it clear what the minister is saying, because I don't think it reads clearly the way it is. And if I if you read section 22, it gives you the impression that it is the person, because on such terms and conditions as are agreed between Napa and the person. So. Yeah, um, I, my, sorry, Madam Chair, I, I, I wouldn't accept it. I mean, this, this section is a, is, a, is a construct that has been in other statutory um, bodies and other in other acts, and um, I mean I, I read it clearly, so I I, I, I don't accept the um, suggestions. Uh, so that is the response of the minister uh, with respect to clause twenty one. Are you raising another clause, Senator Mark? Sure. Are you on 22? Well, you are, so no, let's... No, no, when I say so, they cover it? Yes, yes, yes. we're dealing with clauses again, 20 to 27. Again, again, Madam Chair, clause 22. Um, the minister looms large and in charge. Now, the question here is, is the minister undermining the role of the procurement regulator? Because we are talking about contracts here for services, and we know that there is a law that deals with procurement. Now we are being told by this minister, through this amendment, that the minister will determine this. Now, Madam Chair, one would have thought that the minister, as a leading, act, um, as a leading light in the cabinet, would be aware of procurement. And therefore, instead of putting his name here, or his office, I should say. That should be under the procurement, the procurement regulator. Minister. Yeah, Madam Chair, um, the, only, um, the only interaction here, or the only, or the only, the only involvement here with the minister is that the minister would set a maximum limit of remuneration, and that is it. And this is where the board determines, for example, what we spoke about in the debate, that 
the board may require some sort of IP assistance from an IP expert, or the board may require um, some forensic auditor, or some other specific task, the board may arrange and agree with that person contract for services for those specific tasks, but subject, of course, to the maximum remuneration as the minister determines. Just the maximum. Any other questions or comments? Honorable Senators, the question. I am now going to put, I'm going to put, Senator Mark, it is up to you. I have put clauses 20 to 27. Yes. But Senator Mark, you should know where we have stopped because you are raising the issues. Okay, so Senator Mark, we are now, we have finished. Questions have been raised about clause 22. Are there any other issues to be raised in respect of clauses 23 to 27? Yes, ma'am. Could, could you tell me which clause, please? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Yes, hold on, ma'am. I know that we have it, you know, you know, you know how things are going, right? Um, let's go to clause 25, ma'am. Yes. And let's go to subsection 2 of, of 25, that is clause. Yes. Where you see the word negative, Madam, yes. Chair, yes. may I ask the Minister to consider affirmative so that at least you give the Parliament a role. Everything is under the Minister control. Everything is under the Cabinet control. Well, for heaven's sake, there is a Parliament. <laughs> there is a Parliament. So I am suggesting that we delete negative and replace it with affirmative so at least the Parliament will have a role. Do not relegate the Parliament. Um, Madam Chair, being a, a very bright light and a very experienced member in this Parliament, I know such contentious matters, if they are indeed contentious, would be picked up by Senator Mark and, um, and a motion would be, be triggered. The, the so I, I don't see that we should trouble the Parliament with any affirmative re resolution for this matter. So, Senator Mark, I think the Minister has responded. So, we move on. Any other questions? Close 26 and close 27. One of the Senators, the question is that clauses 20 to 27 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 20 to 27 now stand part of the bill. Clauses 28 to 31. Honourable Senators, the question is that clauses 28 to 31 stand part of the bill. <coughs> 31, Senator Mark. Yes, check in on this. Honourable Senators, the question is that clauses 28 to 31 now stand part of the bill. Those in favour say aye. Those against say no. Those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 28 to 31 now stand part of the bill. Clauses 32 to 36. The question is, the clauses 32 to 36 stand part of the bill. Yes. Um, subsection 2B, mm -hmm. um, shall they 
shall be laid rather in Parliament as soon as possible thereafter. That is very vague and, you know, non-specific. So to be very specific, Madam Chair, I am proposing that shall be laid in Parliament within one month. Minister. One second. So we have a frame for it rather than leaving it open as soon as possible. That, that could mean anything, Madam Chair. It could mean next year. I think, yeah. the, I think the minister understands what you have said. Yeah, so, so if you can get a specific time frame. And yeah. I think they must be guided by the Queen. So Se Senator Mark, I think the minister has yeah. understood okay, your you. point and he is going to respond now. Minister. Yeah, um, I, I do understand Senator Mark's point. In fact, um, I think even in 2022, we are still um, getting reports and administrative reports from entities during the, the years of 2011 and 2012. Um, but there are, um, Madam Chair, there are, there are issues that may arise in some of these financial statements. Um, they may be referred to the Auditor General, they may be referred to Central Audit. Um, even at, at the, the level of the cabinet, there is a specific subcommittee of the, part, the, the cabinet that treats with these administrative reports and financial reports. So I would not want to prescribe a time. Um, I think it's uh, as soon as possible thereafter. Um, I believe that the joint select committees of the, the parliament. Um, he hasn't finished, Senator yeah. Mark. Please, Senator Mark, yeah. I think the joint select committees of the parliament um, um, would, would, would take notice if there is any matter outstanding or if they wish to call anyone before them um, to lay before them any financial statement or anything like that. Senator Mark. I want to tell the minister very yeah. definitively, we are not asking for favors. We demand certain answers. Madam Chair, may I say, there's a distinction between an administrative report and a financial report that is audited by the Auditor General. There is no if and buts about the Auditor General or somebody appointed by the Auditor General to do the accounts of that particular body we are being told by the minister that it may go to cabinet, the cabinet have a subcommittee, and the Auditor General report has to be sent. This is not an administrative report. So, Madam, Pres Madam Chair, I'm insisting that a time frame be given. Once the Auditor General submits that report to the particular entity and it goes to the minister, the minister cannot go and play games with that report. That report is stamped by the Auditor General. All we are saying is say, as soon as possible, within one month. That's all we ask. Minister. Yeah, Madam Chair, this, this has nothing to do with the Auditor General. Um, but if you look at the section, Senator Mark, 33.2a, you would see that it contains a report on the activities of NAPA and financial statements prepared. A copy of such report and financial statements shall be forwarded to the minister and shall be laid in parliament as soon as possible thereafter. I don't see anything wrong with that construct. In fact, this government has been laying reports. Senator Mark, Senator Mark, S Senator Mark. I have Senator Mark. I want the Attorney General Senator Mark. Well, I wonder if you are, because, you know, you've been pleading for the Attorney General. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I apologize okay. to my dear President, who we fought together in point of fear. Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses 32 to 36 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 32 to 36 now stand part of the bill. Please. 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 Please.
Clauses 37 to 40. Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses 37 to 40 stand part of the bill. Madam Chair, may I receive your indulgence? Yes. Clause 38. <coughs> yes. May I ask you to just put an amendment after the word rules subject to an affirmative resolution of the Parliament? We need to know what's going on under the watch of the Minister. Minister. Because we have to protect you. Minister. Madam Chair, through you, um, I, I cannot accept his, um, his suggestion. Honorable, Senate, Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses 37 to 40. Madam Chair. Excuse me, Madam Chair. Yes, Senator. May I make Bridges? a suggestion with respect to clause 38? Yes. Um, I'm thinking that could we include, whether we should include after NAPA, including rules for child protection and change or to and any other, any other um, area. Minister. Um, Chairman, I, I, I hear um, the Honorable Senator's suggestion. I know that she's extremely passionate where child protection is concerned, but there are laws in Trinidad and Tobago that sufficiently deal with child protection, and um, for those reasons, I cannot accept the suggestion. Senator Vera. Just to confirm for the record, in clause 39, the phrase in relation to the National Academy for the Performing Arts, that encompasses not just the Kitchener Auditorium, but the Academy, the hotel, the whole Kabul. Yes. All the property. <coughs> Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses 37 to 40 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 37 to 40 now stand part of the bill. Honorable Senators, the question is that the bill as amended be now reported to the Senate. Those in favor say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The bill as amended will now be reported to the Senate. Senator Mark. No. Minister of Tourism, Culture, and the Arts. Madam President, I beg to move that a bill entitled an no, act... No, you have to report something to first. I am. Um, I apologize. I apologize, Madam President. Madam President, I wish to report that the National Academy for the Performing Arts Bill 2022 was considered in Committee of the Whole and approved with amendments, I now beg to move that the Senate agree with the committee's report. The question is that this Senate agree with the committee's report on the National Academy for the Performing Arts Bill 2022. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister of Tourism, Culture and the Arts. Madam President, I beg to move that a bill entitled an act to provide for the establishment of the National Academy for the Performing Arts and for the management and control thereof and for related matters be now read a third time and passed. Honorable Senators, the question is that a bill entitled an act to provide for the establishment of the National Academy for the Performing Arts and for the management and control thereof and for related matters be now read a third time and passed. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. A bill entitled An Act to Provide for the Establishment of the National Academy for the Performing Arts and for the Management and Control Thereof and for Related Matters. 
Minister of Tourism, Culture and the Arts. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I beg to move that a bill entitled... Sorry. Madam President, are we on bill number three? Yeah? Okay. Madam President, I beg to move that a bill entitled an act to provide for the establishment of the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts and for the management and control thereof and for related matters be now read a second time. Madam President, as you know, and as honorable senators in this honorable chamber know, the bill entitled the Sapper Bill is an exact replica of the Napa Bill that was just read a third time and passed. And Madam President, like the Napa situation, or rather the situation with the National Academy for the Performing Arts, there are similar inefficiencies and issues that have all also plagued SAPA. Madam President, the background into SAPA and the genesis into the Academy for the Performing Arts South is almost identical to that of the National Academy for the Performing Arts in Port of Spain. And it too is traced back to 1988 and to the NAR government. And in 2007, like Napa, Sapa was started in San Fernando and the estimated cost was $250 million for construction works funded via the same concessional loan that funded Napa while the design and ancillary cost were also funded through the IDF. Similarly, Madam President, the construction of SAPA was in complete alignment with the Vision 2020 strategic plan of that government. The estimated cost of construction, however, increased during that construction there was a variation, and that variation and the increase in cost was due to major works regarding the redirection of a sewer line, which delayed the project by approximately 18 months. And therefore, SAPA was opened three years following the completion and opening and commissioning of NAPA. SAPA is modeled after a G clef, and Napa is modeled after our Shaconia flower. But Sapa is modeled after a G clef inspired design and is our southern cultural flagship facility, me being a San Fernando boy. The 110,000 square foot complex boasts of two practice halls a 730-seat auditorium of international acoustic standard, and it's affectionately named after the Barakpur-born chutney artist Sundarlal Popo, Bahora, or more popularly known as Sundar Popo. In recognition of his lasting contribution to his contributions to culture, SAPA is also endowed with teaching facilities and advanced audiovisual equipment. This blue rib ribbon wonder also possesses certain unique spaces, including the little theater, the VIP reception area and exhibition hall, and a dance studio. Unlike SAPA, unlike Napa rather, Madam President, SAPA The management and operational arrangements for SAPA was under 
the Ministry of Arts and Multiculturalism through a management committee. However, the difference being that as soon as SAPA was commissioned, UDICOT entered into an arrangement, a facilities management arrangement with SAPA and has been the facilities manager of SAPA since it was opened. So SAPA did not have the indignity as its brother performance space, its brother facility in Napa of being shut down for a number of years due to poor maintenance issues. SAPA also had entered into uh, an MOU with the Ministry of Tertiary Skills for the operation of the academy. And as we know, there is no hotel facility at SAPA. SAPA as well, as indicated before, um, is constrained by similar ineffective management arrangements and slow decision making. And of course, like Napa, with SAPA, the solution of this government is the creation of a body corporate into a legal entity for faster decision making and more enhanced strategic planning. Madam President, again, the bills are exact replicas of each other. Part one sets out the preliminary matters. Part two sets out um, the crux of the bill and is a mirror of the Napa bill, so I wouldn't go into that at all. Madam President, part Clauses 14 and 15, again, provide for the meetings and the minutes of the board. Um, clause, fifth, clause 15, it is the responsibility of the corporate secretary. I mean, Madam President, I know that, you know, it's prudent for me to put a lot of these matters on the record uh, since we are dealing with another bill. Um, however, Madam President, Madam President, I think we have very much traversed the entirety of the bill. It is an exact replica, but I believe, and in concluding, the creation of SAPA into a body corporate would do well and would enhance the creative sectors in the south of the island. It would complement the Napa Rima Bowl. Just like Napa, SAPA has a number of areas that are underutilized. In fact, when I became minister, I went into the dance studio and I was told by the persons who manage SAPA that it had never been used, ever, by a dance company. There are a number of spaces within SAPA that have simply not been utilized. The space is underutilized. And with the creation of this bill, the creation of this, these provisions, Madam President, um, I think that it would do well for the creative economy. And with those few words, Madam President, I beg to move. Honorable Senators, I shall now propose the question for debate. The question is that a bill entitled, An Act to Provide for the Establishment of the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts and for the Management and Control Thereof and for Related Matters be now read a second time. Senator Lakshmi Diyal. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. I don't know if it's a, a case of stereotyping, but on my bench, they assume that I would want to talk about Sapa and not Napa. And, um, you know, as a San Fernandian as well, I, I, I'm sure the Honorable Minister would not disagree with me when I say that culture and the arts in San Fernando is certainly um, very important to us. And... Um, I might be biased, but I think we are in a class of our own. Sorry, thanks. <laughs> and, um, you know, San Fernando has been a city that we have excelled and we have produced some of the greatest um, musicians and we have our own feeling when it comes to carnival. And it's, it's really um, 
something that over the years I've noticed that with when it comes to culture, art, sports, and all of that, we are always like, I say, the semi-final city. And I'm happy to see that facilities in San Fernando would be treated in the same way that facilities in ports of Spain are being treated in terms of management and so on, to the point that it's literally identical. Um, but one of the things that I hope to be accomplished by having a board that would run a facility such as SAPA is that we would have equality in the way that culture and the arts are promoted throughout the country. Because you always find that, as I said, we call, I call it the semi-final city. The semi-finals, we have Calypso Fiesta in San Fernando, but the finals are in Port of Spain. We have, we have um, so many things that take place. I remember going to school. Some of my fondest memories, actually, are linked to the Naprima Bowl, where we would have music festival and sand fest and all of these things that I attended. Um, and, and we always had to come to Port of Spain, to Queen's Hall, for the finals of everything, as opposed to having it in San Fernando. So with the establishment of this board and the running of this facility in San Fernando, I would really hope to see more promotion and more um, equality in, in how we promote the arts and culture throughout our country. Because they, as I say, I know we better in San Fernando, but I don't think there's any difference in how our culture should be portrayed and marketed and so on throughout our country. So that being said, though, I have to say that because these bills are identical, it leaves me a little bit confused when we look at the functions of this board called SAPA, which is to manage the facility called SAPA. And... It talks about one of its functions to provide state-of-the-art facilities for the culture and arts in Trinidad and Tobago. So the role of this board is not really to be confined to San Fernando. It, it, it seems to encompass a wider function. And this is why, as was raised before, and I do not want to get into the whole argument again and be repetitive, but this is why we, we are wondering why one body that manages all of our performance spaces in Trinidad and Tobago would not be a better idea. Because you know what? You could have one proper strategic plan for the promotion of arts and culture in Trinidad and Tobago. You may have a board in Napa that has a particular direction that they want to take with respect to the performance arts, and you would have a board in called SAPA, and so that have different ideas and by managing things differently. The minister just said that SAPA had an arrangement for facilities management with UTT that NAPA didn't have, so it didn't have to suffer that indignity and so on. Well, again, do we want to have in this one, well, two little tiny islands, different boards managing our performance spaces and being, you know, um, just out of, out of line with each other? Or do we want to have a body? If we're going to have a board and we want to have the expertise that we've spoken about here, from intellectual property to marketing to law to all of that, all together, don't we really think that it would be better to have one body that could engage with our stakeholders, TUCO and NCC and Pantry and Bago and National Chutney Foundation and everybody, so that they could all have one holistic approach to the promotion of arts and culture in Trinidad and Tobago. So that's my first thing. I, I really feel that I have to reiterate the point that one board would be better off. The Naprima Bowl Act is in existence. I, the minister said, you know, it's, it's older legislation, like um, the Queen's, Queen's Hall legislation as well. But those pieces of legislation deal specifically with those properties. So you have four boards, four pieces of legislation, slightly different wording here and there, dealing with four different performance spaces. And I was wondering if we were here creating board for the sake of creating board because that's what it seemed like. And then I heard the minister speaking about why it was necessary to, to incorporate these bodies and put the management of these facilities. And the minister is speaking about the fact that it takes two weeks for a document to move from our somebody's out box to somebody's inbox. And I've worked in the public service for nine years and I don't disagree with him. But to say that we need to create bodies and boards and incorporate them for the sake of getting around inefficiencies in the public service, I find that to be unacceptable. Um, there must be a greater um, thrust towards improving efficiencies. And as somebody pointed out, we started off the day here a long time ago talking about 
disbanding our board and bringing the management of a particular sector in-house. So I am a little bit lost. I don't know if one ministry is running. I don't know if in agriculture is only take a day from the outbox to the inbox as opposed to two weeks in tourism. But I, you know, what is the policy of this government? Is it that we want to leave the management of certain specialized functions and so on to these appointed boards? Or do we want to have greater control from our ministries? Now, I have always had a bit of a challenge with these boards because they, the accountability that is simply not there. Ministries are inefficient. I know that. But if five cents goes missing from a ministry, somebody usually is able to account for it. And one of the challenges, again, that came up in the debate on the last bill, when the minister talked about the old style of drafting, and I mentioned that the way that these bills are drafted, the powers are so wide and so broad and subject to some interpretation and all of that. Those things, some of that contributes to the fact that we have a problem with corruption and transparency when it comes to state boards. And that's not a secret. Special purpose companies in Trinidad and Tobago have been seen as vehicles for um, corruption, regardless of which administration. So we've had those issues. And that is why more precise language, and I know if we have to go back into committee stage, and I don't want to rehash all of the same comments that were made, but it may very well be that we want to see more tight language with respect to the functions, with respect to the role of the minister, with respect to how much accountability there is to the parliament. And again, we have to, um, we have to, to say that. Now, SAPA, when it's under the partnership administration, because that's when it was opened due to the delays, um, that occurred. One of the things that came about um, at the time when it was open at, that the then minister said is that, you know, it was unfortunate that Naprima Bowl had been suffering and needed a lot of money spent on it to upgrade. And instead of that, there was a, the, the decision taken to build SAPA and Naprima Bowl had been somewhat neglected. And again, to me, that illustrates the point of why one entity to manage our cultural spaces would be a good idea. Because what is the sense? We have a problem in this country with building new things and not maintaining the things that exist. And that is exactly what has happened in the city of San Fernando with Sapa and Naprima Bowl. Some upgrades were subsequently done to Naprima Bowl, I recall. But the bowl, and, and I know this is not about the bowl, but the bowl is one of the few spaces where you have an outdoor amphitheater, Shakespearean style. And it is something that really, if you had one board managing our performance spaces, you could utilize them in a way that it would be more efficient. So under the partnership administration at SAPA, and I don't know if it still exists, but I recall that they established with the assistance of UTT, um, something called the Ramlila Institute and a PAN Institute. So they try to make a really um, good use of SAPA as a teaching facility and to promote that sort of, um, that sort of uh, um, thrust and education. And it was meant to be part of, together with the Debe campus of UWE, to have a sort of an education city coming up between San Fernando and Debe, which became you know, very well connected with the construction of the highway and so on. Of course, many of those things have not come to pass for, well, circumstances we're all aware of. When you... When things, um, sorry, I was going to say that, um, yes, one of the issues and one of the things that come about when you um, start opening these facilities that are built and so on, and one of the things that I recall very clearly when Napa was opened and we had a lot of pushback from the public about it was the lack of consultation. And one of the things that people voiced concern about at that point in time, of course, the thing is already constructed, was the lack of a really good outdoor performance space at Napa. Because our culture, and somebody's mentioned it here today, our culture with soca and chutney and carnival and outside, um, all those things, you, you really do enjoy the outdoor space. So I've seen Napa now and the, the grounds being used a little more for outdoor events, but there was really no outdoor performance space. And um, again, when you have the management of our facilities being under one institute, you can actually create and leverage the assets that you have. Saying that there are billions of dollars in assets and we are putting it under separate boards, to me, doesn't really justify it. And I think that was one of the, the, the points that was mentioned by the Honorable Minister. Um, we have state, state 
bodies that manage billions and billions of, of, of dollars in assets, and I don't see that it's a problem. Having one robust entity, as I said before, you leverage the strengths of all our different um, all of our different spaces. Now, moving on quickly, I want to raise one thing again that came about, because as I said, everything else has been said about the, the Napa bill. We, I've noticed in the financial provisions that the funds of this board will not just, of this entity, will not just consist of the appropriations and their fees and so on, but they have the power to receive grants, covenants, and donations, and other receipts from persons, including national and international bodies. When I read this, what jumped into my mind is the recently enacted Nonprofit Organizations Act, because the reason why we have an NPO Act in Trinidad and Tobago is to deal with the issue of money laundering through NGOs, um, because NGOs receive donations, and they can do fundraising, and they get tax exemptions, and so on. As a state board, I am um, assuming there would be no, um, we have to look at reporting as standards to be um, put in place for a body like this that could receive national and international donations because you could actually run the risk of an entity being used to loan the money, a state entity. I will never forget at my time in another place when I was told of a scheme where someone would pay their electricity bill for a lot of money. And what they would do is they would go to the counter and say that um, they forgot their bill at home, but they know the account number, but they would give one digit off and they would pay their electricity bill with a lot of cash. And of course, our utility companies receive cash. And so they would take the cash. And then the person would go and file a claim saying my money was applied to the wrong account and they would give the correct account, but they would ask for a refund and it would be cut a check and they would take that check to the bank. And this person was literally laundering money through Tiantec. And I, I remember that as a case scenario that had been put out there. So to say, to think that our state bodies and our state boards are not susceptible to money laundering, and if the thrust of this government, as they have said over and over and over, is to tackle money laundering and to ensure that no institution can be susceptible to it, I think that more consideration has to be given when you're establishing a state board when they could receive um, donations and covenants and grants from national and international bodies because you are basically creating an entity that could be abused for the purposes of money laundering. And I'm almost certain that it is um, something that the the government would want to look at a little bit more. Um, Madam President, in closing, I just want to say that our artists have suffered tremendously during the time of, um, of the COVID pandemic. And private sector entities have actually led the charge in terms of coming up with ways to have virtual concerts and many things virtually to allow artists to earn money. I think this year we are still having virtual Chutney Soka Monarch. Um, I, I read about it recently and, and other things. And if it is that the government is still taking a position of being responsible for policy and being responsible for the direction and so on, and the board really here is for management, and, but they have certain powers, greater thought and time and effort has to be put into coming up with alternative ways because as this pandemic has taught us, it is just not business as usual. Um, and so vesting the property and ensuring that the property is managed by a board um, really will not solve the problem of us not having direction and not having strategy and not having a plan when it comes to really marketing what is I think the greatest culture in the world because I have been to over maybe 30 countries in this world and I've never seen a culture as unique and as blended and as magnificent as ours if it only gets the attention that it deserves it could be so much more spectacular and so with those few words madam president as i said i reiterate some of the concerns raised by um honorable members with respect to the the sister legislation that was brought here today and i look forward to having further discussion with the minister at committee stage thank you senator mark
Thank you, Madam President. Yeah, Madam President, I won't be long. I just wanted to raise a few points on this bill dealing with the establishment of the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts and for the management and control thereof and for other related matters. Now, Madam President, we know that the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts was formally open sometime in September of 2012, and it was for the development of the performing arts um, education, arts education, and the culture, the nation's vibrant culture, as stated in a report that I have before me. Now, we all recognize, Madam President, that this body has an, a seat in accommodation, according to the notes I have before me, of 772 persons. Now, we just completed Napa with uh, audience space, seating accommodation, that is, of close to just over 1,200, maybe a max of 1,300 seats. And what is interesting, Madam Chair, Madam President, is that even though there are differences in terms of the accommodation for seating arrangement at the venues that I've mentioned, when it comes to this particular academy, we notice the same structure being identified. Now, we would have liked, Madam President, in dealing with the Southern Academy to have been provided with information on its operations, its activities. We know it opened sometime in 2012. So it has been in operation for close to about 20, about eight to 10 years. And Madam President, I searched, I sought the support of the librarian in our parliament to access any administrative reports that would give us an appreciation of what the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts did in the last six years in particular, because the last report I have with me is for 2014-2015. And although this government took office in August of 2015, Madam President, six years, this is going to be the seventh year, but six years, not one administrative report has been produced. So we have no way of knowing as we seek to debate this bill, what has SAPA done under the PNM for the last six years? The library has no administrative reports that I can reference to say exactly, well, look, Madam President, as we deal with this bill, I can tell you that this particular facility has been in full use and the report so identifies same. What they have done, what they have not done, how much revenue they have earned, how much losses they have experienced, nothing. So we have no information whatsoever. What was the government doing during that five-year period? 
that it could not have produced these reports. But Madam President, I say this to bring to your attention the fact that we don't have the evidence to show anything surrounding this Southern Academy for the period 2015 to 2021. So therefore, I have to deal with what is before me. And in this regard, I would like the Honorable Minister, when he's winding up, to indicate to us why there are not any transitional clauses in this bill. Meaning, Madam Chair, Madam President, we know that there are workers on a permanent basis and on a contractual basis currently employed at the Southern Academy. I don't know if the, <clears throat> um, I beg your pardon. Maybe the minister can tell us, Madam Chair, Madam President rather, how many employees, because I am dealing with part three, staff and advisors of SAPA under clauses 20 to maybe about 30, I think, Madam Chair, Madam President. I would like the Honorable Minister to tell us what is the staff complement at this particular facility? And why, if there are personnel under the technical and managerial structure, included administration, along with contract staff, with along with volunteer, volunteers, for, like ushers, Madam Chair, Madam President. Why it is there's no provision in the legislation before us dealing with transitional clauses to deal with those workers? Is it the government going to have a new start is it, Madam President, that there will only be, the government is seeking to bring new employees on board? We don't know because we have no evidence before us. And that is why, Madam President, I am raising this matter of staff and advisors under the Southern Academy in part three of the legislation. And I hope that the Honorable Minister could provide us with some answers. Because we need to know what has happened to the staff of SAPA. No, Madam President, when we go to clause 23 of this piece of legislation, we have provisions where persons who may want to work at SAPA, they are telling you in clause 23 how you should go about that process. And they are also indicating in clause 23, subsection 2, that they will also address the preservation of the rights of the officers so transferred to any pension, gratuity, or other allowance for which he would have been eligible at the time, Madam President. However, in subclause three, it says, and I quote, a period of second month shall not in any case exceed three years. Why three years? Why three years? Why not five years? Why not 10 years? The minister needs to explain to us why this number came into existence. Because there are other pieces of legislation with similar provisions where persons are given up to 10 years to make that decision. In the case of this piece of legislation, we are being told only three years and it should not exceed three years. 
Why? So I would like the minister to clear the air for us on this matter. Madam President, on the, on the question of pension, I think it's important for us to pay attention to the issue of pensions for staff members. So we go to clause 26 of this bill before us, and it says that the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts shall establish a pension fund plan, or where the establishment of a plan is not feasible, join an existing plan. Now again, Madam President, this supper is a, is a relatively small operation. We don't know how large is the staff complement, but we do know that their venue and their seating accommodation it is about 772 persons. Now, Madam President, when we are told in Clause 26.1 that the government is going to establish a pension plan in SAPA, and if that is not feasible, they're going to join an existing plan. plan. Now, again, Madam President, can the minister explain and clarify what he means by this? Is it feasible, is it practical to have a pension plan for these employees in, engaged at SAPA? And when he says he's, if that is not feasible, they are going to join an existing plan. Could, again, the minister explain to the Senate what existing plan is the minister referring to? Can the minister provide us with examples of those existing plans, pension plans, that workers would be able to access in the instance of them joining, Madam President, um, this pension plan? Because in his brief statement earlier, no information was provided on this matter. So where workers' interests, workers' rights are concerned, it is important and incumbent upon the minister to provide clarity and certainty as it relates to their rights, to their benefits, and their entitlement. So, Madam Chair, again, Madam President, rather, if you go to, to, to clause 26 of the bill, you will see there are several scenarios surrounding superannuation benefits and exactly who will pay and who will not pay. Again, because we didn't spend sufficient time on that matter, we need the minister to clear the air on these matters. There's one in subsection 5, that is clause 26, subsection 5, where it states, and I quote that, where there's a difference between the superannuation benefits payable on the basis of the higher salary and the superannuation benefits payable under the relevant pension law on the basis of the pay, then pensionable emoluments or salary shall be paid by SAPA. Now again, we need to get from the minister exactly whether this situation is intended to arise and whether SAPA would be in a position to honor these commitments as outlined in the legislation, Madam President. So these are some issues that I felt we needed to clarify with the Honorable Minister 
so that when it comes to pension rights, superannuation benefits for the employees of this SAPA, the minister must tell us exactly how is it going to work. So, Madam President, I want the minister to clarify for this Senate the following before I close. How many permanent staff do we have at the Southern Academy? And give us a breakdown of the categories. Technical, managerial, administrative. How many? We also want, we also would like to know from the minister, how many workers are there on contract at the Southern Academy at this time? And, Madam President, how many workers are operating on a voluntary basis, receiving some stipend here and there to facilitate any activities at Napa, at, at Sapa, rather. We need to get that information from the Honorable Minister. And finally, Madam President, can the Minister provide this Honorable Senate with the reasons why there is no transitional provisions in this piece of legislation to accommodate the existing staffers at the Southern Academy? Or is it the intention of the minister and his government to retrench and dismiss and fire all of these workers? We don't know because there are no tra transitional provisions. So we want these things clear up on behalf of those workers at the academy and on behalf of our own um, records here at the parliament, Madam President. With these few words, Madam President, I thank you very much. Minister of Tourism, Culture and the Arts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, and I thank honorable senators for their contributions on this SAPA bill, an act to provide for the establishment of the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts and for management and control thereof and for related matters. Um, Madam President, I am looking at section, or rather clause 24, clause 24 to clause 26, treat with transitional arrangements, and that is the first point. The second point, I'd answer Senator Mark in saying that there are 23 employees at SAPA. The positions are general manager, business operations assistant to, technical coordinator, stage manager, front of the house manager, bookings and promotions coordinator, theater technician, senior lighting, theater technician, senior audio technician, five theater technicians, stage technicians, four lighting technicians, two and seven audio technicians for a total of 23 employees of SAPA. These employees are on contract. They're also temporary employees in the form of ushers, and they number 28. So they are contract employees. With respect to any additional functions at the SAPA, they are assisted by the project's unit and other units of the ministry in their administrative procedures. Mm -hmm. 
Madam President, Senator Mark stated in his speech, in his presentation just now, that he went to the li li librarian, I think is what he meant, and he was told that there are no administrative reports that treat from 2015 to 2021. But Madam President, as, as we all know, if you enter the wrong search criteria into Google, Google will return the, the answer that you're not looking for. And if you had listened to my presentation on this matter, as well as on the previous matter, somewhere in there you would understand that SAPA and NAPA are parts of the ministry. With respect to administrative reports, under our present governance arrangements, ministries, state enterprises, statutory bodies are, among others, are required to report. SAPA and NAPA prior to the passage and proclamation of these bills must fall into one. They're not a statutory body, either SAPA nor NAPA. They're not a state enterprise. So what you would have to look for on your return to the library would be the administrative reports for the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts. And in those administrative reports, you would see all that you're looking for. So, Madam President, I dealt with that. Um, with respect to the superannuation, no, not the superannuation, with respect to the secondment, uh, Senator Mark asked why three years and not five? The answer to that is three years is standard in the public service. It is standard practice. It is a standard position. It is three years. Um, the person transferred, the public servant, is expected to go on second secondment to either learn or to provide learning wherever he is seconded to, but he is also expected to return to provide the services of employment according to his terms and conditions and engagement. With respect to the superannuation and the pension plan and so on, Madam President, Section 26 gives SAPA the flexibility and the freedom to either provide a pension fund, a pension plan for his employees, or treat with, if, if not feasible, join an existing plan. What can happen here is that SAPA and NAPA may very well join up and decide to put a pension plan together, or SAPA may wish to join with NAPA Bull, or all the performing spaces owned by government may decide to, put, to, to join together to, to form a pension plan. So there's enough flexibility in there to ensure that these pension benefits are provided for employees. Madam President, with respect to Senator Lachmedial, and let me say I have the greatest respect for Senator Lachmedial. Senator Lachmedial and I, we, um, we attended the Arthur Lockjack Graduate School of Business. We did our MBAs there. We failed no courses, and I know that we passed, we both passed with distinction. Just for your information, through you, Madam President, to Senator Mark. But Senator Lutch Medial would recall in our in graduate school, in the graduate school of business while doing the MBA, that different organizations have different unique selling propositions, different value propositions. 
I am a fan of Michael Porter, and I believe in the competitiveness of organizations. In Senator Lutch Media's example, Naparima Bowl is a unique facility where you have an auditorium, you have a stage, a very advanced, well-maintained auditorium and stage, and then on the outside, you have an outdoor seating stage that can utilize the same stage and you can have one show with outside seating and indoor seating, or it's, you can have one or the other. And that's different from Sapa, which is different from Napa, which is different from Queens Hall. So I believe instead of having one board of management attempting to manage all these different um, facilities, each with its own unique features, each with its own unique value propositions, would be an extremely poor decision. Why not have individual boards as we are doing now? And why not have them benefit from each other but also compete with one another or also carve out their own unique niches within the entertainment sector? One board of management, it's very difficult to do that. So why not have separate boards? I believe in, in, in competition and developing competitive advantages. Senator Lachmedial spoke about corruption. Corruption is there, not in state enterprises or not in government. Corruption is there when you're dealing with humans. But in this piece of legislation, there we have sufficient safeguards sufficient safeguards to treat with matters of integrity and to ensure transparency and good governance. She spoke about, the Honorable Senator spoke about money laundering. And I understand that there are many different examples of money laundering using companies and other organizations. But the banks also have very, very strict procedures in place. While the organization itself must have financial rules and regulations, as is contemplated by Clause 38 of the bill, the banks also have strict procedures. So it will be, it will be very difficult for someone to launder money through the receipt of grants and donations and covenants from organizations through the banks. But notwithstanding that, there is still parliamentary oversight through the administrative reports, through the reports to the Auditor General, because the Auditor General must audit the financial arrangements of this um, entity. There are sufficient safeguards in place, so I wouldn't trouble myself too much with that at all. So, Madam President, again, it is my privilege to participate in this debate, to pilot this bill. I do believe that it is absolutely necessary that we put in place more agile and strategic management structures and we do form a body corporate to manage the affairs of SAPA. And again, I believe that it would redound to the benefit of the creative sectors, to the orange economy, and to the people of Trinidad and Tobago at large. Madam President, with those few words, I thank you, and I beg to move. Honorable Senators, the question is that a bill entitled An Act to Provide for the Establishment of the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts and for the Management and Control Thereof and for Related Matters be now read a second time. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it.
A bill entitled, An Act to Provide for the Establishment of the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts and for the Management and Control Thereof and for Related Matters. Minister of Cul Tourism, Culture and the Arts. Madam President, in accordance with Standing Order 66-1, I beg to move that the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts Bill 2022 be committed to a committee of the whole Senate forthwith to be considered clause by clause. Honorable Senators, the question is that the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts Bill 2022 be committed to a committee of the whole Senate forthwith to be considered clause by clause. Those in favor say aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. The Senate shall now go into committee of the whole to consider the bill clause by clause. I remind members that there are 40 clauses in this bill. Minister, are you ready? Yeah. Clauses 1 to 6. Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses 1 to 6 stand part of the bill. Senator Lachmedia. Court. Um, there's a question really to the minister arising out of his um, winding up. Um, minister, do you think it's beyond the scope of one board to establish or manage the different um, spaces and have unique value propositions for each? Wouldn't that be something like the equivalent of a private sector entity selling different products on the market and they have to develop their own unique value propositions for each one? I mean, I'm just asking the question if this has been thought out and you know you mentioned competition and so on but to have four spaces owned by the taxpayers and four separate boards and to say that you want to have each one of the value proposition wouldn't it be a more efficient use of resources to have them managed by one board and one board can actually still have the unique value propositions and marketing and capitalizing on the unique uniqueness of each space minister i i, I still don't believe that um, that we will, you know, derive tremendous benefit from having one board manage two very distinct um, performing spaces, two performing spaces that have developed distinct cultures within themselves. I, I don't think that we would derive any benefit from that. And I don't think that the, um, the funding with respect to the the board fees, and I think that's what everybody is concerned with. I, I don't think that, you know, in comparing the board fees and the amount of board fees compared to the potential and the opportunity costs, um, no, I don't think there is a benefit. Just for the record, I mean, I think it goes a bit beyond board fees. We're looking at staffing, administrative costs, and so on as well, but that's just for, for the purposes of the answer. So, Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses 1 to 6 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 1 to 6 now stand part of the bill. Clause 7. The question is that clause 7 stand part of the bill. Yes. Madam President, um, I would ask that the same amendment that was made in the Napa Bill, 71A, operating and maintaining. I think maintaining was the word that was inserted, and maintaining SAPA and regulating, coordinating, and conducting its act all of its activities. I have no objection, Madam Chair. So, Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 7 be amended as follows at 71A by inserting the words and maintaining after the word operating. Those in favor say aye. Aye. 
<laughs> Those again say no. I think the eyes have it. Honorable Senators, the question is the clause 7, as amended, now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those again say no. I think the eyes have it. Clause 7, as amended, now stands part of the bill. Clauses 8 to 40. <laughs> Sure, which clause? I, I am dealing with um, clause 11. Okay, so cl the question is that clauses 9 and 10 stand part of the bill? 8, eight to 10. Sorry, the, clauses is, the question is that clauses 8 to 10 stand part of the bill? The question is that clauses 8 to 10 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 8 to 10. Now stand part of the bill. Clause 11. The question is that clause 11 stand part of the bill? Yeah, um, Madam Chair, um, in clause 11, in clause 10, I should say. Um, We've passed clause 10, yeah, Senator Ma. In clause 11, is it the past 10, is it? We've passed 10, we're dealing with clause 11. No, um, um, may I engage you? Uh, uh, I beg your pardon? May I seek your indulgence? Sure. Um, it's really close to and I wanted to clarify. So. I know you're, you're, I know you're passing, but I'm asking you. All right, Senator Mark. Well, this is a very serious thing. That, uh, Everything we do here is serious. Um, this you? is the only time I'm going to allow it. All right? Thank but you. I would ask you please to, yeah. Thank you. So. Clauses eight to nine. Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses eight to nine stand part of the bill. Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses eight to nine now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause clauses eight to nine now stand part of the bill. Clause 10. The question is that clause 10 stand part of the bill? Yeah. Senator Ma. Yeah, thank you very much, Madam um, Chair. Madam Chair, to, through you to the Honorable Minister, I would like him to um, consider the deleting in the second line of clause 10, the word minister, and replacing it with the word corporate secretary. I don't think, Madam Chair, that you have had a minister informing or causing a notice to be published in the Gazette. It's normally the corporate secretary that does that. So I don't know if it might, might have been an oversight on the part of the drafters of the legislation. But you don't have a minister getting involved in these things. These are petty things. The corporate secretary does that. Minister? And I believe in practice the corporate secretary does it but the, ministry, the minister is the person who shall cause it to happen, and the minister is the person who is accountable and responsible for it happening. But in practice, the corporate secretary, I believe, does it. Legislation. Yeah, and in every other piece of legislation, any other similar clause, it's the same construct. So, so you, you are saying that the minister does all this? Yeah. Yes. All right, madam, I am not too aware of this. I, I, I do not support that. So, honorable senators, the question is that clause 10 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 10 now stands part of the bill. Clauses 11 to 20. The question is that clauses 11 to 20 stand part of the bill. The question is that clauses 11 to 20 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 11 to 20 now stand part of the bill. Clauses 21 to 27. The question is that clauses 21 to 27 stand part of the bill? Senator Mark? Madam, um, Madam Chair, the Honorable Minister said that 
transition. Which clause, please, Senator Marks? Which clause? Uh, on clause 24, 25, 20. 24, 25. But I think the minister did indicate 23 as well. So I'm going to 23, 24, and 25 respectively. Mm -hmm. The minister, through you, Madam um, Pres um, Chair, indicated that these are the transitional provisions in the legislation to deal with the permanent staffers um, currently at the Southern Academy. But he did indicate in his contribution, in winding up rather, that there are contract workers as well. So I, w I wanted to find out from the Honorable Minister, how are we going to treat with these contract workers in terms of the transitional provision? Because now you have permanent, and then you have your contract. Some contract might be for three years, some might be for two years, some might be for four years, as the case may be. How, how are these workers and so on protected by the legislation as it relates to continuity in the future? Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. We, we, we would treat with that um, in the spirit of good industrial relations. So would that be incorporated in, in, um, in your regulations, or do you think that, for instance, it should be incorporated in legislation? No, no, it shouldn't be incorporated in legislation at all. But you do that on an industrial yes. relation front. All right, well, well. So, Honourable Senators, the question is, it closes 21 to 27. Now stand part of the bill. Those in favour say aye. 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 Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. Closes 21 to 27. Now stand part of the bill. Closes 28 to 36. Honourable Senators, the question is, it closes 28 to 36. Stand part of the bill. Twenty-eight to thirty-six. Yes. As it relates to the finances. What clause, please? Um, I'm talking about. Um, clauses thirty-four. Mm -hmm. um, to thirty-eight. Well, we, uh, we just, uh, we're going up to 36 right now. Yeah, well, 36 rather. Right. Now, I wanted to ask the Honorable Minister, um, what mechanisms are going to be put in place to ensure that um, the board um, does not engage um, in investment? No, let me put it another way, Madam Chair. Um, Minister, do you think that this board should be engaged in security investment, invest in, um, I'm talking about close 35. Close 35. 35. 35, yes. 35. Yes, and your question is, do I believe that? Should, should, should this board be involved in investing in securities on the stock exchange or in any kind of private yeah. business, or is that, or strictly on the stock exchange? Well, because well, when you talk about securities, you talk about the security and exchange commission. Well, the, so. the first thing is, um, with respect to the, the definition of securities, I'm not sure it's limited to matters on the stock exchange. That's the first thing. The second point is that any investment must be done on the approval of the minister. And the third point is that these statutory bodies sometimes come into the possession of surplus funds through a donation or some other, um, some other way, and they would invest their monies into some sort of fixed deposit or some other bank account, but it must be right. done on the approval of the minister um, of minister. finance. Honorable Minister, through the um, chair, do you think that there ought to be a clear definition for the word securities? In, in, because because I, 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 I'm not too sure if it was in the NAPA um, legislation. 
We will have to but go to the Securities Act for it. It's in, yeah. it's in Clause 28. Um, security has, securities has the meaning assigned to it okay. under the Securities Act. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. And, and um, the issue, let me see where I saw this part about borrowing. Madam Chair. Okay. Yeah, Madam Chair, 36 one. Yes? Yeah. Um, Honorable Minister, to the Chair, um, do you think that the Parliament ought to be apprised of any borrowings, given the escalation in our debt portfolio in this country? Should we not have Parliament having some oversight role um, as it relates to if they are going to borrow and they get the approval of the Minister of Finance? I am suggesting that the Minister of Finance, because it has been passed by the Parliament to allow them to borrow, we are not only giving them the power to borrow, we are doing that here as a parliament. We want some oversight. So we are saying that when they borrow with the approval of the minister, there should be a statement being issued by the minister and table in the parliament so that we in the parliament would be aware of what they are doing as a board. <laughs> yeah, um, sorry, Claire. Madam, Madam Chair, Senator Mark surely has a lot more experience than I do, but I'm certain that all the borrowings um, by s statutory bodies, they do come um, to the attention of the Parliament in one way or the other through the, the, the budgeting process. So it, it does come before the Parliament. There is oversight. It can't be done in, it can't be done in secret. No, but all I'm saying, I understand the point that you're making, but seeing that we are giving them the authority as a parliament to borrow, I'm saying that when they are going to borrow, we should be alerted through a statement issued by the Minister of Finance and tabled in the parliament. So in other words, once they are taking that action with his approval, we ought to be aware. That is the point I'm making. I, I'm I... trying to give the parliament greater oversight yeah. as it relates to borrowing at a time when the country is heading towards close to 100% in debt to GDP ratio. Okay. So we want to control that. Minister. Yeah, yeah. Madam, Madam Chair, there is enough oversight. Um, it is a very, very unique proposition that, that we, Senator Mark is, is proposing. It's unacceptable. It's a bureaucratic step that he is inserting into this, into this procedure here. And it is overreach, it is tried and tested, and I have to reject his submission. Honorable Senator, the question is that clauses 28 to 36 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 28 to 36 now stand part of the bill. Clauses 37 to 40. Honorable, well, may I, let me put the question first. The question is that Clauses 37 to 40 stand part of the bill. Senator Mark. Yeah, Madam Chair, again, I'd like to propose for the consideration of the minister two areas, the strategic plan and its operational plan. I see no harm um, of those plans coming to the parliament. Just as all the minister is going to receive those plans, I think that they should be tabled in parliament. So I do not know if you'll have any objection to those plans, that is the strategic plan and the operational plan being tabled in the parliament. Upon the minister receiving same, it should be tabled in the parliament. That's the first thing. And the second point I'd like to make, Madam Chair, in, in, in clause 38, I ask the minister again to consider rules that are being made, which are regulations for the management control and maintenance of this organization and any matter that they consider necessary or conducive, those rules and regulations ought to be subject to an affirmative resolution of our parliament. Minister. I don't think that this board supper should be on its own. There should be some oversight. 
And if it is making rules and it is taking monies from taxpayers without parliament approval, they can't get no money. So this is why we're giving them money to do things. We are saying that they should inform the parliament through an affirmative resolution how they're going to manage, control these things. That's all I'm proposing. Senator Vera. I suppose I'm speaking re reference of Clause 38, but it's really in the form of a general observation. When I send my respect for you, I think this legislation suffers from too much ministerial control. Uh, and it is going to be inimical to the faster and improved decision making that we supposedly want. Now, I have no problem with the minister giving special general directions or even having a right of veto, but this bears, in my view, to micromanagement. Wanting ministerial approval can be an exercise in futility sometimes. I am speaking, you know, I mean, you're, you have a sophisticated board. They're making rules for the management control and use of SAPA, and they now have to wait on ministerial approval. I know of situations where certain professions have had draft regulations sitting for years, still to come, to be approved by the minister. I know of a, of a, of a state enterprise where the board spent a lot of time and developed a very important set of tenders, rules, and procedures. But they were of no effect because they were waiting for the ministerial approval. And, and this, I think, can suffocate a, a, a board that is trying to really do its work properly. I just want to put that on the record. Any other questions or comments before I ask the minister to respond? Senator Diana Ryan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to echo the sentiments that Senator Vera just put forward on the floor as well. Thanks. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll deal with Senator Mark's um, submissions first. With respect to the strategic plans and operational plans, those will come to the attention of the Parliament within its annual administrative report that is in 33.2 that we have passed. So those will come to the Parliament. I do not accept your submission on the need for affirmative resolution of the Parliament and for Parliament oversight. With respect to Senator Vera, I understand your submission. And on the face of it, it does look as though it is uh, bureaucratic, but on the other side of the coin, there may be an instance where a statutory body may make rules, for example, for the use of its space that intentionally or unintentionally discriminates against somebody or some group or the other. And in that case, you see, we don't like the word minister a lot of the times. But the minister is the one who has to answer, and the minister is the one who has to be accountable. Now, I don't believe that it is to make the procedure overly burdensome or to make the minister some sort of king or kingmaker, but I do, do believe that the same oversight, because Senator Mark wants to go a step ahead, you know, he wants to go for parliamentary oversight of these decisions. So I think that ministerial oversight and the approval, I think, I think, I think, um, I, I don't have any objection to, to the, to the provision as it's as it is and as it stands. I don't have any objection. Senator Vera, I, I hear you, but we live in a world today where you have freedom of information requests, you have judicial review, you have an equal opportunity commission. We have a slew of laws dealing with procurement and uh, money laundering. So if the board were to go off into a direction that might be embarrassing in any of those fields, I think there are already sufficient checks and balances in place. Yeah. So honorable senators, the question is that clauses 37 to 40 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those again say no. I think the eyes have it. Clauses 37 to 40 now stand part of the bill. Honorable Senators, the question is that the bill as amended be now reported to the Senate. Those in favor say aye. aye. 
Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The bill as amended will now be reported to the Senate. Minister of Tourism, Culture and the Arts. <laughs> Madam President, I wish to report that the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts Bill 2022 was considered in Committee of the Whole and approved with amendments. I now beg to move that the Senate agree with the committee's report. Honorable Senators, the question is that this Senate agree with the committee's report on the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts Bill 2022. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister of Tourism, Culture and the Arts. Madam President, I beg to move that a bill entitled An Act to Provide for the Establishment of the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts and for the Management and Control Thereof and for Related Matters be now read a third time and passed. Honorable Senators, the question is that a bill entitled An Act to Provide for the Establishment of the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts and for the Management and Control Thereof and for Related Matters be now read a third time and passed. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. A bill entitled An Act to Provide for the Establishment of the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts and for the Management and Control Thereof and for Related Matters. Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I beg to move that this House do now adjourn to Tuesday. 25th January 2022 at 1.30 p.m. Madam President, that is Private Members Day. And my understanding is that there is on the other paper one motion which is time-bound, motion number eight. And it's the intention of my colleagues on the other two benches that that motion be proceeded with on that day. Madam President, I also want to indicate that on Monday, June 24th, the House intends to deal with the finance variation of appropriations. June? January. January, January sorry. Yeah. January 2022. On, Madam President, I want to indicate that the House intends to deal with the finance variation of appropriations bill 2022 on Monday, January 24th, 2022, and it is our intention to deal with that bill on Wednesday, January 26th, 2022, from 10 a.m. Thank you. Honorable Senators, before I put the question on your adjournment, leave has been granted for two matters to be raised. Senator Lachmidia. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I welcome the opportunity to raise this matter, captioned the failure of the government to provide enhanced resources to support students with learning disabilities and other special needs. Madam President, learning disabilities are perhaps more common in our society than we know. Growing up, I'm sure we may all recall that there was someone in our classroom, our neighborhood, or in our family who People would deem doncy head lazy. We ascribe a lack of discipline or ambition to those who do not succeed in the traditional school system. And we simply cast them aside and we brand them for life. But there's a saying that goes, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, then it will live its whole life believing it is stupid. I believe that that is what is happening in our education system, particularly with children who have learning disabilities. 
That person that you refer to as the madman by the traffic lights, or the woman who is married off very young and living in a situation of domestic abuse, or the teenager who drops out of school because they are suspended on several occasions for aggressive behavior, may actually be all be products of undiagnosed, untreated learning disabilities. Persons with learning disabilities experience altered brain functioning. It affects the cognitive processes related to learning. So, these processing problems make basic learning skills such as reading, writing, and basic mathematics not impossible, but requiring a slightly different approach. Other life skills like organization, time management, um, maintaining your attention span also prove challenging to persons who have these types of learning disabilities. Having a learning disability affects persons beyond, in life beyond academics. And if there's no meaningful intervention in early life, these disabilities can impact relationships with your family, friends, and even coworkers, if you get so far as to be able to have a job to begin with. Learning disabilities are often referred to as hidden disabilities because persons look perfectly normal. And in many cases, um, they are of average or even above average intelligence. The challenges with basic academic skills like reading, writing, and math are recognizable during early school years, and that is why it is important for us to diagnose these um, issues at that point in time and deploy the appropriate interventions to assist students. A learning disability cannot be cured or fixed. It is a lifelong challenge, and it has to be managed and accommodated. And I say accommodated because the persons who do not have these challenges owe it as a duty to those who do to accommodate them. We have a slew of laws and cases and so on. Um, the one that I remember most at the top of my head is the case that dealt with a person's access to justice because there was no ramp to access the Hall of Justice and whether that um, prohibited a person from you know, having enjoying their constitutional rights of access to justice. Those are the physical disabilities. And so we've, we've moved very far ahead as a society in recognizing the need to accommodate physical disabilities, but the same just simply cannot be said for learning disabilities. And so I, with the appropriate support and intervention, people with learning disabilities can excel in school, work, relationships, and become valuable and constructive members of the community. It is the duty of the government from as early as the level of early childhood care and education and all throughout life to create the environment that would provide um, and provide the services to enable persons with learning disabilities to not just survive, but thrive. We have a student support services division within the Ministry of Education, and it is my personal experience that the resourcing in that division is woefully inadequate. Prior to the pandemic and the closure of schools, some educational districts, and I've reached out particularly to persons in Victoria and St. Patrick, but there's on average a two-year waiting period for the assignment of an aid to assist children in the primary school system. These aids are basically persons who sit in the classes with children who need assistance and ensure that they are able to function in a normal school environment. The avail availability of specialists in our public health care system makes diagnosis simply non-existent, and parents are referred to private specialists. This is extremely costly. In an article captioned, and it's written by someone who writes every week in the newspapers by the name of Dr. Radhika Mahes. I read her articles every week, but there was one particularly where she told a story about a family who noticed something was wrong with their child and wished to access services. She spoke about having to wait almost 18 months for a referral in the public health care system. They had to pay almost $5,500 and embark upon fundraising ventures in order to raise the um, money to see a private pediatrician and have a report that would then refer this child and make it possible for this child to access specialized services. And later on, when the uh, number of therapies were recommended that could assist this child and help this child to function in the school system, it simply just was not available. I can give you an idea, and I can give this parliament an idea of what it costs to give a child who has a learning disability a fighting chance. Speech therapy, $250 a week. Occupational therapy, $400 a week. Behavioral therapy, $600 a week. Music therapy, $300 a week. And the music therapists and speech therapists who um, 
work privately, they do so because they're simply not employed in our public health care system. There is a complete lack of facilities through any of the RHAs to deal with persons with learning disabilities and provide them with this. I heard earlier in one of the debates when we were talking about Napa and Sapa that Senator Dial Singh mentioned that um, music therapy and art therapy. And there are two positions, I believe, created in the NCRHA um, that assist the adult population with art and music therapy through the psychiatric facilities, but there's nothing really available for children. In fact, it is my information that the Tobago RHA had a position for an art therapist and it was um, discontinued. So we are seeing here basically a lack of provision of services for children to be able to thrive in the regular environment. Mr. Vice President, in at, during the while this is a problem that has persisted before, the pandemic has severely exacerbated the situation. And it's, it's not something that's not on our radar because the issue was raised before a Joint Select Committee on Social Services and Public Administration last year, sometime around, I believe it was March 2020, 2021, sorry. And around that time, we had schools having been closed for about a year, and really it's was necessary, I think, and it was raised about what type of special circum uh, treatment was being given to students with these diagnosed learning disabilities. At that hearing, and it was reported in the newspaper, they talked about the fact that- Santa, you have two more minutes. Yes, they talked about the fact that there was really um, absolutely nothing done to accommodate the children who had special learning needs and needed special education and to help them transition into an online learning environment. But what was even more troubling is that we heard that there was only about a 20% staffing with only 23 trained professionals in the student services division. And at that point in time, they had 3,365 students referred for those supporting, um, for those support positions. The reason why all of this is important is because when students in a regular learning system have challenges with verbal and nonverbal communication and social interaction and so on, they need the help. And that help has not even come in the regular learning system, far less for the virtual learning system. A program that has been worldwide acclaimed is one that exists actually in the New York um, public school system and it's called the NEST program, whereby within one classroom you do not divide children with special needs and who have, um, who have learning disabilities, but you create the enabling environment for them to learn within the regular classroom at a very young age so that they grow into students that can integrate fully into a regular larger class size and into a um, into interacting with people uh, without the need for assistance from an aid or a special um, education um, trained professional. At the end of the day, I know that this motion was identified as an education issue, but what is really needed in our country is a holistic approach to assisting children with special needs. I sit on the Joint Select Committee for National Security, and one of the things that came up at a public hearing as well is that a lot of children who enter into the gang life it's because in school, they were simply not succeeding and they were dropping out of school. And one of the issues that an NGO identified during one of those hearings is the fact that children with learning disabilities are simply cast aside and not given opportunities and are not um, given the care and concern that they deserve. An approach by the Ministry of Education together with social, social development and health is needed for us to help save these children and to save our society from the negative impact of these persons simply falling by the wayside. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Minister of Public Administration. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. <clears throat> Mr. Vice President, the Ministry of Education has provided and continues to provide the necessary resources for all our students, which is in keeping with the Ministry's strategic development goals of effective governance and management of education and access to educational opportunities to all learners. Mr. Vice President, provision is made for students with special needs at 13 public special schools, 13 registered private special schools, and across the general education system from early childhood care and education to the secondary school level. 
The Ministry of Education has provided funding of approximately $12 million to private special schools for the academic year 2020 to 2021. Additionally, Mr. Vice President, the Ministry provides services that include school-based student screening for learning, development, and behavioral challenges. Students with presenting issues are then referred to the Student Support Services Division for relevant intervention via a multidisciplinary team consisting of special education instructors, special sorry, school social workers, and guidance officers. Furthermore, Mr. Vice President, a detailed psychoeducational assessment is conducted for students as the need arises through the services of our clinical psychologist, school psychologist, and behavioral intervention specialist. I recognize Senator Lachmi Dial's comment about the inadequate resources in the Student Support Services Division. The Ministry of Education acknowledges that and is actively working to address that issue, Mr. Vice President. Students who are diagnosed with a disability continue to receive targeted intervention via the use of an individual education plan. The implementation of this plan may include the assignment of a special education aid or interpreter assistant as is necessary. Moreover, Mr. Vice President, teachers in the general education system are provided with school-based support and training in the identification of a range of special needs traits and the relevant classroom-based intervention to treat with each specific challenge identified. Mr. Vice President, the Ministry also provides alternative arrangements and enhanced learning resources such as Braille, large print, and sign language interpretation for students with diagnosed disabilities. These arrangements are also offered to students writing or local examination through the provision of special concessions. Approximately 600 special concession applications are processed each year for students eligible to write the secondary entrance assessment, the National Certificate of Secondary Education, and the Primary School Learning Examination. Mr. Vice President, apart from what is provided to students in the general education system and special schools, over 1,200 devices were provided specifically for students with special needs who are currently receiving targeted services from the Special Education Unit. Mr. Vice President, the Ministry of Education is supporting children with learning disability and will continue to support those students to ensure that they are not left behind. I thank you, Mr. Vice President. Senator Mark. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, the matter that I am about to raise deals with the need for the government to indicate whether TNTEC had obtained ministerial approval to issue a request for expressions of interest for a floating power plant. Mr. Vice President, a request for expressions of interest has been put out by the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago through the Trinidad and Tobago Electricity Commission for the supply of electrical power to the Trinidad and Tobago electricity grid from a 50 megawatts or a 165 megawatts floating power plant with primary fuel being natural gas and secondary fuel being diesel oil. 
This advertisement was published in the Express, in the Guardian, I should say, of Wednesday, January 5th, 2022. The closing date for that expression of interest is Tuesday the 8th of February, 2022, at 1.30. The question that we'd like to put to the Honorable Minister of Public Utilities to clarify is for him to indicate whether there's a need for such additional power to be placed on the nation's electricity grid in light of some very salient facts. For example, my, uh, Mr. Vice President, the world is advancing green electricity as per the agreements established at a conference of parties, 26th meeting in Glasgow, also known as COP26, which the Honorable Prime Minister and Minister of Energy attended. The government stated its goal of reaching 10% of total power being generated from renewable energy by 2021, which is now unmet. Mr. Vice President, in 2018, the government requested proposals for the supply of 130 megawatts of electricity generation from renewable energy resources on a bill on an operate basis. Some three years later, we have been told, at least five times publicly, that this has been negotiated with a joint venture comprising BP, Light Source, and Shell. Mr. Vice President, the current power generation companies are operating below capacity. Some figures show less than 50%, all of which are subject to power purchase agreements, meaning that the taxpaying citizens of Trinidad and Tobago have to pay regardless of the amount of power being used. We need clarification on this development. Since our research shows that there is only one company globally at the present time that can deliver on this opportunity, the company is Car Power Ship out of Turkey. Is there a plan to engage this company for the supply of a floating barge power plant? And has that company already met with members of the government of Trinidad and Tobago? Mr. Vice President, we know that amidst the crisis now facing this, uh, th th this country, with major industrial plants being idled or shut down, like the Petrotrain Refinery, Acelor Metal Steel Plant, the Yara Ammonia Plant, Nutrient Ammonia Facility, just to name a few, thousands of jobs have been lost. And the country is fast losing revenue and critical for an exchange. The government is now inviting expressions of interest for the supply of electrical power to the Trinidad and Tobago electricity grid from a 50 megawatt or a 165 megawatt, megawatts floating plow, power plant in the form of a, a power purchase agreement, PPA, in the medium term, that is between five to 10 years. Mr. Mr. Vice President, we are bewildered in the United National Congress and amazed how a government could even contemplate at this time when our power plants are operating at less than 50% capacity to invite expressions of interest for the supply of electrical power to Trinidad and Tobago electricity grid from some outside agent or inside source. 
Mr. Vice President, may I remind you, it was the PP government in 2014 that signed a new power purchase agreement with PowerGen, covering a period of 15 years, ending in 2029, for the supply of 624 megawatts of power. TGU, Mr. Vice President, located in Labre, which was built to provide power to a failed aluminum complex, has a power purchase agreement to sell 720 megawatts at, um, for a 30-year term agreement that began in 2011. Then there's something called Trinity Power with a 30-year power purchase agreement which was signed in 1998 to supply 225 megawatts. Mr. Vice President, when you add up all of these, it comes up to 1,777 megawatts. Therefore, I, we have been advised that we in Trinidad and Tobago are using less than, than 1,000 megawatts currently. This is both due to the lost demand, but also due to the strained gas supply to these power plants. So we are asking, Mr. Vice President, what is going on? Are there plans to shut down our existing power plants? Are there preferred, have two more minutes. Are there preferred bidders that may have visited our shores and met with government officials in the past few weeks or months? Why a five to 10 year period when we have a power purchase agreement to cover these periods already? Why gas and diesel fuel power at a time when both the prime minister and the minister participated in the COP26 where we continue to commit to reducing carbon emission and global warming? Mr. Vice President, we need to find out what is going on in this matter. Is this floating power plant another fishing expedition? Mr. Vice President, my information is that there's only one company in the world that has the capacity at this time to build this power ship based in Turkey. It is called Car Power Ship. And I therefore would like the government to clear the air on this matter to determine if this is the company that has been earmarked to provide a floating power plant for Trinidad and Tobago. So I look forward, Mr. Vice President, to the government providing answers to Trinidad and Tobago on this new development that has occurred, and we are seeking clarification from the government on this matter because it appeared in the newspapers on the 5th of January, both the Guardian, the Express, and the Newsday. So we now await the government's response so that the country, Trinidad and Tobago, could be, this situation could be cleared up once and for all as to where this thing is coming from and in whose interest is being, whose interest is promoting this power floating plant on a barge. I thank you, Mr. Vice President. Leader of Government Business. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. And I waited patiently for Senator Mark to actually get to the point of his motion. He said that the United National Congress is bewildered and amazed. And may I also add that clearly they are misinformed and misguided. This motion has nothing to do with the COP that recently concluded in Glasgow, Scotland. This motion has nothing to do with green energy. This motion has nothing to do with renewable energy resources. And in his presentation, Senator Mark failed to address his own motion. So I'm now forced to put forward his motion and respond to it myself. 
And the motion reads, the need for the government to indicate whether TNTEC obtained ministerial approval to issue a request for expressions of interest for a floating power plant. In summary, the need for the government to indicate it. In other words, I am just supposed to come here and say, Tiantec obtained or did not obtain approval from the minister. So I waited patiently for Senator Mark to indicate where exactly is Tiantec required to obtain ministerial approval before the issue of an expression of interest. I did not hear it. And it's because no such requirement exists. If you go on TNTEC's website, procurement section, you would see several requests for expressions of interest relating to the work of TNTEC. And that is what the commission, that is what the commissioners and the management of TNTEC is entitled to do under the law. TNTEC is governed by statute. Statute sets out clear what TNTEC is required to do, the approvals that are to be sought, obtained, and the work of the, the commission. So, Mr. Vice President, to, to put forward Senator Mark's motion, what approval did TNTEC obtain? The answer is simply there was no approval required by TNTEC to issue a request for expressions of interest, and accordingly, none was obtained from the minister. Thank you very much. Honorable Senators, the question is that this Senate do now stand adjourned to Tuesday, the 25th of January, 2022, at 1.30 p.m. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The Senate now stands adjourned to Tuesday, the 25th of January, 2022, at 1.30 p.m.